Hello, 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 family. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Gina with Bijou Noir. You are tuned in to the Blackness. I'm so excited to be here again with you guys today. Um, I feel like it's been an amazing day so far, and I, I feel like it's uh, we're leading to an, um, an amazing evening. <laughs> Somebody asked me why do I have these on live so late. Um, to be honest with you, it's just, uh, you know, trying to balance out everything else that I do in my life. Uh, I'm trying to see what I can do to start having them earlier. I know a lot of people miss out. Um, a lot of my subscribers are saying that they're missing out on the lives and would like to uh, be able to participate um, due to uh, the uh, times that I'm going live. A lot of places, um, you know, um, it's really late for them. So um, I'm again Really excited to be here with you guys tonight. I want to first and foremost uh, say welcome um, to um, anyone that's not been here before. I want to welcome the family, my subscribers, the members, uh, my, moder my moderators. I want to thank you guys for coming through. I also want to take a moment to uh, to uh, say this. Um, I've gotten some great comments on the last uh, couple of videos, and I'm doing everything. I am hearing you. I see what you guys are saying, and I appreciate the um, the um, you know attention that's being put to uh, what we're talking about. Okay, so that being said, you know, we're here to talk about uh, one of uh, the most talked about leaders, uh, one of the most talked about leaders in Africa at this time, Paul Kagame. I'm really excited. The president of Rwanda, shout out to Rwanda. That's a beautiful place. And he has a lot to do with um, the, you know, it's being called the most beautiful uh, country in Africa at this time. You know, um, but there's a lot of people or there he has a lot of critics. There are um, some people that feel like uh, maybe, uh, you know, there are some things to be concerned about. Well, this is what we're here to talk about. You know, this is a part of uh, the series on our leaders. A look at our leaders. This is number two. Uh, the first series was about the Congo. Please check that out. Um, we we have a president, um, a newly elected president, um, and we we had some really strong, uh, a strong conversation about um, who he is and what he's doing and our thoughts on that. Um, please check out the past videos if you'd like to get more information on that um, on the Congo president. But today is all about K K Kagami. It's all about Rwanda, and we all. I mean. <laughs> You know, if you hear Rwanda, the first thing that comes to your mind, um, and I'm sorry to say it, is, uh, of course, Hotel Rwanda or the, you know, um, the what happened in Rwanda. I don't even know what to call it. Um, to be honest with you, it, it saddens me. And the more time I spent this weekend, I kind of had to change the day on this because it was on Wednesday and um, there was a lot to take in. It was a lot to take in, guys, with um, everything that has gone on in Rwanda and its people. Um, and for it to have such a turnaround, such a comeback, um, yeah, it, it, it was a lot. Um, yes, Eric Summers, a genocide. Um, I was looking for the appropriate word, but even that, it just seems like, I don't know, you know, I would like to talk a little about that, but it's today's conversation is not more so on what happened, um, in Rwanda, not, it's not about the genocide, although you cannot really talk about Rwanda and not speak on, about the genocide. So we'll touch on that. Um, but I don't want to spend too much time there. I really want to spend more time on Kagame himself. I want to see what you guys are thinking, what kind of um, president or leader, if you've done your research or if you know, you know about him, um, what kind of leader and what kind of leadership do you think he is uh, uh doing you know how how well do you think he's doing in uh, Rwanda there's no disputing that there's been some positive changes um but you know he has his critics as well so I, I wanted to take a moment to really um give everybody a voice because I know that when we spoke about the Congo uh the president of Rwanda did come up but um I'm hoping that we can get some people on here tonight that can actually um, give us um some more insight on what is really going on in the Congo, I mean, between the Congo and Rwanda. I know that that's a big uh, part of uh, what our conversation may become about, but I don't want to stay there too long because um, to be honest with you, and <laughs> I'm going to be forthright to say that I truly believe that um, Paul Kagame um, is a very interesting and, in you know, um, leader. And I, I, I'm sorry to say that, um, you know, 
because I know there are so many critics, but I think he's doing an amazing job. Uh, that being said, let's take a look and, um, at a clip. I bought something short, uh, but sweet. Um, hopefully, hopefully it's short. I hope I didn't pick the long version. Well, you guys know me. Um, that being said, um, I'm going to play something here in reference to Paul Kagami. Um, just give us a little insight of his um, personality. Um, this is a video that I picked or a snip that I picked of him speaking to his people. Um, yeah, I think he has uh, a lot to say here, and it really gives you good insight of who um, what kind of person he is. For this Rwanda, this is that's what I think. I don't know what you think. You are free to think whichever way you want or whatever you want. For me, I have learned lessons of our struggles, of the hardships of our country. I have learned lessons from that. And uh, a number of lessons I have learned, one of them is, the most important for me is, I am not in control of what somebody thinks about me, plans to do against me. I'm not in control. It's that person. But I must be in control of something. And that is what happens here in my country. So you can uh, destabilize, attempt, or do it actually. You can do us harm. There are many things, uh, people who wish you ill, Many things, bad things, they have many things they can do. You know, even at a personal level, you can uh, kill somebody, you can shoot me with a gun and kill me. That's a possibility for some people. But there is one thing that is impossible, that cannot happen to me, and I wish it shouldn't happen to our country. Nobody, anywhere, can bring me to my knees. <laughs> Absolutely not. Because Coming to your knees is your choice. <laughs> I think it's a choice. There are people who make choice to be brought to their knees. But that's a no-go area for me. You can't be brought to your knees. I can't. I don't think our country should ever be brought to our knees. But they will, people will do harm to you. They can attempt. They will do. Maybe they will succeed here and there. But uh, bringing you to your knees, I, I think, please, men and women of my country, you should never accept that. We are better than this. We, we are much better than that. And uh, the most final thing is uh, I have raised with uh, our friends uh, in all these struggles I have really been as elaborate as I can. I have told them, I said, look, I have begged and begged, maybe it hasn't, but I have come to a point where in that begging process I have raised a few things. I said, in a relationship, country to country, or even uh, for me personally, person to person, there are, there are 
three types of relationship you can have. One is we can be friends, we can be allies, we can work as closely as anyone can. And that's my choice. That's what I want. And if that is the choice of the other party, they will never find us wanting. They will never fault us with having failed to respond as good friends, as good allies, never. We, 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 we are honest friends, we are honest allies with anyone who wants to be friends. The second type of choice of relationship is, you can say, you know what? Why don't you ignore me and I ignore you? And we have nothing to do with each other? And for me, that's fair. If you tell me, say, this is my choice, I'd say, please have it. Let's, let's each do our own things without bothering about the other. And for me, that's also fair if that is your choice. It's not my choice. I told you my choice is the first one. But if people you relate to think this is the choice, I think it is even fair. This is quite fair. But there is another, the third one. The third one is, he said, you know what? I don't like you. Not only do I not like you, I always cause you problems. We will always conflict. Then I say, also to that, since it has not come from me and it will never come from me, then still that is okay. <laughs> we can live like that and uh, let's see where it takes us. But that also means you should be able, you should be building capacities uh, to sustain that, meaning in my case, in our case, we should be able to say, okay, if somebody has just sworn to keep causing you problems and enmity, we should be building capacities to contain that so that it doesn't overwhelm us one day. So when uh, you keep coming to us with the problems, then we should be able to deal with that, to absorb that. In other words, I'm saying, it will not come from us. It will not come from this country, it will not come from me, it will not, to seek problems with others. And I even don't want it. But what if others have made a choice to bring the problems to you? They should find you uh, ready to absorb it. Absorb it, contain it, and uh, make sure it doesn't uh, give them what they want. Of course, all that comes costly. It, uh, diverts resources, that diverts attention, it does what, but we should be prepared for that. That's what it costs, that's the price. The price of stability and continued well-being and growth and uh, is there, the price is there. That means we need to do the best we can and have to uh, both to make progress, but also to defend the progress we are making. And uh, to prove this point, uh, as you have seen, we have been uh, provoked, people crossed the borders, killed our people, 
We have not even responded. It's like nothing has happened. Murabi is about the southern province. The number of border crossings and killings that have happened on our side and a lot of things. But we were able to see that somebody wanted trouble with us and drag us into this mess. So later on when they have dragged you into these kinds of problems like the intention was in the south, then you start looking the same, you are the same. They have their own problems they are struggling with, which they want to attribute to us. So they actually wanted the validation of saying, you see, <laughs> the problems uh, we have are not actually ours, they are coming from the other side. <laughs> by managing to suck you into this kind of situation, they would have achieved that. So we denied them that. Even with this other situation, we are going to deny people that kind of chance. Whoever provokes us, left, right, north, south, we will mind our business here. And I hope people will give us a chance to be able to mind our own business and for them not so much mind our business. We don't need other people to come to resolve our problems uh, because they have heard that uh, we have one problem or, or another. It's our problem. Let's own it. Let's try to resolve it. If we are so bad or so weak or such, a, you know, we will reap, we are the ones to reap the consequences of that. But it is ours, it's our thing. We need the chance to be able to manage our own situation, not, uh, as I have kept saying, uh, uh, we shouldn't be following the rules set by others. No, we, we need to set our own rules for ourselves. We need to make more choices. Even these rules should be based on the choices we make about ourselves, our country, and uh, so. I think I have given you more than you wanted. But uh, I thought it was necessary to clear the air and, uh, and, and your minds. And, uh, but uh, there is no free lunch. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. That happens all the time. I apologize, guys. Um, he said there is no free lunch. That was the last statement that he made. And it was it was true to life for me because I truly believe that um, he, he has a really um, grasp um, the understanding. Can you guys hear me? Hello, hello, hello. I'm hearing, I'm seeing no volume. I'm hoping that you can hear me now. This is ridiculous. This happens all the time. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> All right. So, okay. So Paul Kagami, we're starting with a bang. And that being said, we're going to talk about his ruthlessness, but I think he's brilliant. And I think that, um, a part of his brilliance is his ability to be ruthless when necessary. Now, in reference to what we're going to talk about tonight, I want you guys to be as honest as open. Anybody that, uh, feels like, uh, you know, 
there, he's a negative because of the things that he's doing. Um, please let that be done. Let that be said. And let's talk about it. Let's talk about what he has accomplished so far. Um, I'm really excited to, 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 to share, um, you know, one of the biggest, and I think everybody knows what, what Paul Kagami has done in Rwanda, but one of the biggest things he has done was to get rid of the tribalism issue that was there, um, prior to him, um, you know, uh, setting the pace for the people. And, um, one of the things that he ran on, and, um, I was surprised to see that, um, he did not run as a Tutsi there. That's the tribe that he comes from. He ran as a Rwandan and he, in, in his, um, presidency, he made sure that, um, you know, people can't even go around saying, you know, I'm this tribe, that tribe, we're Rwandans. It's a part of, 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 I believe the policy or legislation in Rwanda that, you know, tribalism is not something that is, um, talked about or, you know, something that is used in politics at all, which I think is amazing. Uh, before we get in and, and let folks come on in, I want you guys to please share, share, share this live. Let's get some people shared on your social media. Let's get some more folks up in here. If you have access to any um, of our brothers and sisters from uh, Rwanda, uh, please um, invite them to the conversation. I'd like to hear what they have to say. And um, also the Congo, because that, you know, you can't speak about Rwanda without having to talk about some of the critics or criticism that has come his way uh, because of the Congo. But prior to getting to the criticism, I have one more uh, thing I would like to share with you guys. Uh, I would like to display uh, the most beautiful country in Africa. Amazing. And um, I know that he has a lot of critics, but the um, one thing we need to talk about is I can't point to another country in Africa that I find as amazing as Rwanda for them to accomplish all that they have accomplished for this president um, in the 20 something years. I believe that he's been um, in office to accomplish all that he has accomplished, not only as far as the infrastructure, but um, the turnaround of the people. Um, it's something to talk about, uh, but I, I put the link out there. Anybody that wants to pop in and want to get this conversation started, we can. Um, I know that, uh, uh, you know, my uh, uh, Kagami, <laughs> I was going to call him my my brother. Well, he is my brother. He has his uh, critics. But at the same time, you can't deny the fact that, you know, there's free education in, in, um, in um, Rwanda. Um, people, people are not, I mean, 
I, I could not. And I said this a couple of months ago when I first heard about Rwanda, I had to, I said in my mind, okay, so they just cleaned up the cities. And so the rich people are living in the beautiful places. They're not going into the, um, into the, uh, you know, the rural communities, the villages. And so I did my research and I tried to find something, you know, um, to, you know, someone that posted something, um, you know, in reference to how the villages are, you know, it, are being impacted in a negative way. And it wasn't that at all. So, you know, what Paul Kagami has proved to me is that there is an option. There is another option for African leaders. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying that there's not going to be conflict. There's always conflict. But how do we handle it? Do you guys believe that he's handling it? Um, you know, some people say that he has critics. There's some control. But sh should Africans be more controlled? Is this the right uh, direction? Let's talk about it. Come on in here. I know a lot of folks stay in the comment section. I would like to see um, as many of you that want to talk about this to talk about it. Uh, let's let's talk about the man, um, you know, the man in uh, question tonight, which is Paul Kagami. Welcome, Lamin. Uh, thank you for uh, coming in uh, to join me on this conversation. It's about Kagami, Paul Kagami of Nwa Rwanda. What would you like to um, commentate on that? Greetings, Queen G. Blessings, blessings, and welcome. Greetings, greetings. You're looking beautiful as usual today. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Lamin. I love compliments. Thank you. Yes, my queen. <laughs> my, my voice is my voice is not as deep as two Nigers today, but you know, ah! <laughs> two Nigers yeah. having him and um, what's our other it's, brother name? Yes, 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 yes that deep voice, brother. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my queen. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to say about Kagami. What I know about Kagami initially, um. I just heard all the bad stories, you know, about, um, you know, the, the deaths and he's responsible. He, he, he's basically a war, you know, he's like um, the genocide and the, the re some of the repercussions after that. You know, I, I just heard um, a lot of bad things, you know, initially. But um, over the years, um, that seems to be, it, it, it be more in his favor, you know, I mean... As I said, uh, I have a business mentor. Her name is Dr. Harnett. I don't know if anybody's heard of her. She's a she's I, quite I've, well known. I've heard of her. Yeah, she's in she's in Rwanda right now, right? That's right. Yeah, she re she recently moved in 2020. Mm -hmm. and, and um, from what I'm hearing, I mean, in such a if you imagine a country who's who's literally just had a genocide a few years ago to to what it is now, from what I see of the country now, you can only, it can only be a, a, a miracle. You know, it can only be, you know, it, you've got to congratulate him if he's responsible from, to bringing the country to what it is now, because I heard it's, um, and from what I've seen from like Dr. Harnett, and also, um, I don't, there's some YouTubers called the Unap Unapologetic Nomads. Yeah. And, um, they're very prolific YouTubers, and uh, I think I love their channel. Right, right, yeah. They and and I think they live in yeah. I think they live in Rwanda as well. I believe so. Yes. Yeah, they've brought some insight into that country, man. And wow, I've got to say that. I mean, from what I see, Rwanda is got to be one of the top countries, you know, in terms of infrastructure. Just what's going on there, man? You know, I think it's just beautiful. From I believe Rwanda is um, an amazing and beautiful place. I, I right. truly believe that um, a lot of the. I'm not going to say he's not ruthless because he seems to um, have a way of look. Like he said, I'm not going to bother anybody, but if I feel like they can be a threat to. Um, to me, then I'm going to absorb whatever's coming, meaning that I'm going to protect myself and I'm going to make sure I, I make the moves. You know, in one of his videos, he said, sometimes you need to make the moves, uh, the kind of moves that uh, that protects your, your own. And I, I can only appreciate that now. <laughs> it's 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 a, it's amazing to me, you know, those people that are critical of him, like African um, um posted a comment and said, my grandmother is Tootsie. Um, go to Kigali and see that everyone 
who is in power is Tootsie. I don't know if that's true, but right. If they are, is if everybody in power is Tootsie, um, do do does that mean he's doing a bad job? I mean, Rwanda, you know, looks like it's doing what all of Africa should be doing right now. It's doing right. good for itself. It's not in a bad place. Um, should the should do you think um, based on what? African said, do you think the attention should be made um, on the fact that uh, Tootsie, most of the people that are in power or the positions of power are Tootsie? Do you think that's a bad thing? I mean, if it's working, is it a bad thing? I mean, from my perspective, first of all, you got to look at the, you know, the, the I, I think it's best to hear from the people. I always like hearing from the people because what mm -hmm. I found is that um, a lot of these uh you know these these rhetorics and stories. They could be coming. They, you know, they're coming from people who don't want Africa to, Africa to progress. You know, but at the same time, you know what you find that when you speak to the people. I mean, for instance, like in uh, example in the Gambia, you had um, Yaya Jami. Now, from the diasporan perspective, he was a you know he seemed like a very strong leader, standing up to the West. You know, but when you speak to the people, they will tell you you've done some terrible things, you know, on the ground. So you have to wait. Um, and and Paul Kagame, when when you hear how the genocide actually happened, the the, the people that um basically stoked the fire, you know, the the history of how that happened, man. You know, it's now, interlopers. A lot of people don't realize that um a lot of what happened in Rwanda was um again puppeteered. And exactly. a lot of what's happening in the Congo between Rwanda is also being puppeteered. So you have to you have to really look at it from a perspective of um, you know understanding that there are higher things happening. Now I don't know um, where Rwanda stands in reference to um, its uh, allying with certain countries to protect itself. Is it willing to? let's say hurt others. You know, I, um, I downloaded a video that I, I think that I might want to share because it's, it's really funny. A lot of us don't realize this and it's really hard to phantom really that, you know, there are people and we've read books about it. There's people that spoke about it. And matter of fact, let me play this clip because there are people that are, you know, yeah, instead of going coming from you know superpower countries to alliance annihilate little villages and things like that, they're uh, using uh, you know people to do that. They're using some of our leaders to do that. Now, Paul Kagame, that is one of the things that they said that he's doing. He's um he's going into the con I mean, the worst that I've heard is that he's um depleting. Or, or being used to deplete some of the resources in the Congo. But I truly feel like um, if my brother comes to my house and takes some food, I don't mind. But nobody's really talking about all the strangers that are in the Congo. You know, I mean, we talk about it, but we don't make a big deal of it as much as we do when um, I'm not saying that this, you know, if he is going into the, um, the Congo and, you know, uh, you know, causing conflict or whatever, but there are so many, I mean, the whole world is feeding off the Congo right now. At right. least if other Africans countries are doing it and they're better becoming better, maybe in a, in a, in, you know, in, in, in retrospect, uh, you know, it would be better that other African, you know, countries were doing it instead of outsiders that, you know, infrastructure is not being taken care of children black children are not getting into school for free in some of these you know country you know in the superpower countries they're taking care of their own business they're not taking care of africa um where if paul Gami, called paul kagami has his hands in a cookie pot at least i see what he's doing with those cookies hold on i have to share this and then we could move forward Wanda and why are Uganda important to the US military? Precisely because we can have them do things in Africa that we don't wish to do for ourselves. We can have their soldiers die if need be, we can have them deploy places if need be, and so having 
proxies, having allies, having clients who are willing to do your bidding becomes very important. Um, and I, I don't know if everybody got that. Um, I'm going to play it again because it's important because we need to understand this. A lot of times we stand in a place of not understanding it. I mean, they're telling us every day. There's no way that we can act like we're, we're dumb. We're dumb to this at all. Wanda and why are Uganda important to the U S military? Precisely because we can have them do things in Africa that we don't wish to do for ourselves. We can have their soldiers die if need be. We can have them deploy places if need be. And so having proxies, having allies, having clients who are willing to do your bidding becomes very important. So having allies, having proxies, um, having other, you know, small countries in Africa willing to do your bidding is very important to, to, to the West. Right. And as you said, Gina, I've always, it, there's a common thing with all African countries. It's like, um, you know, you were saying the other day, you know, I mean, you know, all our, all our leaders like uh, Mangafuli and every, you know, the history goes way back. They, they take out our leaders with, with the common thing with all these African countries who have these, uh, these problems, the common person, the common fault, when you look back at it, is the interlopers, is the foreigner, is the is the colonizer, you know, Nigeria, yeah. You've got you've got countries that have been living in harmony for thousands of years, yeah. yeah. As soon as these people come in, you, you can the history is there. The history is there for us to see, um, Gina. It's there, it's right there. And, and a lot of them are telling on themselves, just like this young man that we just played. You know, he's like he's tell he's letting us know straight up, this is what Gina. we do. And this is how we do it, and this is how we benefit. And yet we still run around pointing the fingers, not understanding that, you know, there's there's um there's a way that they approach you. It's either you comply or or you don't okay. yeah. or you die. And 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 that, that those are very small options. So yeah. But the options we we don't as you said, um it's divide and conquer. And I'm a person who's worked in a psychological field. Mm -hmm. And you, you can see with what's happening with the self-hatred with black people. All you gotta do with all you gotta do is um just set them cat among the pigeons. And that's what they've been doing for centuries. And as you say, we we, we just can't learn that, you know, when we come together, stop putting down our dis differences. We've got so many differences, Gina. You know, so many differences that I mean, we're we're, we're just looking, I'm just looking at this Easter thing, what's going on now. Right, yeah. it's, it's like today. I didn't even realize it. I mean, I, I realized it was Easter, but I didn't realize it's uh, Good Friday till people start like posting the fish dinner and we got to have bun and cheese and, and I'm like, what the heck, man? And then you got you got Ramadan that's coming out. I mean, you know the religious divisions. The it's so many divisions, man. But what we got to look at is when we come together, it's it's unstoppable, and that's that's what. The main thing these people know, you know, in Rwanda, they did it in Gambia. They did it everywhere, Gina. Come on, man. It's, it's about time we smell the coffee, you know, but it, it's it's the machinery. Um, it's only, you know, um, forums like this, you know, a few radio stations. They got the masses of the media, you know, all, all, all that you hear on British media is... Um, um, COVID, 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 every station, yeah. COVID, COVID. Talking about COVID. just the same thing, you know, right. cornering us in fear. Um, I want to, I want to try to respond to you, African. If your brother, I can, the, I guess you're replying um, based on the statement that I made. If your brother came into your house and took you, uh, take, you don't mind. But if your brother called your fa called your whole family to take, will you still be, I don't, Okay, I guess you're saying if um yeah, I, I don't mind sharing with my family. I, I have a problem with strangers coming in and taking things. And um maybe if we were giving each other willingly, you know, we 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 Africans um used to barter. We used to, you know, you plant corn, I plant yam, you know, you have the meat or that provides or cows that provide milk or goats that provide milk. And this person had that. And we would barter prior to the money system. There was a bartering system. And 
yeah, I truly believe that Africa would would thrive if they um, benefited from each other willingly. Um, welcome to the conversation, to Nigel. Um, I want to, uh, you know, you know this this conversation about Rwanda. It it's really hard to talk about Rwanda without somebody bringing up the Congo. But we're really talking about Rwanda, the leadership in Rwanda, where 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 it's been, what what it is right now. Um, Tell me what you would like to contribute. Welcome. Yeah, um, thank you uh, for having me. I appreciate it. And um, Lamin, uh, good to see you. And um, yeah, this thing about the voicing, I don't get it. <laughs> I really don't get this voicing. You know, it's always <laughs> in the problem talking about whatever it's like, it's like, oh, your voice is deep today. Whenever it agrees with me, my voice is deep. When it disagrees, <laughs> your voice it's is lame. <laughs> I'll let you do it. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I love uh to Nigel's voice. Um, <laughs> also, what's that other brother name? You remember him? Um, yeah, I forgot his name. Yeah, he doesn't show up uh, often. <laughs> Man, that guy is on a different level altogether. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's on a different level. So about this um Rwandan thing, he said it's a it's a tricky one. Yeah. Uh, because you really have to be in the heart of Kagame to fully understand these things. Yeah. And you have to be in his head. But one thing I know is that the guy, when he talks, he sounds sincere. And uh, the way he's treating his people, he's doing the right by them, giving them free education, the right amenities, good health care. And uh, the environment is safe. Yeah. Safe. So he's providing for his nation the way nations uh, leaders are supposed to do in the country. And continent-wide, he also is assisting wherever he can. Um, I saw the video you played just now when the guy was saying something about using Rwanda to mm -hmm. assist the U.S. in their objectives on the continent. That may be true. And um, what that the question is, what are they getting for it? What, what is, is Africa the, getting for it? What yes. is Africa, Rwanda and uh, Uganda getting for it? Yes. Well, I could clearly see that if if any if anybody's getting anything, I can't really tell what Uganda's getting, but I could see, um, I could see some beautiful effects in Rwanda. I don't know if that's what he's getting for it as much as, um, you know, when you when people look at when I, when people speak of Rwanda and they talk about how beautiful and how wonderful it's doing, other people jump up and say it's really because of what all that they're doing to the Congolese. Um, so maybe yeah, that's yeah. what everybody thinks. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that that's the reason. I think if he was, um, I think if he was as scrupulous as they say he was, he wouldn't be doing right by his people either. Go ahead tonight. Exactly. That, that is a very good point, you see, because sometimes people forget that bad leaders don't have time to for the niceties. They always be, they are always bad to their people and they will enrich themselves beyond no beyond reason. You yeah. don't see Gagame doing that. He's not being personal about wealth. Half of his, uh, this thing, the people in the, the women, uh, that's the members of Congress or Senate, Parliament that they have, I'm not sure. But half of the legislators are women, or more than half are and women. That's, that's saying a lot to Niger, to, uh, for a president, a male president in Africa to have so many women. And it's funny because wasn't Magafuli, wasn't his vice president, his vice president was a woman as a well. A woman too, yes. He said so, he had women in um in, in 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 very strong places and so that says a lot about the the type of leaders that are doing well for their countries go ahead mm, if, if you look at everything that he's been doing he seems to be making all the right noise he's doing all the right things he's not paying lip service to things and what you tend to find with leaders is that they don't have time to pay lip service to to stuff they are not that machiavellian because power makes them not to want to pretend too much mm -hmm. and it gives them the freedom to be who they really want to be uh, if you really want to know people give them power that's when you really know somebody you know once they have power you, yeah you see their true attitude come out and, and if that is the case um the president of rwanda has power and his mm -hmm. attitude towards his people i mean yeah. towards the country towards the infrastructure towards them towards education is a positive one. And when I look at statements like what what African just said, Rwanda is back, uh, the Jewish, back in the US. I guess he's backed by the Jewish, backed by the US. That's what you're saying. What they are getting from is the minerals from the Congo. 
how can Rwanda be producer of Coltan, Coltan when they don't have Coltan? What do you guys have to say about that? Um, yes, it's true that they may be exploiting Congo uh, to do what they are doing. But when they were busy killing themselves uh, during the genocide, Congo was still being exploited. So it, it, you, you see, you, you have to take yes for an answer in this world. If you get some positives, don't complain too much that there is no negative because there was double negatives before. Rwanda had genocide, Congo was at war, everybody was losing. If, if you get something good coming out of one side, you don't say, oh, one side is doing well, why is the other side not do, doing uh, this thing uh, just as well? It's not going to be the same. Maybe some of the things Rwanda is doing today that appears to uh, look like they are exploiting um, Congo is because they see Congo being exploited already. Mm-hmm. So they take part They take part in the gaining some of the resources. And where are they putting the resources? The important thing is where they are putting the resources. They are putting it on the ground in Africa there. They are using it to develop the, the state. They are not exporting everything overseas. And if they are doing that, you will see it because there will be no, the infrastructure will not be improving. The standard of living in Rwanda will be falling. And but that's it's hard. On the it's really hard to negate the fact that if he is ruthless, and I said this, he's brilliant because uh, you can't say he didn't put in the work. There are people that are in office for 20 to 30 years in Africa and they've done not even um, a percentage of what he's done in Rwanda. Um, and a lot of folks are also concerned about the time that he spent in office. Um, but again, it's hard to really, it's really hard for me and I'm not speaking for everybody, but it's really hard for me to negate the fact that I see what he has done in these 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to ignore the fact that, I mean, you could literally eat off those streets. I can't do that here in the United States in some parts. This man, um, I mean, he has a curriculum where people are off one one day of month and everybody goes out and clean. That is just spectacular. You can't ignore the positives. Now, should other people... I mean, what should happen and what people should be complaining about is um, why aren't other leaders in Africa doing this? Doing exactly why aren't they copying right off his script or, you know, whatever that is that he's doing. Why aren't they following um, following his lead since it is, um, I I believe, successful for Rwanda? Now, you're right. There are places, there are people that's going to take advantage of other places, especially if you're not putting, okay, so they've got all this resource in the Congo. Let's talk about the Congo. They've got all this resource in the Congo, but everybody's exploiting them. Now, let's take Rwanda out the way. Is the exploitation going to stop? No, not at all. And that's the reality of it. My people don't, you see, we can sit here and we can talk about the, his part, but his part in it is not going to change the reality on ground folks for the Congolese. The Congolese is being exploited. It's Gina, it's a, it's a shell game. You know, the shell game where you put the nut (laughs) under the free, the free cups and you juggle it around, and then you find you try to find a nut. This is what they've been doing, yeah? I mean, Rwanda, you know, whatever you say, they might be, well, you know, you, you might be, they might be exploiting the Congo. I don't think but- I'm lying, Puppies Bay. I'm only going based on what I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Lamin, but I want to respond. Puppies Bay says, Gina, stop lying. I'm not lying. I'm going based on my perception. Now, if you have, like I said, something that you'd like to share, you're welcome to uh, hit the link. And come up here and say it. But yes, based come on, on my perception, I think that he's doing an amazing job. And I truly believe a leader have to be all things. And I think brilliant and ruthless and strat- strategic, those things are important. And sometimes you have to do that within. I mean, I'm in America and I know that there are certain things happening within state from state to state. Being, you know, the governors are are, are being ruthless and uh very uh, maneuvering as far as how they get things done in each state. Some states um, deplete other states 
of resources here in America as well. But you have to learn how to play chess. Right. Now, the leadership in Congo need to learn how to play chess because they cannot be one of the most resourceful uh, countries in Africa and still um, allow the type of leadership to come along that aren't doing what they need to do to make sure that, you know, they win. They need to win. And 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 we can't do that by um you can't win by saying, Well, look at what this person's doing to me. You gotta get up and do it. Right. That's that's my opinion. And I'm not gonna be soft about that because to be honest with you, um if there was nobody else taking advantage of the Congo at this time, if there were no other countries benefiting from the resources at this time, then I could sit down and say, Hey, you know, um, yeah, it's wrong. But to be honest, before you give it all away to strangers, maybe you should feed some of your brothers and sisters. Right. But Gina, don't forget I the culprit. Little, I sound a little wrong for that, I'm sure. Go ahead. <laughs> don't, Go ahead. We, 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 as I said, yeah, um, don't forget, in all of these things, don't forget the culprit. Don't forget these, the, the people. Pastor. Yes, that's what I'm talking don't about. For, don't forget. Exactly. As I said, this is a shell game. They do these proxy wars. They do these things to you, you know, and I'm not saying that there are some, we do some wicked things to each other. Right. We kill each other. But if you look at the root of these things, yeah, don't for, never forget the history. These people will, will, will do all these things for you to, to, to fight each other. You know, he um, said that Rwanda is the only country that killed 15 million people in the Congo. Sorry. I don't know if that's facts. I don't think Rwanda could kill 15 oh, that's, people. That's, um, that, that's, that's, a deep, that's a deep statement, man. man. That's a deep it, statement, it, man. It can't be Rwanda that is just only for killing no way. many no people. Way. I don't, I don't, I don't. This is the kind of statements that people make that are definitely unfounded. You see, Gina, right? A lot of people... Um, Here are the facts. People... Give me a link. Send me a link for these facts because I need to see this because what happens is if I go digging and I realize that there's a puppet master, then... I don't think Rwanda's doing it. Just like I don't think anything that Congo's doing or any other country's doing being done. Like we already said, we already discussed many times that most of these leaders are hostages. But in reference to Rwanda, he's maneuvering in a way where at least his people are eating, living in clean homes. They're not living in infrastructures that are not habitable. You know, these well, these things have to be looked at, and you can't blame. Uh, the Rwandan president for um, for the leadership not being what it should be in the Congo. We can't do that. That's not okay. Because guess what? That's just like saying that the there is no leadership in the Congo and Rwanda is the only that has leadership and they're doing this. Where's the leadership in the Congo to make sure that nobody is is depleting them of their resources that should be first that should be benefiting the people first. Right. Where are the, where's the leadership that should be protecting the people in the Congo? What's response, what is the Paul Kagame's responsibility is, is to do what he needs to do for Rwanda. Now, he, yeah. cannot, he cannot get away. I mean, I, I don't think, you know, he would be able to, um, to uh, go into the Congo and do all the things that you said he did, killing 15 million people, one, without puppet master, two, without the leadership in the Congo being engaged and willing participant? No. There Gina. is something going on in the Congo. There is some selling out going in the Congo because there is no way. There's no way. That being said, go, um, go ahead, Lamin. I'm sorry. I just, just a quick thing. Um, you know, I can hear African, you know, a lot of people... Are talking from her, you know. If mm -hmm. you've got a history, if you've got a history where someone then kills your family and kills your whole, you know, they kill. You've got a lot of war, and you, you know, you can't put that aside. You can ask to Niger, you know, the Biafran people in Nigeria, you know, uh, they're, they're hurting against the Fulatis. So you you cannot dismiss people's hurt, but you, you got to understand people are talking talking from you know. If someone come and kill my whole family, and 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 kill my cousins and everything like that and it's nothing to do with a white man, it's your next door neighbor, they're not going to be looking into what the cause of it is. They're just going to be looking, look, you, I, need to, I need to go and have some revenge. 
And right. that's what these that's what these puppet masters, as you put it, I call them interlopers. Yeah. Yeah. A lot, that's what they do. They've done it in all the countries. Ask to Niger with the Biafran people. Ask 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 um the, the Gambians. Ask um the, it's it's all over mm. the the Congolese everywhere. So people on one side or the other are gonna be talking from her. And this is what they want us to do. I mean, e e even in the States. The Bloods, the Crips, you know, if, if the Bloods come and kill my family, you're going to be, the, the, the Crips are going to want to kill their family. But exactly. they don't realise they're all in the hood together. Who put them in that hood? You understand? I, so we've, exactly. all, we've always got, that's what I want to say, my queen. I let everybody, people come in. Thank you so much. And you know what? To go back to what, what TB Dan, I agree with you. This is what I'm trying to say. You know, what, you know, regard, okay, the Rwandans are doing this, but what is, Big old Congo. What is you got this big country with all these people in it? Your military should be able to override whatever forces that, like he said in um, like Paul Kagame said in the beginning, you 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 can't you can't stop from people not liking you. You can't stop people from talking about you. Can't stop people from not liking you. Can't stop people from wanting to hurt you. What you can do, however. Is the you know is gonna be based on how do you absorb that? How do you handle that business? And is Congo handling its business? That's the question. Because when I sat and I was listening and I did my research, and I the one thing that kept coming to mind was what why are these people so easily how how is it so easy to infiltrate the Congo? There's some selling out being done, and we need to talk about that, but not today. I can't focus on the, the 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 accomplishment of Paul Kagame without having to um, talk about something that you know another leadership is letting happen. We have to come to terms that we have some leaders that are getting paid just to do nothing, and it's important that they do nothing so everybody else could get away with all the things they want to get away with. I want to welcome uh, Cali Enigma to the conversation and Abdul Cali Enigma. Uh, you came in first, my brother. Nice to see you. Please tell me what you think about this conversation thus far. Um, I think it's a good conversation. I mean, based on my research, um, the 15 million people that were killed by in the Congo were done by King Leopold. Um, that's what I thought too. Yeah, yeah, that's I, that's I that's, that's, that's what, Yeah, they get it mixed up. Um, yeah. There was some. There was a gen. There was um the one in genocide, but yes. the numbers not even remotely close yeah. to what King Leopold, one evil white man, did by himself. And so they it's they, they, they haven't even they get that even They can talk about King Leopold. I mean, yes. I was just, I just don't understand you. You're still letting King, King Leopold's descendants come to the Congo. Yes. No, yes. no Belgian people should be allowed to come to the. Congo. You shouldn't trust any of them. I mean. 15 million people over, over. Well, you should be asking back for your artifacts from Belgium, and that'll be another thing that you should, should yeah. do. But that's a whole nother discussion. That's a whole nother discussion as well. But and that's why I didn't want to spend too much time on it right. because I'm feeling like okay, we can't. No, I just wanted to correct the record on that on that part right there. Um, because it's nice. It's, the numbers around um to it, yeah. It's, yeah, it's around three quarters of a million people that Rwanda um you know uh, you know allegedly had took out so. Three. Yeah. I mean, that's that's still horrible. I'm not trying to trying to um, downplay that. That's terrible. But th seven hundred and fifty thousand to eight hundred thousand to fifteen million. Come on, man. It's not a, not even comparison. I mean, it, both suck. Let's be yeah. honest. Both suck. Both of them suck. But let's yeah. talk about the leadership in the Congo that's let all these people come in and just reduce all the resources, <laughs> continually abusing and misusing these people. How many people have they killed? Yeah, exactly. That they yeah, Europe, that. the Europe, Europeans have done far more damage. Not just than, Europe, uh, than, than, and then your fellow Africans could ever do. Exactly, and that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about okay. We need to take ownership. Like okay, yes, I, brothers fight. Things happen. People want other people's things. I'm not going to deny that fact. Um, I might, you know, still from my ch from your children to feed my children. That can happen. That's why you know. You know that thing has been happening for a very long time. I think back in the day, we used to take it to the take it to the elders and um have things, you know, dispute things. There are reasons for for us as family to dispute things, but one thing should not be disputed: the fact that these countries, be it U Uganda, be it Ru 
the Congo, they have leadership as well. Why are they doing what Paul Kagame is doing? Whatever they need to do to protect their people, whatever they need to do to, to give their people the ability to, uh, to live in an in infrastructure that is humane. And, and whatever they need to do to make sure that children are going to school for free. I'm hearing that just in 2020 is, uh, you know, primary. This is the first time that primary school became free in the Congo. What was leadership doing to, before then? It seems like they were just giving it all away. And we need to like whenever we talk about what's what what was done. Um, we need to understand that this what's happening is being done all across Africa. And I kept my old friend on here as a reminder to tell us again how it's happening and why it's happening. Uganda and why are Uganda important to the U.S. military? Precisely because we can have them do things in Africa that we don't wish to do for ourselves. We can have their soldiers die if need be. We can have them deploy places if need be. And so having proxies, having allies, having clients who are willing to do your bidding becomes very important. Shady things are happening, correct. So when you have when you have um when you have country or superpowers stepping into it and they're saying that we have them doing our bidding. Now I'm not denying that it's being done, but when you have a superpower step up to you, they usually say you have a choice. These are your choices. But you know what, Gina? This happens globally. United States does this not just in Africa. They do it in Haiti. They do it in the they, they, right? Yes, they do it. They do it all across the Caribbean, and they yeah. do it in Central and South America regularly. We yeah. actually have, we actually have um, in the United States, we have what you would call as a propaganda magazine or a propaganda uh, newspaper um, in, um, in Bolivia. In Bolivia, we have a propaganda paper in Bolivia and we have a propaganda paper in uh, Venezuela where we we pretty much we, we cause up and we stir up and, um, all kind of racket to try to get the citizens to overthrow the government so we can get a more favorable government and power so we can actually have access to the Venezuelan oil or to other resources in Bolivia and throughout Central and South America. We have mm -hmm. sanctions on Nicaragua because Daniel Ortega, he won't do what we want him to do. And there's a lot of oil. I'm not like oil. There's a lot of gold and other minerals in uh, Nicaragua that we would like to take as well. So the United States, this is what countries like the United States to do. I mean, my country. <laughs> so what we do, we had a school called the School of Americas where we would um, train dictators. We train dictators all over the world. That's what the United States government does. It's and you can you don't believe me. You can look this stuff. This is not. There's a, also a documentary. Um. Uh, for, from Vice, where they actually talk, talk about the School of America, but I read about this years ago. We trained Juan Mel, um, uh, uh, Noriega. We trained Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein. We educated that and put him in power. This is what we do. So for a lot of people who are concerned about uh, people inside your country, understand those people are usually bought or coerced, or coerced to, in order to they do what Robert they are doing to you. Robert Mugabe as well. Yes, and and some, bro. Believe me, <laughs> you can you can look all of this up where we educate people, man. A lot of a lot of leaders uh, out of Africa have been educated in the West or in the United States of America. Where we've definitely had a lot of we have a lot of pool around the world. You may not know it, we, we don't want you to know it. We want to disguise it as we don't have uh, our like hands in the pocket. You no, know, we 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 they they empower certain countries to do their bidding. Welcome to the conversation, Abdul. Thank you, Callie of Enigma. Please stick around. This is going to be a good conversation. I see you got a lot, a lot of hate going on in there, um, African, in the comment sections. This is not about me, but it is my per my um, my um opinion. You could come on here and give your opinion, but um, I'm going to have mine. And far as I'm concerned, um, the Congo leadership, leadership need to stand up and protect the Congo or, you know, step aside and let somebody that's just as brilliant and ruthless. Like I said, I believe he's ruthless and brilliant. I didn't take that away. I feel like, okay, let me just give you a picture. Paul Kagame was the same person that um, um, basically was a part of the force that, right, you know, the genocide that was going on in his country. For him to see all that that happened, this man to be 
to 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 overcome everything that happened had to be somewhere in his mind had to like construct the the thought of um I'm going to do whatever I need to do to protect and to make my to take care of my people and and you know that's a whole different conversation right there but uh he's doing just that what is going on with the leadership in the Congo that they're not protecting their people this is what we need to talk about now he may be wrong. I don't know. He might have done. He might have maneuvered. He made some plates. Played a couple of cards. Had some cards under the table. You know, did some shady moves. But that's politics. It happens right here. This little USA. You have a governor in this country, this state, doing shady stuff to another state just so they could get ahead. This is a part of being in the po political realm. You got to be, you got to play dirty. You got to do whatever you need to do. Now it would be great. That's why I said one Africa is needed. You see what makes America different is because it's one and they have different gov places that are being governed, but they're all working in unison. If not, trust me, it will be just like Africa where you have these different countries going to war with each other until Africa realizes that, you know, we need to be one, you know, and divide, take away those invisible lines until people stop calling out, you know, different. But you, but you, chicken stock queen, I, I, I wish, I wish, and sometimes I wish that uh, we were allowed to, to do stuff like cut off places like Kentucky and West Virginia and people that complain and talk ish about um, California. I would love to because we feed the entire country, our state, but um, countries like maybe like uh, states like Kentucky, which put nothing into the federal pot, literally nothing. They get uh, three dollars for every dollar they put in. They literally put nothing into the federal pot, always trash in California, places you know like West they, Virginia. You know what they do have, though, in Kentucky? They have a lot of folks that that go into uh, the Air Force and um, the Marines and all of that. They have a lot of that. Just because people aren't putting money into the pot don't mean that they're not putting something else in there. Look it up. No, no, I, no, I understand about stuff like that. I'm just talking about people that trash in California when um, yeah. we pour, we put in more money than we get back. Is we what I'm just saying. Put a lot of money in, but a lot of those states that you mentioned, especially those little Hick, Hickville states. Yeah, racist states. <laughs> Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. So, uh, same here, though. We, we actually send more than them. But then we're the largest state, too. Yeah, no, we do. We're, we're, we have 40 million people in our state. I don't think the USA would be what it is if it was not one. I truly don't. I don't oh, think. It, oh, oh, it would be a war. It like would be it was when they were colonies. It would be anarchy. Yes. <laughs> Abdul, but welcome it, to the conversation, my brother. You've been very patient. Please tell me what you think about everything you've heard so far. You're on mute. Abdul? Uh, hello? Okay. Yeah, now you're good. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, uh, good evening in your evening. side. Yeah, morning in my own side because it's already morning. Okay. Uh, Where are you? Yeah. <laughs> so, because I'm listening very carefully, the mm -hmm. program you present is a good program oh, thank for you. us to learn as Africans so we can able to unite as one voice. You know, sometimes... I always say this, it's like, don't try to blame people for your own failure. This yeah. is a problem with we Africans. We are quick to blame people, but don't want to correct our mistakes. You know, the thing that Paul Gagami, the thing that he do in Rwanda, I was so proud of him because if you look, because the country I came from, we fought for the same year, 94, uh, the same 1994 as well. But if you look, the type of achievements Paul Gagami have already done in Rwanda, we should applaud him, we should be proud of him. We are not perfect. All of us have issues. But sometimes we have to look at the good things, we praise the good things. Uh, when people say that Paul Gagami is the one that exploiting uh, Congo, sometimes it makes me feel sad because if you look at Congo, Congo, yeah. Congo is bigger than Rwanda more than 50 times. Yes, that's if that's I'm the right. The population the is more, all the, yeah, yeah, even the population is closer to 80 million, if I'm right, more than that. 
compared to small Rwanda. So this is just like when people don't like someone, especially the Congolese, because I have a friend who's from Congo. I asked him simple question. I said, how can a Rwanda who exploit Congo explain to me? He said, no, he support this. So I said, you are fat. He said, no, BBC, uh, BBC said that all oh, jazz here. I said, this is a problem with us Africans. We don't have fat. We don't have anything that can prove that this guy is exploiting Congo. The simple question we should ask ourselves, did Paul Gagami have company that exploit Congo? The mineral resources? No. The answer is no. You see, and the thing the here is the, Congo, the, the, the problem, the Congolese themselves don't want to take responsibility of their own failures. There is no leadership. Because if you bring slaves into government position, they will never succeed because they come for their own selfish interest. That is the problem with Congo. You see, the Congolese have to look at, at themselves. They take responsibilities. I have a lot of Congolese friends, even the willing to work for France than Congo himself. Mm. So there is no need to blame Pope Gagami. Me, I'm totally disagree with anyone. Mm. If you look, Congo have the resources to take on any country in that particular sub-region yeah. because they have the population, they have the military. The leadership, there is no leadership in Congo. That's what I've been screaming. Where's the leadership? Why aren't see, they being This is a problem. Yeah. So if you don't have leadership in any country, people don't seem to take responsibility. They want to blame someone else from, for their failures. It's not working like that. For me as African, I, I so admire Paul Gagami and the late man, John Marco Fule. These are the leaders. Yeah. Even now, when people are say, "Oh, Kagame is a dictator," it's not. Any look, this is a thing that we Africa fail to realize. When we have leaders that are willing to work for Africans, the Western world they use the media to brainwash us. I don't know what is wrong wrong with us. Yeah, it's like we don't it's want a strong. Sad. We don't want strong leaders. We don't want leaders that are capable of making the kind of moves that, um, yeah. you know, Kagame. I think would be a great president for all of Africa. <laughs> you know what no, I mean? No, no, he's great. You know, I, great. I mean, if I was to choose a president, I mean, right now, you know, it would have to be, I mean, even though I like the Ghanaian president and, you know, Michael Fooley is no longer, I would have to go with Paul Kagame because of all that he has done for Rwanda. Imagine no, Gina, no. that being yeah. done across yeah. the whole continent. We need that. Yeah. We need yeah. that. We even need even, even what he did. I don't know all that he did, yeah. if it was right, if it was wrong, but hey, I don't see what the leadership in the Congo have done. Yeah, you're, you're right. No, uh, Gina, the thing that uh, we have to realize is that if you look at the leadership of Paul Gagami, let's have like six, seven leaders in Africa. Mm -hmm. Africa will never be the same anymore. The other leader I'm so impressed with, the leader in Malawi, He's doing similar thing like the things that uh, John Marco Foley is doing right now. So I'm um, I'm taking close close look at that particular leader as well. But the Congo, they need to come as a nation to take responsibility for that for their own country. If not that, we keep on talking history. Exactly. We sometimes we just blame the, the Americans, the French, the British. We Africans, we are the one who create the opportunity for them. Exactly. And, yes, and I, the one. I think that's where it is. If you want to sit there and make excuses for what's happening in certain country, but then you're saying, yes. if you were telling me that superpowers are coming and they're doing this, that's different. But when you're telling me that another leader in Africa is capable of doing this to another leader in Africa, well, what's wrong with this other leader? Then he's not a leader yes. and he's not, he's yes. not, he's yes. not securing his country, then that's the problem. The problem is, is, problem. That, you is have problem. that or you've had leadership that don't protect or govern its people. And Gina, say this. He's paid to, that leader's paid to fail. That's all I need to say. So, 
Tommy's doing his job. He's protecting and doing whatever he needs to do, sometimes a little bit ruthless. Now, we got to deal with that reality. It's a reality. I don't know. No. I, I, can't, no. I can't say I know exactly everything that's being done, but I know that um, the people that are complaining um, are failing to understand that you cannot, um, what do you can't, you cannot negate the fact that if we were, if Paul Kagame had never went into the Congo, that the Congo would still be at the state that it is. And even more so, I think and even uh, worse probably because no. there's, there's no. been no representation to protect no. the Congo from all no. the, the parasites that's been coming to deplete it from other nations that nobody talks about really. But that no, being said, uh, before you go on, I want to share a video, Abdul. Before you say anything else, I want to share, 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 share a little clip because you know I hear a lot of folks say, "Well, you're not being fair." I, I, I looked at the negative, but what I came up with, and this is my opinion, and this is why I have an open forum. If you disagree, come out the comment section and speak, and be spoken to. Don't sit in the comment section with your little uh, keyboard you know, power, power tearing your little thoughts, because that means nothing. So have, put your voice out there. What are you afraid of? Um, these are my opinions. I'm going to stick with them. I don't change my opinion because somebody says, well, I don't know something. You must not understand the fact that when you put people in power, people are supposed to uh, be able to protect you. And it looks like that's not happening in a Congo. In May this year, the UN released a report that accused Rwanda of complicity in supplying weapons and soldiers to the rebels in the DR Congo. This report sparked off a discussion that has seen Rwanda officials repeatedly deny the report and any involvement with the rebels in Congo. Today, the Rwandan President Paul Kagame came out to speak about the allegations and lashed out at the UN for failing to take responsibility of its failures and instead resort to blackmailing Rwanda. It, it, we will be forced into a situation where we just draw a line and say, well, if you don't even want us to be useful, if you don't want us to participate, in finding a, a solution and you are just creating false grounds to blackmail us, we don't respond to blackmail. We don't at all. So we, we, we will draw a line and say, okay, forget about us and forget about us in the Congo. We will deal with matters just on, the, on this side. Whoever finds us here, we will fight. Fight it out. While addressing journalists at the State House in Kigali, the president clarified the good relationship between Congo and Rwanda and blamed the UN for creating an image that all Congo's governance problems are because of Rwanda, as opposed to acting necessarily as a peacekeeping body that has operated in the country for years. The main focus is on continuing to have a good relationship with the Congo and to continue to work with the Congolese so that we resolve our problem that still remains best in the Congo and that is of this FDR, this genocide in the Congo. That's our best main interest. Now, in this fighting for all kinds of things in the Congo, among the Congolese, now, the whole world and the Congo is saying, no, the problem is Rwanda. Yeah, how does the problem become Rwanda? President Kagame also stated that he is not responsible for Rwandans that have over the years settled in Congo and are accused of committing crimes in the country. He suggested that the UN should find a solution for them because most of them are genociders running away from justice in Rwanda. I have no responsibility over it. So, if somebody therefore is going to say, oh, there are these Rwandis in the Congo who are supposed to be Congolese citizens, whatever they do, whatever they don't do, whatever they say, uh, reflects what Rwanda thinks and what Rwanda is doing, and so on and so forth in the Congo. There is nothing we can do about it. 
If there is anybody who can do about it, they, it's those who created that situation. Do they want to supplant them and bring them back here to live in Rwanda? Let them go ahead and do it. Are there grounds to treat them as citizens of that country? That's fine. They should look at it and see the merits of it. And accept. But we cannot have a situation where it is neither this nor that. Now the president is calling upon the UN and other international bodies like Human Rights Watch to stay away from Rwanda's recovery and reconciliation process because they never offered and still don't offer their desired services when necessary. Craig Kadoda, NTV, Kigali, Rwanda. Okay, guys, I just really wanted to uh, play that to... Uh, you know, speak on the things that um, a lot of folks are saying, you know, all the criticism or all the um, allegations. Now, African, I did put you out this channel because I, I really don't appreciate you coming here and not getting on the panel to speak your negativity. <laughs> I like when people are being so negative for them to come on panel. Um, so, yeah, you're not doing any justice just being negative in the comment section. And it's a little distracting because I'm trying to focus in on my conversation and I'm looking at the comments and there you are wearing your little negative head and it's a little um, frustrating. Yeah, so that being said, you're blocked. Okay, Lana, Gina, go ahead. Give us on your mind. You got to be aware. Sometimes it could be an agent as well, you know. Um, I just want to <laughs> quickly say, um, it's like, you know, you got to be aware of these things because I, 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 all I've got to say is that all over the world, you're never going to hear positive um, things about African countries or African leaders. The propaganda of the West is so vast that um, I was just thinking about this. Even in, even in African countries, mm -hmm. African countries, their networks, right, they're just spilling out the same Western propaganda. So you've got to always bear in mind, it's like when I heard you and Callie speaking, you, you, I, heard, I noticed you kept on saying we, we in the country, right? But you got to remember that while, while the USA might be the belly of the beast, yeah, the UKKK is the head of the beast, right? The, the, you guys, the, all the presidents, they got to come to the, to the queen when they get inaugurated, yeah? They got to come over here to the queen to pay homage, right? So before, I just want to quickly say, yeah, don't forget that, as you say, you always got to go back to the puppet masters and the people who are pulling the strings. You're, they're never going to... Um, look Look what they did to Manga Fully. They tried, uh, over here, right, they were spinning him like to say, oh, he yeah. was a man who was against COVID. He was a man. And look, they're trying to say, they didn't actually say he died of COVID, but what, what they're spinning is that, look, this was the man who was against our recommendations to put COVID plans. But look, he's he's died. He died. Of, they didn't actually say he's died of COVID, but that's what they're trying to say. So, that's all I'm trying to say, Gina, right, to the people. Never forget who the puppet masters is. And that's forget the point. I mean, we come together as a family not to um, talk about the obvious. The obvious is that it does look like uh, Rwanda is benefiting from, from what's happening or, or, or taking advantage of, you know, somebody brought up they don't have Coltrane. That's true. That's true. But... <laughs> The whole world don't have it, but uh, it's being supplied to them. Um, and, you know, we're sitting here talking about what is what Rwanda is doing to the Congo. And just like Abdul said, the size of Congo, the, the amount of people that's in the Congo. I mean, there is no way that Rwanda should be able to do that without the Congo being you know, open to it. That's all I'm saying. There's, and they're open to it because they have poor leadership. And, and that's all I've got to say on that. Welcome. Uh, I've mom ding Lerlin. And why you changed that? You made it harder for me. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to the conversation. Tell me what's on your mind tonight. We're talking about the Congo. Well, it seemed like we're talking about the Congo. This conversation is really about Rwanda. And what uh, do you think about his leadership? And would you like to see this maybe in the Gambia? What do you think? Hi, everyone. Hi, Gina. I, Hello. I, Welcome. I, 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 I like Paul Kagame. You know, he, he's more like, you know, you remember Gambian president, Gambian former president, Yaya Jambe? Yes, he, I've heard of him. Yeah, he is very similar to him. 
but I think he's more 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 into development than than ruthless. If that makes sense. Yes. I mean, yeah. Some people, like our people, I'm gonna talk to our, our, about our people. Our people cannot be ruled by just talking. Sometimes we need to stick. We need a stick to be hit, so that we can see where we're going. We just, we are just, we are just melanin people. That, that's what the, that's the way black people are. I just used to say this: black people cannot just be ruled by just talking. Sometimes you need to hit them, and they will say, "What? It hurt." And then yeah. they will Look at you in the eyes. Feel it. Yeah. Yeah. But just by talking, they will not listen. If you if you if you if you imagine what Rwanda have been through, and see where they are, who give, who who cares about little little minor people complaining about how ruthless the man is? If he's not ruthless, are we do is Rwanda gonna be the way it is now? No, I mean I'm going back to Yaya Jambe. When Yaya Jambe was in Gambia, I mean we had a former president called Salola Kaira Jora for 30 years. There was no development when Yaya Jambe come. He was one of the most ruthless president we ever come across. But look at how replic- how he changed the country for the past 22 years he lived there. Yes, there's a lot of people have been killed, but everyone have the... You see, I've never supported the guy since he left. But the, the work he's done in Gambia, we can't deny it. What, what we lack of in, in Africa is leadership. And our leaders now, I think they are well... Uganda, uh, sorry, Rwanda is an example of all Africa. I don't care what people saying about what Congo, what they are doing to Congo. I don't think they do anything to Congo. When the leadership in Congo if he's so weak, people in Congo will try to find a safe place. And Rwanda is very close to it. So if they're going to hiding from the violence that they can, they they can protect them in their own home. If they're going to Rwanda, they will take their resources with them. Don't you think? I think I, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Gina, I cannot hear you. Gina, you got to unmute yourself. Oh, okay. Unmute yourself. Sorry. Thank you, guys. I apologize. I got to get back on track with that. Now, in reference to everything that you said, Lamb, and I agree 100%, my thing is this. I'm going back to the enormous size of the Congo, all its resources. Yep. Rwanda mm-hmm. is, you know, like the brother said earlier, it's not even a percentage in size as far as, you know, the population, anything. The Rwandians, you know, the Congolese should be able to protect themselves. They lack leadership. They lack guidance. They lack, they lack, uh, uh, the kind of government government governance that's needed to be I mean, a strong country. We, we and Rwanda, we, like you said, proves that it can be done. Yeah. So we need to I, learn from this man. I think all, Africa, all Africa, all, all Africa should learn from Rwanda. All I Africa. Agree. Forget about it. I know, the, I, know the, I have this, people that are not happy with me saying that, but I agree. Listen, these people have gone through genocide where they have a uh, tribal uh, sorry, what's your tribal tribal war and all that stuff that going on for this man to come to put them all together and put all their differences behind and develop uh, to build the country to where it is today to be an example of Africa. I think we also learn from that. I don't care if the Western and the Western media and the hypocrites start sit there and telling us that this man is a dictator. I rather have dictator like this and than having president like Adam Obama who is sleeping in Gambia and <laughs> he have no clue how to rule, how to run a, even a house, never mind a country. Oh, goodness. I, I'm, I'm going to be speaking about him. Uh, I can't wait to get to him. <laughs> when man, we, were, yeah, we were out of Commonwealth. What he did, what he did, what he did first thing, he come back to the, when we take over, he took us back to Commonwealth. What did Commonwealth do for Africa or any African country or any Commonwealth country? Yeah, true. Speak, Lamin, speak, man. What have they done for us? Look at look at the infrastructure in any Africa, any West African country that have been colonized by Britain. Poverty, all you see is poverty. And you know what? I blame them, but I blame us as well. We play a big role in this poverty. But it's good. Now we change it. We all talking. I think that's a start. Don't it? Let's copy yeah. Rwanda. Maybe when we copy Rwanda, we'll have the respect we need as African or as black people as a whole. 
We need to develop our home, and it's not developed from from the dust, the deadness, to even the way we brought our children up. We don't even teach them how to be how to be clean. We just let them to grow however they want. And then we, when we go outside, we demand in respect. Everything should be start from our home, from our no, never mind the country. Let's start our home first. Let's change. And the there is some respect that needs to be put on Paul Kagami's name. I'm gonna say it right now yes. because not only is he a good president, um, you know, he 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 also was a part of the change of what you know this to stop the genocide. He played. He was a chief commander, you know, um, and he he in retrospect, you know. In retrospect, uh, stop the genocide, you know, with his rebel group. So this man was there from its from infancy. the beginning. Yes, from the beginning, from the infancy. So it's not something that you know somebody did all the hard work and he's just sitting in the office. No, Gina, he's been even you, even you, even he you was, today, he's somebody been will be in the work. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Even you today, somebody will be sitting there criticizing you just for doing this program to talk Hell yeah. about. I just, I, I just blocked him. His name was African. <laughs> or yeah, her I'm name. Saying, I don't know. I'm just saying, so for, for this man, for, for Paul Kagabi, you will have, I had, I've seen Africans, even Africans that born and brought up in Africa, in that poverty. I've seen them in the internet, right? They don't have a good leadership in their country, but they're sitting there slugging Rwanda president saying that they, they're taking their resources from, from Congo. If they take the resources from Congo, they should do that. Because Congo don't know how to use the resources. They they're too busy buying guns to kill each other. Exactly. Uh, the, uh, and the tribe. We don't need this. He we said Kagami come... makes them clean. I wish all the leadership would make them clean. Exactly. <laughs> I think, I think, do you see how clean the country is? And, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Who don't want that? Who don't want everybody, that? I mean, all of Africa needs leaders that are Thursday, you know every what? Thursday, every Saturday, and Sunday, they come out for cleaning. Every single person living in the country have to come out and do cleaning. I think that's amazing. I think that's phenomenal, and there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Look at the African country. Everything. When you say Africa, what do you think about death, death, dirty? First thing that comes to your mind is dirty. When you say Africa, all first thing you think is hunger and dirtiness. We can I, we, we can be poor. Agree. We can be poor. That's not a problem. But we have to be clean for us. Never mind infrastructure. Look at look at Rwanda now. You can even sit in. I've seen Maya, right? Maya, before I come to you, I was watching because I knew you're having this conversation. I was watching my my, my wider Maya. Mm -hmm. I love what she just said here. Yeah, my pizza said cleanliness have become a part of their culture. I love it. <laughs> I was watching uh wider Maya and he was sitting in the gutter and mm -hmm. And he was eating a tea, he was eating what's it, rice or something in, in a gutter. Imagine me going to Gambia and sitting in the gutter and eating the rice. I will, I, I will have I will, I will be in the hospital the next day. <laughs> and that's true. And you know what? <laughs> a lot of people cannot. It's funny because you're always gonna find the naysayers, you're gonna find the people that have these opinions, and I get it. Even Wendy, I love Wendy, and, I, and she had a lot to say about um, Paul, uh, Paul Kagami in Rwanda. But when you look at the big picture, um, what is the leadership doing there? And that's what we need to ask ourselves. You can't, I mean, there's no no strong man should be able to come into your house if, you, if you're a strong man. You should be able to defend yourself. Congo is a strong, has a... Um, is placed in a, a stronger position than Rwanda. They have they have the ability to be the bullies in Africa if they want to. Exactly. But, but they're not. So why is that? Go ahead. Uh, and, 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 and the thing about um, the cleanliness thing is that it's not just only for their health. Because if people, if your environment is clean, it means that people will want to come back there to do business. They want to come back there to come and invest which means you get even more development. And this is why cleaning, having your environment clean is important. There is another aspect to this. What um, uh, um, uh, Modemaya revealed was that it wasn't high-tech cleaning. You didn't, you didn't need mechanized sweeper, road sweepers to do all those things. You can employ the locals just to keep the environment clean, which means every African leader has the capacity to do this if they wanted to. You, you know, if you do that, what that means is that people will want to come back there. They want to come and spend good money in your country, invest in your country, and help your country develop. 
Because if anybody come, goes to an environment and the whole place is full of filth and all the rest of it, that is all they associate that place to. They will never associate that place with, with the place they want to come and stay for a long period of time to do business in. So, and that is very revealing because it's not high tech. It doesn't require high tech. It just requires the will for the, our leaders to do these things. And that can be put in place. Another angle to this is um, uh, what um, Kagame did was that he moved um, the Rwanda from just purely a French uh, this in associated colony to the uh, this in the Commonwealth, which means they, they started going forward towards the Anglophone and uh, this in countries, and that switch we have made most most of the difference really because the Anglophones they really don't have to strangle their countries, in especially in the sub-Saharan African countries, the uh, flank I mean the Francophone countries I mean. Those countries suffer a lot, and Congo is still one of them. They go through hell because of their ties to France. And they decapitate, the Congo has got a decapitated leadership right now. They don't have leadership, in other words. They have actions that can't get, seem to get their head together to know that if they come together, they will be better off. Yeah. They can't seem to get to that point. Uh, to um, alleviate their, their, themselves. And the thing about when people talk about uh, um, this Kagame having a kind of uh, dictatorial streak, you have to, in this world now, given the state of your country, if your country is that weak, you are not, you have to be strong enough to have fought them. Democracy is a luxury of, of strong nations. I'm happy you said that to, to Nigel. I mean, these people that are on here talking about, he's did this. What kind of presidents do you think we need in Africa with, with all the superpowers coming in like parasites? What kind of presidents do you think we need? What kind of leadership do you think we need? You think we need people that are just collecting checks? Are we that, um, are we that secure and everything that we don't really need somebody that really is putting in work. You need people that's going to put in work and able to to maneuver in certain ways, sometimes ruthless. You, you have to be. You, you just simply have to be. So that's how Rollins was. Uh, the people that get results are often. And if you, if you, you can even argue that our African leaders are not ruthless enough. Because if you look at Stalin, Stalin, this guy came to power within that 30 years when he was in office, 20 million people died. But by the time he was done, his country was a superpower. They had nuclear weapons. They had everything that they needed to. Till today, nobody can go and mess with Russia. Look at China. Millions died when they made their uh, transition. They, some of these people, West, other parts of the world, they are even more ruthless with their people. When they have a streak, when they when they feel like they need to make a change, they don't care how many they have to. They have to get out of their way to to achieve what they want to do. The same thing with the Haitians. When the Haitians wanted to do what they wanted to do, they decimated a lot of their people too. Because they feel like if they don't do these things, they are not going to achieve what they want to do. I think you don't have to kill the way they did, but you have to have that level of belief to go in that direction, whereby nothing gets in your way to get, achieve what you need to achieve. And I think Kagame, when he talks, you can even see that in his eyes. You see, you, you have to see that glint. In, in, when I say you see the glint in the leader's eyes, Kagame shows that sometimes. He shows that because when he says what he says, you can know, you can see the pain of what he is required to do, and you can also see the resolve that he will do what he needs to do to get it done. He doesn't, he doesn't miss words, and that's why when you want to mess with that country, you have to think twice because he, when you, he talks, you know, this guy feels the, 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 the this in the empathy for his people. He wants to protect his people. At the same time, he's willing to do what it takes to make sure things are going in the right direction. And that is why he is a successful leader today. And if African leaders start learning from him, because most of the things he achieved, it wasn't like he was plucking diamonds from the sky. It's very basic stuff. He didn't like invent the, in the wheel. Our leaders, our African leaders just do some stupid, stupid things that is just like, it boggles the mind sometimes. Like, why can't he just approach these things simply in a very, very simple way? There, there is this case now, like Nigerian government, like, got president is traveled overseas to go and have medical checkup, and I was like, Jesus Christ, we have medical doctors all over the US, all over the world. Why can't we just build one massive hospital in Nigeria? If you have to spend two billion dollars building it, build it, so that all our leaders go there. You will save money. All these flight tickets that you are buying, first class, traveling overseas, hotels, and all this stuff, 
you will save the money within 10 years. All our leaders get treatment. The technology that they are learning, the, the, the treatment and the uh, this in advancement that they make from that institution will percolate throughout the economy and the, the people will be healthier for it. There are, there are so many reasons to do that, but they don't even bother. This yeah. is the kind of things someone like Adame will do easily. Yeah, they're not going to do it too, Niger. They're not going to do it because um, they don't want to come together. They don't want to work together. You know, they, 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 you know, this is the thing, you know, they, they don't want to be seen to this one. Oh, I put more money in. We, we, <laughs> you know, I've I known um, a chief um, who was, who was, who was nominated a chief in, um, in the, not in the Gambia, in um, Botswana. And um, he, he said to the people, oh, come on, let's, he, he had a chief's meeting and he said, all the chiefs, let's put some money in together. One can build a roof. One can get the sand. One can um, get the, the bricks. And they all looked at him and no one came together. They looked at him like he was mad, you know, because no one wants to come together to work together. That, that's only my opinion. But with, with Kagami, um, Gina, I would like to say, I would like to hear, you know, that, that guy that you put out, you know, I, I would like to hear if he was Tutsi, I'd like to hear from the, the people on the ground who lived there because um, he might have been biased, yeah, because he might have been coming from a place of hurt, you know, but it's good to hear from the people on the ground who actually live there or who actually, uh, 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 who know what's going on, you know? When, when I was in Ghana, that's how Ghanaians were talking about the Ghanaian president. They didn't like him. They were like, oh, this uh, Rollins is a dictator, is this, is that. I was like, the guy comes on TV and talks and I fall asleep. Believe in me, if a Nigerian president is talking, you're wondering what now? You, you're, you're... <laughs> so, if that guy makes me fall asleep, you, are, you, are, you have a luxury right now. So, stop complaining about him being a dictator. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to, you a mess. He said, you're wondering what <laughs> If a Nigerian government is making a speech, your your heart is in your mouth. You're like, what is he going to talk? What is he going to reveal to us now that our life is going to be worse for? So, I, the, the, that was a literal example. It was a literal example of what I experienced in Ghana. I'm like, you guys need to you need to chill out. This guy is a good leader. All the roads are being paved when I was there. The all the development you saw, you see now in Ghana, he started them. The roads were being paved in the 90s. All, everything, every single street in Ghana, you were like, the whole place was the construction site, and that's what I see in Nigeria yeah, today. In he the paid 90s, all the, the roads were being paved. Then think about this: when did the genocide happen? In the nineties. This man, I mean, he went right to work. They went right to work. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm sorry. We have. Pro- President has been in office for over 30 years in Africa that has not even put that's one what role. That's what I was going to say. That's what I was going to say. Exactly. But y'all not talking about them. Y'all talking about a president and then y'all going to say, okay, they're um, depleting the Congo. Um, Where's the Congo leadership to stop anyone from depleting it? Because like I said, remove Rwanda from the, from the circle of people that are depleting the Congo. Uh, is nobody else Taking from the Congo, everybody is everybody. taking from everybody is taking from Congo. I mean, let, let's say just Gambia. How many Gambians? Uh, how many Gambian Sarahules live in Congo and working in the mine from nine from sixties till now? Because my father used to live there. And how many Gambian community or Senegalese Gine, You go to Sierra Leone, go to Ghana. All of these 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 people from sixties, they are all in Congo, and now they live there. They have their families there. These all of these people, all, all these African West African country and East African, most of the people before if they can't get to Europe, they used to go to Congo. It's just I wanna December. I wanna I, I, I don't wanna sound rude or ignorant or anything, but I can't I can't go around blaming um another country for one country. You know, if somebody comes here and they attack in the United States. Are we, yeah, we could say, look what they did, but we're going to also need to say, well, what are we doing? Yeah. How do you think the United States stay a superpower? Because they put in the kind of leaders that are capable of being ruthless, even though they don't seem to be. But they are. They're ruthless. And, and, and all these superpowers around the world are ruthless. They're doing what they need to do to, uh, to, to first, first and foremost preserve their people. 
What are we is supposed to talk about? What you're saying Rwanda is doing, is that what kill God, 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 I mean, is that what this president has done? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, look at Guinea, look at Equatorial Guinea. Look at Guinea, uh, Guinea Conakry, Bissau. These are very rich countries and they have been ruled by one person for over 40, 50 years. And everybody in the country are living below poverty, below $3 a day. And the president and his wife and his children, they live in a, a luxury lifestyle. Look at Equatorial Guinea. The president has been there from, from independent till now. Now his, his son is the vice president. Look at his, and he, his so that means it's not even a president. It's like a he's a king. He's passing it. He's passing yeah. the throne. <laughs> so, his son. And they have son. so much. This country has so much mineral, so much oil. They have so much, so much, so much, so much uh, natural resources. But any anybody in that country is not benefiting out of, out of it, apart from the fam the family of the president. Look at his son all over the world. How the lifestyle he live. Go to Instagram and, and see him. Look at look at the cars he had. Look at how many cars Swiss Swiss have took off from him. These Ferraris and the cars that they took off him is worth more than ten thousand ten million dollars. I think those. And this is going back to two thousand and eleven. I think when it happened. And he's Makes still there. Sense. He's still ruling that country. Well, we have my sister Kaga Rokoya, Rokoya, uh, and Kazo came in. Kazo came in a little before you, Rokoya. I'm going to welcome Kazo to the conversation. Go Kezo, ahead, tell go me ahead, what guys. You, <laughs> hey, welcome, welcome. Kazo, tell me what you think about what we're talking about. Obviously, it's about uh, one of my favorite presidents, uh, Kagami, the president of Rwanda. Uh, please tell me, uh, give me some insight on what you think about him. Yeah. Um... Dr. Actually, Kezo. I'm sorry, Dr. Kezo, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually happy. Yeah, I'm happy. Um, yeah, actually, he's an interesting guy because I respect first and foremost what he did. Actually, you know what? He should have been the guy to have received uh, the Nobel uh, Peace Prize because he did actually create peace in a country that just suffered a genocide. He didn't allow the country to go back into another retaliation war because he's agree. actually from it. Yeah, and and sometimes when I see the kinds of people that the West push forward, you can usually see there must be something else going on because that is a pretty huge, huge deal. Think about this, right? The country suffered one of the worst genocides in the world in that time period, and he was able to bring that country to be one of the most stable countries in the world, not just in Africa, in the world. So just that achievement itself, the fact that he didn't allow the country to go into war, especially since he's from the Tutsi clan, which was predominantly the clan that was attacked first. So he could have, if he wanted to, had taken all the jets that he got from Uganda with his mercenaries and just enacted the same kind of thing to against the, the Hutus uh, class, but he didn't do it. Mm -hmm. Right. So just that fact itself, I would say he's one of the most successful uh, leaders of the world, because if you just look at how far the country has gone, that is incredible. Now, in, in, I think right now the country still needs him because there needs to be a peaceful transition into someone else, because, we, of course, the tension still exists uh, in the region and he will need to find a successor who understands how to lead uh, appropriately, because sometimes what you do is you have leaders that are good kind-hearted people but then they don't understand that politics is a game whereby you're competing with Machiavellian people that are narcissistic with the dark triads who basically face face value they present you a good deal and they decimate you in your uh, in your sleep and a perfect example is uh, some brothers and sisters would say okay China is better than the West and they usually promote China and say China is better than the West because China at least builds uh, roads and infrastructures but what they miss out is the Chinese uh, contracts that they give us tend to be basically the playing high level games of chess. The Chinese government knows, that, okay, even if these people don't pay it back, that's okay. The collateral is their seaports or their natural resources like they've done to Zambia. So what you need is leaders like Kagami who can understand the games being played and then play it better than the other leaders. And in relation to Congo, yeah, I do think, uh, yeah, he's definitely done some uh, trickeries uh, to get some cheap Congo um, minerals. <laughs> however, however, you yeah. know what? I don't think, I think this is unfair to circle in on him because everyone does that, right? 
every country in the world does that. The fact that we're using these computers right now, uh, which are made of coltan and copper and other resources, only, especially coltan, basically only found in... Yes. Right, exactly. These are, what do you think an iPhone's a thousand dollars or I mean, uh, however much it is, right? It should be at yeah. least 10,000 based on the actual value of the minerals used in the, in the phones. So we all participate in uh, the decimation of Congo. So if it was just him, yes, I would agree with the argument, but everyone does it. And we're also complicit in it. The simple Thank fact you. that we're, we're using <laughs> these phones, we are no better than uh, than a lot of people. I'm giving you an applause for that because <laughs> that was on point. That was on point because a lot of folks sit back and they like, hey, they're taking the resources. If you have one of these, <laughs> especially you're an app, you're a part of it. Then. You're a part of it. <clears throat> Period. Rakoya, my sister, you've heard Kazo and I, and I thank you, Kazo. That was that was that was the bomb, and that was all true. And you're getting the applause. The button finally came on. Rakoya, <laughs> <laughs> tell me what you all think. Right, sister. Um, we're talking right, about <laughs> greetings, greetings, <laughs> and greetings to my my brother who just spoke. Um, I think that yes. uh, everybody. Um, everybody more or less, I just, I got in not too long ago and I pretty much only heard two Niger, but I'm assuming that everybody sort of agrees that he's a strategic leader, someone who is a little bit Machiavellian in his, in his delivery, uh, because obviously there are those who hate him with a passion, but yes. Yes. everybody agrees that he has brought forth a country that was at war and at brink of destroying itself has brought it out and it's become almost like a model for post-war African countries and so on and so forth. I think he's also a Pan-Africanist because he's the only leader that I have heard beside, besides Ghana who has repeatedly said this. I'm not saying this because I'm Ghanaian, but it's a fact that has received a lot of Africans from different countries openly and said, at, at various times within Ghana's, um, Ghana's e evolution as a country has opened its arms to other diaspora Africans to come in. He has been the one who said, I don't care what you are by nationality, all those kids out there who are trying to flee Africa and are stuck in Libya. He says, if you want to come to Rwanda, come, we'll take you. And he is taking a great majority of them. So for that, two reasons i call him a a, a a a strategic and a good leader a little clinical in his approach ruthless sometimes Ooh. but that's what we need that's, that's what, what we, we need, need. Yes. And one more thing sister gina for me everybody knows i've never hidden it i am so anti-france in africa because yes. i think france is the most mischievous of all the colonies and the it's colonizing it's factors it's in, it's in africa Every African turned back again. Where's Jude? He's going to come after me. But every African progress that has been attempted to me, I see Francis underhand in trying to misdirect through its stronghold on its colonies to not give African countries a chance. And what he did, which is significant, first of all, he wrestled his country from the jaws of France. He is one, uh, Kagami turned the language of instruction from France to, uh, from French to English when he came into power. And in, in, a, in a few generations has turned that country from France's control through the Congo to an English speaking country. Now, are we going to say that the English, because we've become English speaking, we are better, Place. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that when you look at geopolitics and you look at the worst of taking the worst of two evils, which everybody is forced to make that choice at some point in time, he chose the evil that was less. And that is more likely to move his country in the direction based on colonial history. The, the proxy nature of how the English-speaking countries ruled their colonies made for good African leadership among the native people themselves because they were being ruled by proxy. While France 
had its long sticky fingers directly in these colonies, directly and continues to. So more kudos to that. I raise my hat to him for being a very strategic person. I think leadership requires people who can be a little cold-blooded and he is cold-blooded. And people who want to make him a hero without acknowledging the of the bodies and the bloods of people that he has had to step on may be a little naive. I do understand yes. that leaders have to do that sometimes. But all in all, we need a man like Kagami in, 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 in Rwanda and in other countries. So for that alone, I say he's a good leader so far. I love everything you said. I agree with everything you said because... Um... Yeah, I, I do agree. I believe he's brilliant, but ruthless. And I think we need that. That's what everybody else has. What do they think of the other leaders in other nations that are superpowers? Do you think they're just peaches and cream? Do you think they're just loving everybody? Well, take an example of Russia. Russia. L Russian leader. Is he, is he very nice? I think <laughs> the worldwide... Everybody's saying how ruthless he is. Well, if you can, if you can take Russia where he is, where he was, and where he is now, I think it's okay for the leader to be ruthless because I will, again, I will go back to our people. The way, the, the the way we every institution in in every African country work is wrong. We all work. We Africa. We have a, we have one way of thinking. We says the the goat always survive where he tied him. You see. As, as far as we have this mindset, that means everywhere you put anybody, there will be a corruption because that's the only way they can survive. They're not going to survive through their salary or their good work. They always think how they can cut a deal in this institution they are, whether it's a cleaning, whether it's a government work, whether it's a taxi driver, whether it's whoever you want to call it, they always find a deal. Why can't we do things right for, for the sake of our, our younger generation that are coming? Why can't we just try and do try and work and develop things in the right way as African, like like they're doing in, in uh, uh, Rwanda now. Look at all look at look at all the young young children now. They're all learning they all learning skills instead of just going to school. Like they're going to school, life. they're learning skills. They yeah, they, it's they're going they have free primary skills. education. Yeah. In in the in the West African education system is going to school and learn for so many years. After with all the degree, you come back and sit in the street in the Johnson and waiting for somebody to come from Europe and giving you ten ten dollar or five dollar with all the with all the degree you have. In 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 Rwanda today, your degree will worth something. So if African leaders, no matter how ruthless they are, no matter how corrupt they are, if they actually put work in, maybe this conversation will be different today. But they don't put work in and they they, they still they want to rule the country for the rest of their life. They will not develop anything on top of the people will rot it to poverty that that will will cause a lot of youth in Africa leave their country and flee to go through all these this horrible journey to get to Europe where they find that they are not even welcome there and they start struggling again worse than the struggle they were doing in Africa. We still not learn and I still the history is still repeating itself over 20 or 30 years till now we're still in the same position. How long are we going to live like this? Why can't we just accept the leaders with their hard working and stop complaining about how ruthless are? If you do right, I don't think the leader will come and be ruthless to you. If you if you live by the law, you know, live by the law, if you if you're employed, do the job right, I don't think you'll be you'll be in the bad side of the leader. You will not see the ruthless of the leader because you're doing things right. If you do it wrong, obviously you have to be ruthless to get your to put your in a straight narrow. Because if you do wrong, it's not one person is going to go wrong. Everything is going to go wrong for everybody behind. And this is the way yeah, we are at the moment. We cannot, we, cannot, we cannot afford to make any more mistakes. We have done enough more. mistakes from slavery to today. From independent, since we have independent to today, we are in the same place. Like may, I, may I say something? 80% of African countries, uh -huh. we are gone. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, I just wanted to respond to this, the, 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 the notion of being ruthless. You see, it's only naive people who get a little bit funny when you use the word ruthless. Because being a ruthless, uh, having a ruthless characteristic is not a negative thing at all. In fact, if you hear 
a lot of in, in terms of corporations and how successful corporations are, are run, sometimes it's actually seen as a positive attribute to say that a leader is ruthless because they don't they don't mess with the nonsense. They go straight to the heart of the issue. So I personally don't think it's a negative to, thing to call him ruthless. It just says how calculating he is as a man. And the same has been used. The same words have been used to for people like Mugabe or Afiwerki because I, I think one of the things that we all get caught up in is, is the language of, of the Western media. And the Western media is usually at, at mischief when they're using these words for our leaders because the, the, our, our populations who are not very exposed also buy into this. You'd see that the average, uh, the average, maybe not well uh, exposed Rwandan or other African would jump on the bandwagon as well and saying, well, well, you know, he's a ruthless leader as if he goes about killing people for no reason. They used the word for him as a ruthless person when he was actually in the war. This is a, a war, somebody who has been through war himself, leading his people. So he knows what the battlefield is. And at the time he was doing this, the French were arming the Interhamways from the, the, the and, and giving them coverage in, in Congo to come in and, and use these Hutus to attack Rwanda. So there is a certain element of right reporting for people to understand that it isn't as if the man just got up and say, let's go kill or let's do this. It is that these mischievous people try to undermine the progress of his country. And so I'm just using this um, platform to say that when we address him as being ruthless, it isn't in a right or wrong way. It's a description of a leader because leadership often re requires people to make tough decisions. And part of it is to use ruthlessness. So that I just wanted to clarify that. I agree 100%. And I love, love what, um, uh, what, how do you say this? Sutel Ban uh, 49. I hope I'm pronouncing it. <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm not. None, no one respects a pushover leader. A good leader leads with vision and, the, and those under him follow. If you are getting good results and see change and improvement, in the society, I see nothing wrong with that. Now, I have a comment as well to add. Yes. Um, yes. I think, yeah, I do like Kagami's uh, will to power and his uh, his mission. However, I do want to put it out there. We don't need leaders like Kagami when everything is now running smoothly. Leaders like Kagami are there to help you lift out of the veil when yeah. things are so troublesome but when things are now peaceful and uh what we need to be doing and tandem is this we we should be helping leaders like that because we need them we can't survive in tough times like now when africa is trying to get on its foot because then if you have leaders that are too democratic they're just going to get walked over what we need now is a nice transition so that when africa is now in a very stable uh flourishing way that we have now young leaders who can now operate with their whole democracy because that's what's happening to china now the, the young population there are now seeking for that democracy. So as long as we, we have a nice way whereby we can say to people like Kagami or make it very clear that, okay, uh, now Rwanda and, and this East Africa region is so successful, including Cong uh, Congo, we now need to get all these freedoms. We no longer need cur curfews. Uh, we need now to live as humans with the right dignity to the right extent. So as long as we keep those two ideas uh, together, I think it's going to actually help us so that we don't romanticize one side or the other. Democracy in a in a in a place where it's uh, too chaotic, it's not going to work. Obviously, we know this. And uh, rulership, where it's like a kingdom style, as, uh, as people call it, dictatorship, when people are just trying to enjoy their life in a very easy time, when there are no monsters anymore, right? That's not needed. Uh, dictators or strong rulers are needed when the times are hard. But when times are easy, you need, you obviously you need a council to always be thinking strategically, but the representative leader needs to kind of allow people to just be people at that point. So we have to keep those two ideas together so we don't get lost. I, I agree with that point. Um, we have a but, but if you look at uh, Africa today, you can regard actually the African continent as being at war. 
and especially that region where Kagame and that's Rwanda and Congo is there is a state of war continuously and there is mm -hmm. a danger that if you don't have a character like Kagame in position all the gains could be reversed quickly you see what I mean so I agree with the analysis that when situations are less strident you don't need a leader like that in place but Kagame is not like your typical general in the yeah. as, as a leader he also has the soft edge to his leadership yeah. hence yeah. why I for when you look at him right now is the ideal person to be there because if you remove him the, the, there's a danger that whoever comes in might not have the level of right. uh, grit and know-how to be able to sustain the, the advances that he has made so and because there are so many people around that region that are suffering reverses or not making enough progress so i would say let the region recover fully then you can now start talking about let's pull back a uh, real rule um this thing uh, uh, mugabe back and you see so uh, that, no sorry <laughs> kagame back we, we can roll kagame back but right now it's vital that he remains if he goes every day my, my heart will be in my mouth like i'll be wondering what, what could happen next is this leader capable of keeping the country on the right track would everything reverse again would they trust him as much because we don't want to second guess that aspect right now we are waiting for congo to recover if kagame and uh, rwanda is okay and so now we don't you don't have two people to worry about we have one sorted now let's focus on congo to fix congo because if you if he leaves then you, you, you take things for granted and he leaves then rwanda comes back into the ledger as a problematic uh, situation then you can see how that can be very very bad and if right. if if only to avoid that is only one man remaining in office i would say that's what is what the trouble us having um, Kagame in office, and he's not a terrible uh, leader in the first place. I've, I've seen the same thing in Ghana. R Rollins wasn't, he, he was a dictator. Or I wouldn't call him even a proper dictator. He was a benevolent dictator. He was doing the right thing by his people. Right. Wait, so, but why do people, okay, so just to clarify, I'm being optimistic. I, I'm talking about when everything is peaceful and flourishing in Africa. I'm not talking about anywhere close to right now. Um, uh, yeah, uh, but but in terms of dictator, I think that word has just been kind of used incorrectly. Yeah, dictator, around. <laughs> yeah, all it means is the person has the control. It's like a king, right? The the king of uh, Saudi Arabia, he's a king, but people don't call him a dictator. They call him a king. So a dictator and a king is the same thing. It's whoever has the most power in the region, and you know they I, have. I disagree with that because uh, a dictator. And a king will be totally different in this manner. A dictator is bit ruthless. A king is not gonna be like dictator. Dictator want to cling on to power. A king already have the power. You see the difference? Um, I, think, I think the two mm. traits are divided are separate. You can be a king and not be a dictator, yeah. but you can be a king and be a dictator. Exactly. Same thing um, goes with leadership too. You yeah. can be a leader and not be a dictator, and you can be a leader and be a dictator. There are two separate uh, these qualities of leadership. Yeah, and at times, be, yes, at times being a dictator is quite important, especially during times of war. You don't want to be negotiating, uh, you know, rules and stuff like that. You want to be as efficient as possible to prosecute whatever uh, conflict that is going on. But in terms of um, governance, uh, in that region, I agree with. Um, I think I thought he was referring to like now. And that's the um, case he was referring to now. So if he's referring to like when Africa is doing well, I agree with that 100%. The only, the only thing with that, with what you're saying and what Kazo said is I never feel like with everything that Africa has gone through, I don't think we're ever going to be in a place where we could say, okay, we can breathe unless we annihilate all other nations. Not from us. <laughs> Not I'm just saying. I'm just, until we get to a place where we can um, maybe put a shield where they can't come in at all. I mean, there's never going to be a place where we don't need a st strong. I feel like we're going to need and and like Tunai just said, Kazo, I I agree with you. It would, man, it, you're being very positive, and I would like to think that we would ever get to a place where we could have that, where we could just breathe. But um, <laughs> That's a long looking at to history, <laughs> I would like to keep. Go as many Kagamis around, and I'm sorry, I know some people are not, I find him, you know, have a lot of criti criticism for him, but I truly believe that we need uh, strong men. 
we need strong in the foreseeable, f- in the foreseeable future we will need them uh, for the next 20 years we need really really strong leaders that are going to help their nations recover because now there's a difference right. between Idi Amin and uh, <laughs> there's a difference yeah. between uh you know the kind that are hurting their people and not doing anything to benefit their people then you know I, I'm, not, I'm not, also, I'm not too sure about that India me one, you know. I'm not too, too sure about that India me one. I, the history of that guy has not settled yet because some of the things that he did, people at first thought it was crazy. Because remember, the Asians, a lot of the Asians were in this country when he asked them right. to leave. Those are radical things. When he did them, he felt these people were not um, helping the economy. They were not helping people. They were helping themselves and all mm-hmm. their wealth. They were hurting it among themselves that you know that was those are the kind of things um uh, everybody is talking about today when the chinese will come and take over the economy that is what the indians were doing then and he was one of the people that was bold enough to say enough of enough if people don't want to accept us we are not going to accept you you leave the army was a good leader they just twist the story now they, that's, they, they, that's, the, that's the thing okay so- so a lot of us don't don't really now. Other than the documentary that was put up, a lot of us don't really know what's going on, what really happened with. Let, let me I mean, explain. it's funny, and I like the fact that he got those people out. But at the same time, I feel like he, he did, wasn't he, as strategic he, as he needed to be. He wasn't he, as um. He is the only African president who defeated the English people in his land. That's why he got all these bad names because he defeated the one of the most strongest. Yes, one of the actually. most strongest part, uh, colonial part in Africa. That I was proud of. I was very proud not, of that. Not only, not only the Asian, he took out, he took out Scotland. He took them out. Yep. And how he called himself think, the king of Scotland. How do you think he dealt with his people? Do he you feel like... people. Okay, that time it was, uh, it was more like, you know, in Africa we have coup every time. What we used to call coup. Whoever, whoever had a lot of men take over. You, you have gone. Will take over from the office and they do whatever they like. In his time, when he took over from when he took over, he wanted to take the country to be standard like England was in that in that time. And but it was too much European and Asian influence in in the, in his country. So what he did, him and his country people, they all come together to get rid of everyone from the colonial from the colonial to the business people to every. People that British people bring there, he get them out of the country, and he give them a time. The people that don't want to leave, he 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 he, he, just, he give them a, like let's say about forty eight hours to leave the country. If you don't leave, you will go. They will deport you with one clothes, with one shirt, one one pound, one shoes. You will not leave with anything. The way you come to the country, that's the way you leave. So he was not a bad leader. When he comes to these people, there was a, there was a two things. They they had a rebel. They had a rebel group that was trying to throw him out. And he, in the soldiers as well in his army, there was a lot of there was a lot of people in there that want to coup him. So he was always in the edge. The he's power. a very he's a very brave leader, and some of the things that he did, I can tell you that many African leaders will shy away from doing it. Can you imagine expelling Indians in a, in a time when it's look at what Mugabe did, what Mugabe went through to even do that, and he wasn't even expelling the he was just taking the land the farms back. This one, he actually expelled them. From I the can't country. imagine you're not. You see, the way my mind thinks is, I don't even know what they're there for. I would do because, the same thing, but I, I think that there was because he was so, like um, Lamin just said, because he was so on the edge. I don't think he was able to focus in and on doing what he needed to do for his people. No. And another thing, I'm sorry. Now, one thing I want to say is that. Even though we hear all these things about Idi Amin, I also agree that he was one of the great leaders. I mean, history will write the right account on him. We don't have any real narratives of him mistreating his own people. There's, I mean, we have anecdotal stories where people, they made all kinds of wonderful stories about him killing people, eating human flesh. Yeah, well, I didn't hear about the human flesh thing, but I did hear about him. He did actually actually, actually mention that he he, he actually eat human flesh, but he didn't like it because it's too salty. He did say that in one of his documentaries. He did say it in an interview, but I didn't yeah. believe no, it. No, I mean, but it wasn't, it was, it was probably a satire response because they I were saying it was that, a the joke. Yeah. that human I flesh was, was refrigerated. I don't, 
the guy was just somebody they could not handle. And you exactly. must remember that his proximity of Uganda to Congo is very important. We should not forget that they also share border. This was clearly an attempt at coming through Uganda to go to the riches of, of the Congo. <laughs> And so everybody's hand is in the kitty, trying to destabilize people. One of the things he did, I think, was that the, the Europeans felt that he, he just didn't know his place. I mean, this guy expected to be carried on, on, on top of the head of Europeans, and they did it. He forced them to carry him on his head, just like we, you know, or they would have to kneel before him. And for them, this is really taking a stab at whiteism or what people like to call you know white supremacy, white supremacy he, yeah. he made a mockery of it you understand yep. so these people and that was in the 70s in the 70s exactly and and nobody can say and then of course they said he became a muslim he was getting close to saudi arabia and all that stuff they find a story to use to to remove you or they create a panic around you and say he's turning the country into a muslim country that way they can remove the population from you. This is classic CIA, Mossad, British M5 tactic. When they're coming after the great leaders of Africa, they first have to disconnect them from their people, their power base. They said the same thing about Nkrumah. Muhammad Gaddafi. Yeah. They said the same thing about Muhammad Gaddafi. Yes. Look at what they do. So we have to see the play game. When they start saying things about the person being a, a ruthless dictator and he's doing all these things, they turn, they're trying to turn the people away from him. Because listen, it's a, it's a game of chess, not cha-cha. They will make sure that the people begin to detest him first so that his power base, his strength, his spiritual power, whatever moral authority he has is dissipated then they come and remove him and so then they must, they must learn this, so when they come in and do their their worst um nobody it's, fights it's, back it's, it's, yeah it's justified yeah hmm. until africans start to write their own history until we start to write our own history people the people that are telling our history are they're not the people that like us they never like us and they will never like us and the tone of voice they used when they're writing our history, the voice they use, just read just read the articles of what, whatever history you read it. Look at the tone of voice they're using. I'm not just saying read A, B, C, D. Read the, read the voice they're using. It's like in England here. When, there's, when they're talking about the English people that leave England to go migrate to other countries, they call them expats. But when they're talking about other people that come from any other European country, come here to work, they call them immigrant. You see the migrant. difference? Yeah. Yeah, you can't imagine. Who has a question for us, guys? Are Africans afraid to lead the world? Yes, not at all. Why we should yes. be afraid? Well, why, aren't we, afraid. why aren't we? Why aren't we taking our position? Because if we, if, if, we meet, if, if, if we take over, we meet our masters. We put our head down, and our masters with us. Yes, sir. We never being afraid, afraid, and afraid and being able is different now, isn't it? If we are not. Afraid. Do you think we're not able to, Nigel? No, we, we don't have the kit. That's, we don't have the ability to do it at this moment because if we don't have the ability to do it, every nation wants to run the world. China wants to. Does they have the ability to do it? No. The only country that has the ability to control the world so far is the U.S. So with Africa is not in the position right now to start controlling the world. When we put all our, like, our, we are beginning to get our chips in place, but when we get it in place, there's no reason why we are not capable of running the world. That's the question. I, Niger, I think we're still going to be in the same place in the next 20 years, even though we, we kind of put things together. Until we, as a people, we see us together, that we are too powerful. Until we see that we don't see country, we don't see these borders, we will still be in the same place in the next 20, 30 years. We'll be so, but, the, but do you know that the, the African free trade area is on? Do you know that Africa is going to be carrying one passport in the next couple of years? They will start I using the, the passports. Well, well, West Africa have been doing that for ages now. We all been you, but Africa. we are talking about continent-wide now. Uh, okay, we'll see about that. I still, I still think that until we get rid of these border controls and all these things that we we're, that's going to stop. Even with this, this free trade, you know how many bridges is going to happen in every border you go? You have to bribe every police officer in every border to, to, to transfer your goods. This is the reality in the ground. Yeah, yeah. The thing you are missing is that you are assuming that um, and that bribery is the reason why Africa is not doing no, 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 no. That is not why. No, that's not the why. That's not why. 
I'm just and telling then, you how they, they're going to make it difficult. Even though we have the free trade, if you're going to enter to other countries, they will make it difficult. It's very difficult for African to travel to African country. It's more easy for African to co travel to Europe than the other African country because of the control. But you, all, you are talking about yesterday. We are talking about something that just started this year. You have not started seeing it at work yet. So you don't have any real evidence for what you are saying. No, you are just, talking I mean, about a system that has been changed. It's not evidence. It's just the fact, the way we, we, we operate as people. The way we operate our borders, the way we don't welcome each other in our borders, the way even if I go with a white man today in any border of any of any African country, right? He he will be checked easy to get in, and I will be I will, I will probably scream more than three times than he will be do. It's the way we it's the way uh, we do things. I don't I don't know about that no. because Nigerians can drive from Nigeria to Ghana because of the ECOWAS system. Say vice versa, you can drive all the way from Nigeria to to Gambia if you wanted to exactly. because of ECOWAS. Yes. So we can cross borders like that. The you same thing if that the same is happening in Africa, you will still be able to do that. That's not all the problem. Like they still don't listen. The problem is the people that are in control of these borders. Uh, they don't see you as African. They see you as Nigerian. Now, I get what Damon is saying. Okay, we've the free trade center is on and popping, but will the mindset be ready for it? Are our people ready exactly. to actually, you know, yeah. not do it without corruption? That's the thing. <laughs> I, I, I think they will be able to do it because the way these things work is that it's, I think what he's talking about is let's say if Nigeria wants to travel to Cameroon or other countries that are not in ECOWAS, you get that problem. If you want to go to South Africa, you get a big problem. If you want to go to maybe Niger, other countries that are not part of uh, ECOWAS, you have that kind of problem, that division in terms of borders and i must say there's a slight sort of division between uh, nigeria and Benin republic that is next door because they speak french and you see so but what this african free trade area does is that it pulls down some of the barriers that existed because of the ties of various nations to their colonizers so if, when those um, barriers are pulled down you will start finding that uh, they will start interacting uh, more and uh, in a better way. They obviously, you're still going to get some craziness at the borders. Then, yeah, Africans, that comes with the territory these days. But it's not going to be as significant because people will still get on with their lives and get their business done. As long as it's implemented, I think it will be a success. And remember, success begets success. When they start building on what they've got, Africans who start, their mindsets will start changing. It's a, it's a weird thing because I think to be an African leader now or even lead the black community, you have to be a leader that don't care about compliments or acknowledgements or about anything. Because exactly. this is what the African leaders have done. They don't care about what we say about them. They just went mm -hmm. about getting the, the stuff done. I agree with you. Um, um, the, the comment from the comment section says, when blacks are in the West, they are treated as one. They see your skin first, so then bring the psychology home to Africa. Bring the that psychology home to Africa. Yes, be one. Look what, okay, one key factor. One key. One, I'm sorry, Lamin. One, I didn't hear you. One moment. One key factor with with the uh, Kagami success in Rwanda was the fact that he took away tribalism. Yeah, you can't go around saying I'm Tutsi. You, I'm, I'm, you know, you are. Rwandian. Yeah, he did that. Is that possible? Uh, and Nigeria is that even possible that. in certain countries <laughs> like mm. Nigeria. Nigeria has rejected that. They were like, let's pass hate speech law. What hate speech law? Uh, you want to use it to attack us. You see how Nigerians are cynical with everything. They completely rejected it flat out because they don't trust anybody. Gina, yeah, I, I think that um, removing tribalism, people do say that he has removed that officially. But for me, I think in reality, though, has he? Because tribalism, I think, in terms of identity in Africa, is something that rather than, for me anyway, rather than try to minimize it, it's supposed to be creating this consensus where the tribalism no longer is important for your advancement. So people maintain an identity, but it is no longer important. Because what I fear when people talk about um, him removing tribalism, quote unquote, I, I, I sense an undertone of pressure being, you know, something not being talked about openly and actually going into the being hidden 
and being ready to explode again if somebody mischievous re, 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 you know revives it because it's so easy for you to say this person did this to me because of this and that and then most africans jump on it i i honestly feel like it has to be something that is always put on the table but that it becomes powerless so it only an identity in terms of this is my language it is this is what i speak this is what i eat but then so what this is that person's you see I see. I, I agree. With you. I agree with you, and I think that what he did was, and I maybe you said it incorrectly. He replaced tribalism with nationalism. Yeah. Um, now, I, can, I, that, I, can that can that is that something that can be done in other places or duplicated? No, I, I, I don't think so. I think it has been done. The reason why I say that is because there is some element of truth to what Rokoya said. But if you look at nations that uh, dwell on tribalism, racism, race, and all the rest of it. They spend a lot of energy dealing with that. But if you look at China, China went the other route and said, hey, nobody, I don't care whether you're Muslim. If you're Muslim, you have to toe the line. Everybody has to toe the line. Yeah. And that allowed them to match for what the way they're matching. Look at India. India is focusing on so many different, different divisions. And that's why their country is always dealing with all these issues. And mm -hmm. because tribalism will always be there to an extent. What, what he has done is removed it from the level of conversation that it always is on the national stage and it removes that divisive aspect of it but and that, that thing, there's some element that, of positive uh this thing on that one yeah, yeah. that yeah, was ingenious. i agree, that, I agree. Is, that is i like that that was ingenious and and i, yeah, I mean that, it's very important that it's done right because you know like in ghana for example we 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 do have tribal identity but the, it's very very minimal because i'll tell you what kwame Nkrumah did Right after independence, Kwame Nkrumah had a deliberate policy of di distributing children from their their home regions to other regions. So basically, if I was a Southern Ghanaian and I was ready to go into the secondary school, the, the, the incentive was for my father or my mother to send me up north where I get to integrate in a, in a different language speaking region. And participate in their customs and things so what that is doing actually is that tribe is no longer it's slowly dying because it's not because people are not identifying but it's because i am this tribe but i know your tribe too your tribe is not different from mine i i don't have any um suspicions about your tribe because i have been exposed to it this person from that tribe has come down over so that is what existing and, and a lot of people will tell you that even i'm sure two niger would say in ghana the conversations about tribe is only as far as the marker this is who i am but people the foods have crossed over people and are living and speaking the language of other people so there it's actually unifying the country that in everybody's identity you see no threat from the other person because you know them now. They're not strangers to you, which we didn't have before. And that made it easy for Europeans to divide. So now, I think you, something, you said something really key, Rakoya. So in Ghana, it unifies. How? How are they doing that? How? Because are people are made. Yeah, because they integrated people. It's a it's an educational policy that was started in the beginning of the country. So hmm. that the, the educational policy is for you to send your child, and the government subsidized this very heavily through the, the scholarship programs. So you will find children of that time being every person takes pride in sending their child away from their home region. So if you were Ashanti speaking, you went to a, a place for five years where it was North Nurse. So what does that mean? You as an impressionable child, you are dealing with people, learning their language, learning their food, learning their culture. When you grow up, you have formed an opinion about the people that is non-threatening because you have lived with them as a child when you had no inbuilt resistance to them. And this has carried over to create that identity by default. And it's because you're not attacking it. You're just 
I mean, that was very brilliant about Kwame Nkrumah. He did, he did this with other countries who also started, where you actually are creating the identity from a place of knowledge rather than don't just talk about it. Because if you don't talk about it and we are, but we have inbuilt suspicions, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, ignore it. Yeah, you, you yes, can't ignore that's, it. it. Because that was how easy it happened in, in, in Rwanda when the, the plane went down for the Hutu president. And the next minute, neighbors who had sat down and eaten before became enemies. Right, but that's then. That's how easy, you see. Right, but then I there's mean, always. I, the that's just my opinion based on my reading that I almost feel like. We should talk about it, but it has to be in a way where it, it's naturally no longer important because you're talking about somebody that you've you've broken bread with for the last five years or ten years or whatever, you know. But again, this is just a conversation. I'm not saying this or that. I just talk about it because I see the possibility. It's a good thing, but how long and unsustainable is this really? That's just and my the my thing. And if people aren't Okay, so the conversations that are being had around tribalism right now, or when we talk about tribalism, right? When we talk about the specifics, the the the, the culture with tribalism, or the conversations that are had in the homes or in the villages or in the communities regarding other tribes, that's the problem. To to be proud of culture, to be proud proud of uh, your tribe and to, to speak on the things that are wonderful and, and strengthening, that's not a problem. But to you to to look at other people and then talk about those things and and do and um what do you call um make them this humane based on certain things that you know usually is a false truth um the false truth that we tell about each other when we're putting each other down that that's when tribalism becomes a problem but the thing that makes tribalism so attractive is the idea of being better than somebody another group. And we have to be honest about that. And that's I mean, true. I, I'm sorry, let, let, let me just add this. I think why I think this will last is because in Rwanda, is because, and it's a great achievement for uh, Kagame, is because of the positive stimuli that comes from it. What Rwandans associate to this period of uh, basically uh, nullifying uh, tribalism is the positive development they've had and uh, the positive uh, headway they've made in so many aspects of their lives. So when you have, we tie things to experiences that we have. And I believe that because they've had good experience from this period when they don't focus too much on tribalism, they will embrace it, they will remember it. If they try to go back to the way they were before, it won't be long before they come back to this again. Because that's how human beings behave. When the, the problem we have with tribalism is that when we do it, it takes so much energy from the focus to of of bigger issues. Because we forget that whether you are Hausa, Igbo, um, Hutu, or Tutsi, it doesn't even matter. Does that matter on whether your nation generates enough resources for itself to sustain itself? for the whole uh, population, it doesn't matter. This is why that idea was a good one. Because you have to put it in context of where it truly belongs it's not paramount to the national interest the talk of tribalism is not paramount hence why it has worked so far and i i think it's going to endure because of that positive experience they've had with it if there have been they had very negative experience with it whereby they nullify their tribal ties and then the nation goes to hell <laughs> next the next day the next time you tell them to give up their tribal ties they will never allow that they will want it to be at the top of the this in the, the agenda but because they've had positive experience from it they will not go back same thing happened with the chinese when the chinese did something like that why do you think the people are not rebelling every day on the streets because they see positive outcome outcomes is what people care about so let's let's do this i want to i want to I want to say this in reference to Louise's uh, question, are our Rwandans happy? That's a good question because what we're getting down to is the nitty gritty of it. Yes, K Kagami has done a wonderful job as far as um, I believe providing the Rwandians um, within the 20 years or 20 something years that he's been in office with a lot more than they he, they had. He he came in and, uh, and, and made the place uh, better. Like I always say, when you come in a room, when you before you leave a room or when you come in a room, make it a lot better than when you left, when you came in. And I think he did that. But that being said, are the Rwandians happy? 
are you know do do when you I don't know any Rwandans, but the few I, I um, know, I go ahead. Few, I know a few Rwandans and and I know they speak highly about their country and they're very I know because I live in Manchester. I've seen Rwandans coming here for holiday, which I've never seen before, from 2017 till now. We every year we have like uh about, you know like a school that they come here to. And I spoke to a couple of Rwandans in the past. They they always advise us to visit their country. And I asked them, I asked one of them one time, long time ago, about you know about people, how they after the after the tribal war, how they live together. He said, huh? listen, brother, we are all one brother in Rwanda. We think Let me ask we, you guys we, something. That's a good question. I mean, you just said something that made me think. Um, a lot of folks have the opinion that okay, there's gotta be some some held in frustration. Like this comment that Louise said, YouTuber, go black to Africa. Shout out, my brother. Notice that the Rwandans um, seem cautious or stressed while in public. Example, Mrs. Go Black to Africa, shout out sis, said that she rarely uh, saw people smiling in public. I could tell you, I'm from Haiti, and um, I rarely see people smiling in public in Haiti, too. It's I mean, I, 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 I go to Senegal. <laughs> I, I, I hardly see people smile in the street. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and Senegal is next door to Gambia, and Gambia is called Smiling Coast. But I go to Senegal, and I always say that they are miserable people in Senegal. But I don't know because it's French, because they, they, they have French side. That's why they're miserable. But I don't see much in Gambia. You go, everybody's laughing, everybody's smiling. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you go to Senegal, just next door, they're all very stressed, very, very Pro serious. Probably they the French life thing. Really, really serious. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's French culture. They, they don't tend to be like. Pro, pro, uh, pro happiness they just tend to be quite annoyed at everything yeah so if you think about it the one that was a friend before it comes to english so yeah i can get that i i understand exactly that point <laughs> they're not gonna be all yeah smiley, are they? and it's funny yeah, actually, you know, haitians were were uh yeah enslaved by the french and when i when you said that i said wait a minute they don't smoke. but <laughs> that's because you man i i can tell you this i don't think the rwandans are I don't know. When I look at Rwanda and I see how beautiful and I see how how much has how great it's become, I can't imagine them not being happy. But if they're feeling like they can't, I mean, you could have everything, and then somebody say you can't have this one thing, and it could and it could make you not appreciate nothing that you've gained. Do you think maybe if there is some control factor going on, or uh, this thing where they say he watches everything, he listens to. He, he does not allow for speech. That, that, those that, things. That's his political opinions. That's the the, the opponent. The, the people that are against him, you know, when it comes to politics, they're the one you see in the internet saying no, no, every every nasty thing about him. But the actually Rwandan people that are benefiting from the system are not complaining because if they are complaining, you will see them in the internet right now as we speaking. You will see them complaining everywhere, like Gambia, like every, like Gambia, Nigeria, Senegal, Ghana. You see us everywhere in the internet. Have you seen anyone that's anywhere in the internet complaining about development in their country? No, because if the Ghanaian or Ghana or Gambia or Nigeria, the, our president do the same development, I don't think you will see our people make, even though we are, if we are not happy, we're not going to be complaining. Because now, if people are not complaining, then they are happy. Now, do you think that a, a group of people, like a whole country of people could be reserved? Because uh, I like what this comment. Um, uh, I also think R R Rwandese, uh, I, I never say that right, are reserved. It's a cultural temperament as well. Maybe. Do you think that's it? That's I mean, do different regions have different temperaments like that? I mean, they are very reserved. From all the videos yeah. that I've seen, even the people in the villages, they and they dance differently. You know how in some parts of West Africa, you know, it's a lot of booty shaking and a lot of drumming and... <laughs> You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. Us, us, <laughs> us, Jalof people. Yes, we're all dancing and singing and clapping. Once do we get robbed on in front of everyone? Yes. So, well, in, in, in Rwanda, <laughs> my clap is late, y'all. <laughs> in Rwanda, they kind of move differently. I mean, it's like they're a whole different being. I mean, even if you go to Nairobi, you're not going to see a lot of people smiling in the streets. So that's the okay. thing. Is it the air? Is it the air? <laughs> I, I think this may be tied to an element of um, civilization and contentment. And um, I, I'm not so sure why that is the case, because you would think when you are 
more civilized and content they tend to be more smiley because what i find in europe mm -hmm. is that you tend to find that people seem to be miserable here too and i always say to them and they don't deny it they say they, they feel miserable please what do you mean by civilization uh i just need you to be clear about civilization yes, what are yeah, you trying to say mean. Let, 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 me, let me say something. Yeah, I think that's an interesting uh, this question because I think. Yeah, I just want to understand you fully, please. Yeah, yeah. When Wodemaya went there and he was asking them, I don't know whether one other Nigerian was there, and they were describing how they perceive Nigerians. They perceive Nigerians have, have been, or West Africans have been very, very fast. We move yeah. very, very quickly. We, we talk louder and all the rest. But yeah. they, much more yeah. expressive. That's I, didn't want, yeah. I didn't want to make it sound like that to Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No. Uh, yeah. So is that what? No, that's that not true. Civilization. No. Are more loud than any other See, African. my my take from that seems to come from because I think there are it's established that when you are in a more desperate situation, you tend to be more agitated and you tend to move faster than somebody that is more content I what you tend to find here, like in what from my own experience here in the UK, what you find is that the poorer you are, you tend to be you, you, the way you approach things yeah. seems to be more spontaneous and all the rest. While the others will just take their time, they will they will make a plan and they will go and do. Everything is based on time. Everything is more regulated, and they seem to be calm all the time. I, I think mm. that that comes across as being uh, miserable. And actually, many of them are actually miserable. I, I say that I say to them all the time that like, why do people look miserable? You have everything, and yet you just look happy. You see, so I don't. I, I think there's an element of that that is tied to how well your country is doing. Like, if I believe if Nigeria starts doing well, Nigerians may not be as aggressive as they are right now. Okay, compare Nigerians to Ghanaians, you find that Ghanaians are more docile because the environment. I, mean, I, I have some problem with the words you're using. Civilization <laughs> and docile. And... <laughs> no, no, yeah. I see, see, I may be using, I may be throwing words around, but there is an element of truth there, don't you agree? <laughs> I don't know, my brother. Maybe today is not my day. I'm, I I wish you could use better words, but that's okay. No, I mean, it's okay. Maybe it's for lack of words. But do you agree that Ghanaians and Nigerians are different in their approach to things in terms of their aggressiveness? Yes. Well, I would say this. I would rather use the word cultural than than you know because I I I mean even in Ghana, the between the various uh various tribes and i'm from different my father he speaks a different language than my mother so they're different we could call them different nations my my father's people are a little bit more reserved they're the ever speaking they're the ones who would give you the wisdom and all that and my mother's people are more like the you know hey i'm gonna beat you up hey, hey, loud and all that it is cultural it just has nothing to do with well, okay. being those but you do know yeah. what i mean when i said the whole thing about Rwanda is like, okay, me a diaspora looking in. When I look in Africa, if I go to different countries, you see a lot of, uh, like, like, like Tunai just said, they're more boisterous in, in certain places. They're, yeah. when they dance, yeah, the I think it's more cultural you know, than, than yeah, level of, yeah. you know, it's what the people value and, you know, it, it's expressed no, in their provinces. It's not just yeah. values, it's their yeah, it's more, because if you go, when I go to Ethiopia or uh, Tanzania, it's very different from Kenya. Tanzanians and Ethiopians are so much slower to life. Like every time I go to Ethiopia, you, you go to this place and they just relax. No one is in a hurry to do anything, right? Same thing with Tanzania. Uh, but in Kenya, it's like, especially Nairobi, it's a lot more similar to uh, like, yeah, yeah it's, it's a lot just, more fast. I think it's cultural. It's just what's happening at the time. It has, I personally see it as the, you know, how people have settled in an area. And even West Africa, when you go to Nigeria, the, the Yoruba, agitate a little bit better, uh, uh, louder than the Igbo. Igbo acts a little bit different than the Northerners. So, but they're still in the same geographical space and stuff. We're going but to say what, they're all, you know what, what I'm saying? What you're failing to mention is that culture comes from experience too. A culture doesn't just emerge because God gave it from heaven. <laughs> it comes from your direct experience with your environment. If your environment is hostile, you are more likely to be hostile. Okay, let me give you another example. Now, the, Vikings, <laughs> the Vikings came from a very, very aggressive culture, but today they are some of the most docile people. Why? Because they've experienced peace for such a long period of time, and they are doing well for it. 
Tina, yeah. do you equate civil, uh, being more civilized to be calmer and more less civilized to oh, no. be more See, aggressive? If I use civilization, I think that I think I'm not. Uh, that's is not a very very well chosen term. So okay, I, 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 I would I, drop I, it that one. because I was struggling with that. Yeah. I, I, the, what I probably meant to say was depending on how well you whether when well, when your needs are being met regularly you don't have any need to act strident all the time why would you be rushing to anywhere when you don't well, have you anything think, to rush do you think um do you think it has something to do with that because i i was looking at some older documentaries about rwanda and they always seem like to be very temper you know very low you know very quiet very reserved people they've always seemed to be that way and I'm looking at things prior to, um, you know, the, the the genocide that happened. So it's just their, their their whole personality temperament is a little bit less, more chill, more. Well, I mean, uh, I think for sure. example, in, for example, in Rwanda, there's only three main tribes in that country, and uh, the Hutus and the Tutsis lived in peace for thousands of, well, at least a, a couple thousand years. Hmm. And what happened, I guess, is the they weren't really fighting each other. So in places like Nigeria, where you have the Yorubas and Igbos and all the houses, there's so many warring tribes. That means that the environment is obviously going to be hostile. Same thing yeah. with Kenya, where you had a lot of the Nilotic tribes, like uh, the Maasai's who believe that every cow is theirs, fighting a lot of the other Bantu tribes. So there was that hostility. But in Rwanda, there, were, there was actually no hostility for, yeah. Yeah. for for that period of time. The hostility only really came when the French started telling the Hutus, it's like, well, these guys are being richer than you, which is true. They, the Tutsis were richer for longer, but there was no actual hostility. And then they kind of created that hostility uh, in the last whatever years. So I think, yeah, the environment matters. Like, And the same thing with uh, Tanzania. Uh, most of the tribes there were not warring each other. So it makes sense that they were a lot more kind of nice, kind of. They don't have to think about it. Like uh, safety is not the biggest issue. They don't have to be like so aggressive in your face. Uh, yeah, so places like Rwanda, Tanzania would have just kind of maintained uh, less in your face, obvious kind of uh, expression. Hmm. It's funny because um, <clears throat> the when I was when I think about Kagami and I think about the way he speaks and the way he moves, for him to have accomplished when we talk about strong men, he just seems like this really docile type of you know whatever. But um, and and it says a lot about the people the people and what was done. I mean, we don't like to talk about the genocide, but when you think about the genocide, the fact that that, that even happened in a hundred days, all those yeah. people, it just, it just says a lot about, you know, reserved people. <laughs> but look, look where they come from. Look where they were and where they are today. Yeah, no matter how they are, I think they're hard working people. You have to give them credit for that. Man, today, I, all African I, countries will look for look look from them. Amazing people. Very amazing. amazing. I, I think what Africa, as an example, when you say Africa today, the one day is the only place you can look and say, Yes, Africa. Every other country is, is rooted with, with corruption. And yes. very, very, very angry people living in every single country you go. <laughs> okay, because okay, that's poverty. going too far. The second very, part, very, right. very, very angry people. <laughs> <laughs> I think the first time is true, but the second part, come on. <laughs> but the rest of it, I'm not angry, I'm happy, so. Well, maybe, maybe yeah, you say you're talking like that, maybe you're traveling the world, you're very happy. But then your elders are there, they're very angry. If you talk, go there now, you talk to them, they talk, they talk they're, they're going to blame all the prejudice that passed there. And themselves, they have a land in there. They haven't even gone there to do the proper job in the land. But they're there telling us the president didn't do for nothing for me. The country have done nothing for me. What have you done for the country? No, no African done nothing for their country. We all here complaining, but what have you done for our country? Yes, we always think what the country can do for us. But what have you done as as, as a children of Africa? What have you done for Africa? I agree um, with statement that the commenter said i think rwandis have reserved surface but tend to be emotional below the surface and it's funny because rwanda don't have um oceans do they they have lakes you know how they say still water runs deep <laughs> yeah they're pretty deep people. yeah and yeah. also I, what i was thinking there is um you know when someone is kind of working in a more um advanced technologically environment they're not going to have time to smile. When you're smiling, it means you don't have too much worries to think about. So when they're thinking about what 
jobs that they have to do, especially if you go Kagali, where it's really, really metropolitan at this point. You got uh, you got essays, you got work portfolios, you have uh, indexes that your boss wants you to do. So you don't have time to smile in the street. You'll think you're basically like a London person, too busy, too focused. Your mind is somewhere else. It's not in the moment. So you can't enjoy life in the moment. And we can understand that in the diaspora because in the hood, hmm. people don't go around walk smiling. Exactly right. <laughs> yeah, you mean exactly. like everybody all day. Yep. But when you go into uh, any other place like Silicon Valley or just anywhere else, <laughs> right? I think they just have to uh, more more to do because Kigali, uh, Kigali is quite advanced now, so they just don't have time to to enjoy life in the moment. They're thinking about work, and they're just a very serious people. I mean. I, I truly believe that they are just very focused people. And maybe this is the type of leadership that they require. Otherwise, they would, it would not be so stable. Maybe that's the thing, too. We're looking at, when we think about temperament, can, can, can Kagami do what he's doing here, let's say, in Nigeria? Mm. Uh, let him come and try now. I think I'm gonna try. After they give him this thing, he will be packing his load. I'm going. I'm not. I'm not this is too much. It's too much. I, I'm not. Ma, I, I ma, can't take this anymore. Nigeria, <laughs> Nigeria, Nigeria is the giant of Africa. I don't think can, Nigeria cannot be moved that very easy. Nigeria need. Nigeria need. Uh, need community work. Like everybody, every single Nigerian has to be part of that work. Just a leader cannot change Nigeria. I think they are far more prophet than only leader. If you, look, if you listen to Nigerians talking themselves, you will understand what I'm saying. The leader is not a problem. In, I think the leadership is a problem, but the people themselves, they, they, don't, they, don't wanna, they don't want to look Nigeria as Nigeria. They want to go separate, and that's a big problem because it helps the leader to be corrupt as much as he wants to corrupt because the people themselves, they're not coming together to take the country. They just want to go apart like this part, this northwest east. It's not even about tribe in Nigeria. I think it's about what state you come from. And every state wants to be a country. This if is... anybody on here is from Rwanda, if you're in the comment section, please come on. Let us, tell us what you tell us what you think about the leadership. Tell us, um, you know how you really feel about being a Rwandanese right now, and you know under uh, you know the leader uh, Kagame, um, Paul Kagame. Yeah, I think that's uh, um amazing. Um, so if somebody is on here and you're Rwandan. Rwandanese, please come up here and let us know. As far as I'm concerned, I think he's doing a magnificent job for the country. Um, I truly hope that when he, like somebody else has mentioned on the panel, when he transitions uh, and, and, you know, and not be uh, the leader of Rwanda, I hope that they can fill his shoes. I truly believe he's preparing um, the next person to do so, though. I truly believe that's why he's got everything set up the way he do. I think yeah. he's on that, yeah. Tonight, uh, is are you uh, the next president of Rwanda? No, no. no, no. How is that possible? I'm, I'm talking about. Um, does he does he have a vice president? Is he female or I don't know? Um, Kagame, does he? I know Kagame. half of his uh, people are female, half male, but I'm not sure what the vice president is. Huh. Interesting. Uh, somebody Google it. Somebody Google it. Yeah. I think that it is female, half is male. Amina, my sister, welcome to the conversation. I'm so happy uh, to see you here today. Uh, we're talking about m one of my favorite leaders on the continent, Paul Kagame. Um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. What would you like to say about this man? You know, I didn't. Good evening, everybody. I, good evening. I didn't. I didn't know you were discussing. Um, his Excellency today. But yes. just, just so on, ironically, I was watching um, a, um, a discussion he had with Mo Ibrahim today. And um, I was also watching um, a speech that Pielo Lumumba was giving about the leaders. And he included uh, His Excellency in his, um, in his speech. Uh, first, I, I think, his Excellency is doing an awesome job from where I can tell and from the discussions and the interviews that he's had with journalists, international journalists. And I think he has um, a love for his people. And I think it's being demonstrated, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt. And unfortunately, he's also um, 
he's he's probably still you know I, I think he knows that ultimately he's going to you know step down and let the next generation um do what they need to do take right. Rwanda to the next you know to the next phase of their uh, growth and development um i don't think he is like or i hope he isn't like most african former african presidents where they want to live and die in the seat um you know um mr uh, Pro professor lumumba had made a statement today and it gave me something to think about mm -hmm. and he said it's better to go out when all everything is good whether yeah. regardless if everything is going good, everything is swell, it's a good thing to do that. And whether the people want you to stay or not, he says sometimes when the people want you to stay, that it's should be your time to leave. Yeah, yeah, that should be your swan song, you know, because you have to let the next generation um, step in, you know. And you know, someone, a young lady from South Africa, uh, posed a question to him as well about, you know, his um his succession and and what he plans to, on doing with that um I, a lot of people are watching rwanda um a lot of people are watching Rwanda. do you think and, that maybe he's grooming his daughter maybe to, to replace him do, a I, lot of I, saying this I, might be I mentioned that to you before oh I you did <laughs> yeah yeah I, I wouldn't be surprised i wouldn't be surprised um uh, she's part of the the next generation. Um, if she if she has an interest in in you know stepping in the role, but there are a lot of um, women that could take the seat, not just his daughter or his wife. I, I think there are women in his cabinet who are even more qualified and has the um, experience, you know, um, and you know, who could really take the reins, I think. And so I I care for him. I really do. And I really wish the best for him, um, whether he stays in or chooses to, you know, th do his swan song. But I, I think he's, he's forthright. I believe he's honest. I don't think he has a, um, a desire to become you know, wealthy and stash the money in Swiss bank accounts. He doesn't appear to be that kind of man. I just think he's honorable and he wants the best for his people. Um, I, I personally, as the history has shown, France and Germany um, uh, instigated the genocide. Yes. And so he's still tangling with them too. You know, we can't forget about the people who are there, they're like vultures, you know, they, they, they still have an impact on Rwandan um, government, um, as do most of the European powers do. Um, unfortunately, um, France does the most um, as being a Francophile uh, colonizer, but, you know, I, I hope he, I hope he is grooming the next the next generation right now so that he can go out with confidence and saying, you know, now is the time for the young people to take Rwanda forward. Well, I'm hoping that um, he could definitely, somebody mentioned about, um, you know, needing a driven, uh, uh, result driven successor. And I truly believe that it would be a sad thing to see someone come in and break down everything that this man has built. It would be a very sad thing to see um, it all go away because of the wrong sector. Yeah. I want to welcome confidence to the, the company. Is, <clears throat> go ahead. The funny thing is Africans will always destroy it. Whoever is coming, uh, it's not going to be safe. He doesn't seem to have a vice president too. Well, I'm about to abolish the position of a vice president. And what I will hope is that we start a clear line of succession if anything happens to him. Because if there's no clear line of succession, that could lead to problems after he leaves office. This is one of the biggest bains of uh, a If you don't have a clear line of succession. And that's the thing, too. A lot of people talk about the fact that he's been in power. And when people bring up an interview um, 
I don't know who that is. Could you mute your... Everybody mute themselves. Let's see what that is. Okay. When people talk about the fact that he's been in power for so long and then they say that maybe it would be a good thing if he was... Um, maybe he's not trying to get out. It's a new person. Confidence. Confidence. Yeah, confidence. That's you. Okay, yes, please. I'm sorry. Could you please... Um, your mic is doing something, so you might want to... Yeah. They talk about the fact that he may not want to step down. When you think about everything that he's accomplished, <laughs> I, I, I actually think he's afraid to step down and have it all de demolished and destroyed. When I said that earlier, I was thinking, but then I was like, oh my God, what is he thinking? I mean, he was, he was a chief commander, uh, you know, a part of the, you know, fought, you know, since the genocide. And now, to have take, taken the country this far in 20 years, um, yeah. I, I, I think maybe he might feel like, I don't want to let go because I, I don't think anybody's ready. Oh. That's okay. where he's going to go wrong. You think that's a wrong thing that he's um, sticking around well, until like, he feel like he has the right person? Yeah. I mean, if you're a good leader and you've done a good job, I think it's fair for you to leave that job to, for somebody else to continue your, your legacy. If not, if you stay too long, you'll end up abusing power and then people will start talk. Your, your good job that you've done will start fade away. I think as a president, he's done a really, really good job, but it's time for him to, re, to, to train somebody. Not, not, not everybody's going to be like him, but to train somebody to have the same kind of moral to run Rwanda the way it is. I think it's just perfect the way it is. They don't need more changing. They probably need a little bit improvement in some sizes, maybe more security-wise because of everybody keep their eyes on it and everybody's blaming them for, for their development of uh, and, um, whatever's going to Congo. So they need strong security and they, they need a strong relationship between, you know, to, to, to form their relationship between Congo and Rwanda. I think that's all matters. But for him to be in power for so long, it's going to cause more division in the country and he's, he's not, he's, the respect he have now, in the next 10 years, you're not going to think the same. Because that happened to Mohamed Gaddafi. Same thing happened to Mohamed Gaddafi. He was one of the best leaders, but he sort of stepped down a long time ago. But he wouldn't, because he knows that if he leaves, whoever's come, it might be corrupt. And if you, so, if you think that you are the only man in the country can run a country, and if you leave, no one else can do it, you're going, you're going wrong then. Yeah. That's yeah. true. I think that's true as well. I, I think that he has to trust the people to decide. He can't pick the next president. He's got to be able to let go, even though he's yeah, put in have to, work. <laughs> he's right, you have to trust work. the people. I mean, you have like to trust work. the people. You have to trust the people to, to be able to see exactly what they saw in him. And to, and, and, and to not do that is saying that you don't think that the people, the people, the Rwandan people are, are, um, are, are smart enough, which I don't think I don't think he thinks that. But I, I think I, I think he has to trust the will of the people, and he has to trust that they're you know just like they saw in him and trusted him to move the country forward. He's going to have to do the same. He can even put a not just about moving the country forward. He has he he does something that a lot of leaders don't know how to do on and off continent, which is. He knows how to play chess with these Europeans. Yes, but that took time. Like he sat on many government, you know, like seats. You know, he he sat on the international stage in the UN. So his his experience, you know, speaks for itself. You know, he, I mean, he even said in, during his interview with Mo Ibrahim that before he took the position of president of Rwanda. Mm -hmm. Prior to, he didn't believe that he was qualified to do it. So right. he waited. Mm -hmm. He waited for a time where he believed that he was ready because many people wanted him to become president. But he didn't feel as though he was appropriately ready. Right. And, but when he came to the point where he sat, where he sat, he sat in the UN, he sat in the government, um, you know, positions where he sat, he said, okay, now I'm, I'm ready. So he but, basically... You know, he he man, this man has got some focus because that's that takes a lot to be offered the position, but being you know in in 
you know, being able to say, hey, I'm not ready. I say humility. I think he has humility. Yes. In my, in my humble That's the best opinion. Word for it. Yes, sis. I, I agree. Yeah. Thank you. How do you replace a man like that? You, well, what, you're gonna have you to. to what he need to do? What he need to do as a person, as as a president, he need to train his people to be just like him. I mean, they're not gonna be just like him, but he need to train them, and he need to he need to trust his people and hand over power to them peaceful way, and maybe work in the maybe work as an advisor. But he cannot be a leader forever. Eventually, people will turn to him, and every good work he did will go zero. People don't African people don't care about these nice buildings. When they when they had enough of him, they will start burning that building. They will start oh. <laughs> destroying everything he built. Hmm. Well, what did, did... I, I think there's some truth to what you are saying. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I like you said, I think the critical aspect is that he needs to train successors. Trust them enough that the training that he has given them that it will be enough for them to be able to cope. And besides, it's not exactly going to disappear into oblivion. He's still going to be present in a country monitoring what is going on. Yeah. And people will know that he is there to yeah. confide in him if they need assistance with anything that he's an expert in. And I think there's some merit in uh, him giving way. But you also have to keep in mind that some of the things he has to do is in real time. If you don't, if you are not capable of responding in real time to some of the dangers that the countries face, maybe he doesn't trust all the people. No matter how much you train them, he came from war. He evolved, yeah. and uh, he that instinct that he has is probably what got him this far. Not necessarily all the other things that he has, his collocation and all the rest. And maybe that's what he's afraid of that the people are gonna, uh, the people that he's gonna train are not gonna have. But that said. He should be able to do it because, okay, an example, I've seen the leaders that hand over to um, another leader and they sit behind. And later on, if they find that the leader is not doing very well, they come back again. Right. Rollins, Rollins took over, handed over power back. And when he saw that craziness was still going on, he took over again. So he can do the same thing. He can leave it for other people to do. If they know what they are doing, they're going to run the country well and they're going to run with it. Yeah. He, he's done a really good job for now. Till, till now, but for how long he can hold, hold on to power? That's my problem. Because right, I mean, if you if you if you if you see government history, talking about government history, if you if you think about Yaya Jammeh when he come to power, from ninety four till till two thousand and four, he done really really well, economy wise. You know, everything was going smooth, and then after that, he was supposed to come down, but then he cling on to power. He didn't support. He didn't follow his purpose that he, what he was supposed to do. Then. The only way he can stay in power, he have to empower his tribal people to be around him. Today, with everything he did, we Gambian are crying, crying our eyes off that we want him back to come and work in our security section because Gambia, we, our security section is a big threat. And what, what something we never had in our country for over 22 years, now we have in the petty, petty crimes everywhere. So yes, if, if, we, if, we, if, we, did, if we did have a, some kind of arrangement with him before we chase him out of the country and pretend like he was a monster, that we all celebrate today, what difference it makes because Gambia is worse than was it under him the past 22 years. The only difference we don't have is that police and the soldier are not going around killing people. That's all we don't have. But still now, people are killing people. In the time, you kill people, he kill you. Mm. So we need him back in the, in the security. We don't need him as a president because one man cannot rule the country forever. I don't support that idea. I think they should put a time limit in every African country that everybody that rules the country can rule two times or three times. And that's it. Don't matter how good job you are done. It's an office. It's not your father's house. It's not your house. It's everybody. Even even a, even a, a, a son of a fisherman have right to be in the office. Why one person should sit there and telling me that he's the only man in the country who can do all the job? It's wrong. He's done a very good job. But he can't continue doing the good job because if he keep being there for so long, people will turn against him. This is my point. I have a question. Go ahead. <clears throat> uh, my question is, um, since the people since the citizens are the ones who, who vote their president in, how how would president his how would his excellency train someone specifically when it's the people who vote his the party. president in office? Every every president have a party. They all have a, a, a party. His party, that's where he needs to train them and elect them to come and contest as an election. 
So only so, the people in the party are going to be running for president? Is that what she, I guess? That's no, what she, no. He, uh -huh. The whole country have to be trained. But I'm telling you as an African, the one that's going to listen to him is, is going to be coming from his party. So in his party, he have to make sure so he put somebody just like him that can take over and he, he will go around with him all the campaign and make sure and make people to understand this guy is taking over. is exactly like me. He's going to be doing things the same. Nothing's going to be changed. If anything's going to be changed, it's going to be more improvement, more good things, not taking yeah. us back. If he do that, probably he will have more support. But if he wants to stay in power, as, as I give you another five years, people will start turning but their back on him and they will start saying nasty things about him. You see, now they started it. They say in Congo. Next thing they will say, or oh, the other tribe are saying that they're not happy in the country. And then they, you see, the, you see the, 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 the enemy of progress outside Africa. They all start making these comments. And now they start saving hashtag, hashtag. They want free, they want I like this comment that this person says. This is, just, this is true. I think because they understand what absolute destruction look like. They know what they have to lose. They know what they, they could lose. I mean, I don't think I don't think we could understand what they experienced. And so and most of this was in within the people, some of the people's lifetime. It's only been 20 years. 27. Yep. 27. I'm sorry. It's 28. Been, yeah. Is it 28? Yeah. 28. It's going on 28 yeah. So it's not like something that was that long ago. Yeah, that's true. Actually, and also I, I guess with Rwanda as well, is that um, it's actually a good thing that he's a Tutsi. He's actually from the tribe that suffered the first attack. So, yeah. and the, and the, and the reason why this is good is the other tribe can't really complain because they've actually been given a really really fair uh, position. He, the reason why mo most Rwandans like him is actually he didn't retaliate. Now, sure, some of people from his tribe don't like that the fact that he didn't retaliate. They don't. But they don't. Right, they don't. But the thing is, he's actually appeasing most people because, you know, there's peace and he never retaliated. So the, the opposition from the other tribe will be very, very unlikely to begin with. Uh, and and they're actually the majority of the country still. So in a way, I think he's the best leader that they have, because imagine now you move on and you give the power to a, to someone who's a Hutu. There's a lot of expectations that's going to come to some of the their people. So it's going to it's going to change a lot of uh, issues when it comes to the, the, ra the racial aspect of the whole thing. And so yeah, is sure. Mean, is that mean that he's going to be there forever then? Probably. I think he will. Um, I, I don't think he's going to leave. And is that a good or bad thing? You know what? I think it depends. There's no need for us to just cookie cutter, take what the West says is the right thing. In the West, it's good. Too. There's no need. There's no need. Look, yes. if he's, if the, the reason why, you know, the whole Gaddafi thing, it's not because he stayed too long. The, the, the reason that happened is because there was, you know, direct things that America wanted. They wanted the gold, they wanted the oil, and that they had to remove them. It, they would create yeah. stories anyway, whether someone is I doing think, good or bad. I still tell you whether it's democracy, whether it's not democracy. There is no man in any country want to, who can rule the country for more than 30 years. If you do it, you'll fail. Anybody that do history? No, that's not true. Uh, King Abdullah is actually, uh, you know, Abdullah. ruling the country. Right. Ricky there's Abdullah. a lot of there's a yeah uh, the king of uh, Saudi Arabia. Oh, These yeah, people right. have been ruling for, forever. Yeah, so right. no, there are people who can rule forever. The thing is, you just have to do it the right way. I'm not saying it's right. I, I actually don't agree. I am I'm a Demo I'm a Democrat, right? So I believe in democracy, but yeah, democracy is not for everyone it's at not. every point. Like no, no, this no, country we, is we just come up with democracy that suit our, our narrative as African, not democracy that Western forcing us, the democracy that suit us as African. We can do and that, we can play our own rules. Democracy our doesn't own own work, democracy. as you can see. Yeah, yeah it doesn't. I, that's what I was about to ask is democracy good for Africa? Is no. democracy good for Africa? No. No, it's not even okay. good. It's not even relevant in America. There is no such yeah. thing as democracy in America. I wish people no. would be honest. That's true. And yeah. instead of inflicting on other countries, which you can't even get correct um, in, in your own um, home turf. And what I, I like, uh, I'll just say it this way. And, and historically, if you look at um, um, uh, Gaddafi, him being where he was, really quelched what was really the undergird of what was going on in Libya. When you remove him, when you remove Saddam Hussein, then you really get to see what was really going on. And by them being in power, I'm not saying anyone should have a lifetime term. That's not what I'm saying. But when you remove these leaders from 
from from you know presiding over the country and the people you don't really understand who you're unmasking and that's what the United States got wrong they thought oh we remove him we can take over the oil we could take over the gold we could take over the natural resources and we're good in the hood no not really because now you got a bigger bigger issue that those former leaders were quelching. Now you don't know who you're fighting and they change heads. That's another issue that United States was so ignorant about. Their eyes for greed or superseded of really what was, you know, with the pulses of the country and the people, because all they did was just change, you know, you kill one um, caliph or or teacher, then you get others that are worse than him. So that's what happened yeah. in, in in Libya. What happened in um, you know, and and what, what you know, in terms of what Gaddafi, they really got it wrong. They got it wrong with Saddam Hussein as well. They did. They got it horrifically wrong. All the same thing. All like I said, all these people, the time they were doing very well. If they if they give the power to someone else. They would have been in this position. Someone else would have take over from there, and it would have been a different story from, from now. But if you want to stay in power and telling me that you are the only man who can rule the country, if you leave the country, the country will sink. You will sink with the country. That's how it works. In all the history in Africa, if you look at it, they all every leader that stay long, 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 more than 15 years, 20 years, go to 30 years, they all fail. And that's why where we are, we are where we are. We Africans Let me are the ask problem. You something, Lam, and what, one question. I just want to ask you this because I'm I'm interested to know. Okay, so let's say the policy is that a leader can stay if every two years they could show that their results are, are getting better. I can understand leaders not staying, and I'm, I'm, I'm for the, I, I, I like change. I don't think that one person should be in office for a very long time as well. But in some cases, let's say you do have someone in leadership and their value, what they're putting, what they're doing. Somebody like Kagami, where, you know, you could look, if you look the past 20 years or 20 something years, you could see what he has been doing. I mean, you could see the he's end really well. of he's his leadership. Let me, let me land. He's, let done me of, land. he's done everything that anybody can do in Africa. He's the first okay. person who do it. I agree with that. Now, in reference to a, a president just sitting there and collecting money and, 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 and whatever, I understand that. But if you have someone that's putting in the work and actually getting it done, then why are we opposed to that? That Gina, should be... Do you believe that? Do you democracy believe means that, that you, you being able to, you know, to have that option, to have a good leader <laughs> stay in power for yeah, very long. A good leader. That, a good leader. Do you believe that somebody else can do a better job than him? Somebody can take you from where he left and do better. Do you no, I believe that? I could be better. Why can't we give other people a chance? Why do we have to live with somebody just because of it's good? We just have to keep it. We can get better. No, no. Because many can do it. May, some can do it better, but many can do it worse. Yeah, no, that's no, no. why. Yes. That's but what we, it is. We're afraid yeah. because he's done but so that's good. Why, that's why he's done such a good job. We don't want somebody to come and take it all away. That's why we exactly. need to put a time limit he's on He's the pride our of presidency. Africa right now. He is our pride. Even yeah. though Rwanda's the only place that's affected by his work. It gives a lot of us hope. Yes. Definitely. Yeah, actually with the with the time limit thing, right? See, I don't think the time limit is the issue. It's whether people can vote him out. See, as long as people can vote him out and say, okay, you know what? Right now the country's declining. We would rather have a change. That's fine. I, I actually don't mind having an unlimited term as long as the people vote him in. Uh, every year or every four years, whatever they decide, they can... Yeah. You know, if as long as they can re-elect and kick people out, it's fine. Like CEOs of companies, for example, I know uh, the guy from uh, Apple. What was his name? Uh, I forgot his name. Apple guy. Uh, oh, what's no, his name? Jobs. Yeah. Turtleneck guy. Yeah, Steve Jobs. Yeah. Right, Steve Jobs. <laughs> <laughs> right. So he was uh, actually turtleneck removed. guy. <laughs> he was removed. He was removed from uh, from the CEO position by his board of directors. Okay. Now. What happened is they realized uh, the company sucks. It was started to lose money. So they actually begged him to come back. 
And then when they begged him to come back, they studied him properly. Now, when they obviously he disappeared, they were able to continue and learn from him. I think as long as he's actually got a young core of people learning all the nuances of how he makes decisions, they will be okay. And I think I hope he's doing that at the very least. I hope they're doing it, you know, because mm. he's are he's doing it. They just after whoever's watching him, whatever whoever's trying to become a leader under him, I hope he's paying attention because. They've got the best president right now in all of Africa. Look, look, look at uh, His Excellency um, Magafuli. Um, fortunately for him, you know, he had, you know, now Her Excellency Hassan. Hassan. Now, who, you know, it, it's said that he selected her for a particular reason because of her vast experience and knowledge. Um, which she did. She's more than qualified for the step in as his predecessor. But, you know, in this respect was uh, His Excellency Kagame. He has a prime minister. He doesn't have a vice president, so to speak. But in, in terms of his party, um, again, like, like many have said already, the people, the people have to decide. Yes. And have to he has to trust that okay, whoever they select will have just as much as uh, the negotiation savoir faire and the chutzpah that he has as well to stand up to Europe because that's that's what is really you know making him stand out in addition to all that he has succeeded in by way of the genocide he stands up to Europe. He points back to Europe to say, who are you to tell me? We're Africans. We do things the way Africans do it. You Europeans, you are, have you have no leg to stand on. You are not the determiners of what Africa's what Africans do with Africa. And it's by his pushback and his kind of his brilliance and his African pride, he, maybe he doesn't see anyone you know, coming up through the ranks that has that that strong back, you know, to, to push back at Europe because so many don't. And they need to be able to do so because as soon as he as soon as he gives up the realm, you know what's gonna happen. I yeah. understand I understand all of your emotion towards him because he's turned off for black people. I understand all this. He's a great he's a great, great man, he's a great leader. But he can't be power forever. He have to leave the power if he want his legacy to be stay good. If he stay power, because just because of his stand up to white people, we have more black people behind that can stand up. But more. okay, Lamin, Lamin, in cases where we have a leader that's doing trash, nothing, we can black. argue the point. This is their legacy. How could his legacy be affected in a negative way if he is doing a great job and continues to do so? Right. He's doing a really great job. Is it going to be the long? argument, the fact, oh, he did a great job, but he's been sitting there too long. Really? Who cares about that? If he's doing, oh, I think the problem with people being in office too long is, or in power too long is the ones that are in power and just are, you know, devastating the country um, and doing nothing. I mean... I don't, think that's don't look, don't, Dina, don't look, for the, don't look at the leader. Look at the country. He alone doesn't move the country. He is moving it with the country, with the people in the country, and those people he must trust. These people. Do you think what's happening in the Gambia right now with the leader in the Gambia is because of the people, or do you think it's because of the the leader? The people and the leader, because the people are behind him are the one that make Adam Barahu do it. Because Adam Barahu is clueless. He knows nothing. So it's the people that make him to be who he is. Now they're all telling him that, oh, God put you there. We, we 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 vote for this man to be in office. They sit, they sit there and tell him that God put you in the office. If you go La, there, your time finish, you finish. La, you La mean, really? I mean, I think I think your issue with I think let me clarify something. I think one of your greatest concerns is that mm -hmm. uh, uh, he will end up um, being thrown out of office because of uh, you know That's he's it. been there too long. Most leaders don't get thrown off because they've been there too long. It's because they are not doing the right things. For their people and secondly as long as the systems are holding accountable i think this is the aspect that we really we haven't touched on today accountability can have a leader even stay there for life if they are if the the people desire it because as long as you're accountable i think gina you touched on it earlier on as long as you have a ledger or something you are reporting 
or progress that you are making for the country and the people decide that okay you can still carry on I, i'm not going to say you should be crowned a leader for life no you you come and run compete with other people if you keep winning and the systems that hold you accountable are not corrupted at least once the system because the, the, i don't think um kagami is that type of person that will corrupt the system he's such a humble person he's not enriching himself that he's not going to look to corrupt the system that will hold him accountable if that system as long as that system is not is, is genuine holds him accountable and says okay what are you doing for the country are you do you have anything to offer do you have any vision for the country and if this part is good you compete against people and if you win you remain there you shouldn't yeah. say you should cap it because it, it, like i said you could have a lot of people that some people that can do well or even better than him in office but you have more like queuing up to do trash so and yeah. we can we can we can have leaders when we have one good leader in africa then we risk it say okay let's go and take it a, a, a throw a die when we just one there's a great chance that we're going to get a terrible leader in africa again we don't want to risk that right now we want to have one good leader in place another one come and join him we don't want them keep oh, my fully is gone if you go and carry on an election you're going to be another crazy guy in office god help us you see my point yeah but I, I think because Rwanda is so developed and the people are so advanced now, I don't think any leader who comes there will be will be will if any leader will stay there long, more than one term will be will most so will will have to show these people that he's better than him, and they like you people are trying to, like everyone in this panel are trying to make it like he is the only person that can rule the country. That's my problem. He's That's not man. true. That's not true. That's really well. not what we're saying. That's not true. We're going by his works, my brother. We're yes. going by his works. His words, and what he's... His words, but, have, his actions have, have shows. But for but, how but, long that can but, be, people will stay by that. And my brother, be, be it, for that. my brother, listen, what he's doing is working in every facet. In every facet, you can't deny that. He also is making. I'm not against it. I'm not against it. I'm, against I'm not saying you are. For so long. I'm not. I'm. I'm, I'm. But listen, like like uh, so many have already mentioned, what he's doing is working. He is not. He's not siphoning money from the people. He's not shipping money off to Swiss bank accounts. He's not leaving his home country to go get medical care in Spain and <laughs> Germany yes. and, and, and leaving the people behind to get substandard health. Um, he's not he's not he's not leaving the country under dire circumstances to fend for themselves. Um, he's not he's not he hasn't demonstrated that behavior. So it, since he has not since he has not my brother and since he does defend rwanda yeah. as an african nation on the rise and what he's doing is working and he is he is making the europeans think again like oh okay we don't have a we don't have a pansy here who's willing just to concede just because so he's giving them some contention that they should have because no other leader really if, if he has ever that, done it. If he did all that, so what can he get? What can he get one person to do what he did? If he trained, like you says that he did all this, I'm sure there's somebody behind him who is seeing exactly what he have the same vision like him that can take over from where he left. I mean, so let me ask you a question, Lamin. Why has no other African country found this leader that you're talking about? Brilliant. Brilliant. No, no, no. Because uh, Kenya has elections. Uganda has some sort of elections. Uh, Tanzania has it. A lot of countries have it. Now, Mogafili, obviously, he's 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 one example. Yeah. But but all many countries have uh, actually democracy, and they yeah. the, the leaders leave. But yeah. this miraculous leader you're talking about, apart from Mogafili, yeah. doesn't exist. So Bro, yeah. the me, chances me, of it happening are still let's quite. Go let's go back to Kenya. Okay. Right, can you have how many leaders they have? I mean, since, what do you mean? Since, since this guy has been there, this Rwanda president, since he's been, how many leaders can you change? Um, okay, so let me see though. They have, they have, have, have uh, they've had, um, they have Kenyatta, the bit before that, they had at least Moy at some point, uh, then the other guy, and then okay, sorry, they had at least two or three, I think. Since then, how is the peace and security in the country? I mean, it's fine. It's nothing like that's for one. No, it sure isn't. 
dancing over Wanda, and he was able to do this by himself. So we've paid three people to do you know, the younger generation. Twenty five percent of what he did. You, the younger generation of Africa are coming. They are not brainwashed like us. They are not. They are not. In, they they know. They know. They don't see white man as a, as a threat. They are seeing them as a controller. They are the one who is taking over. They don't have this mindset we had in nineties. That's what I'm saying. If this man is there with all the good job he did, if he's there for so not five years, I'm telling you now, it's gonna be a different story because other African countries are catching up. The one that's not gonna be the only place like that, they are catching up. And people, I, who... I, I, I'm just saying, I don't think that we're saying that. I'm think, I'm think, I think what we're saying is that if it ain't broke, why fix it? Yeah, I understand that, but I, I'm saying for his yeah. legacy, he need to give power to some. He need to train people. No, he don't. Power. We disagree with you. He don't need I, to go. He's start. doing a I'll, good job. Okay. Yeah. Let I'll, me I'll say leave, this, Lamin. I will leave, he, like, I'll leave it like this then. He don't need to go because he's doing a great job. Now, they could vote him out. That's yes. fine. But he right. don't need to go because he's doing a great job. There are some leaders that's been in power for one year and they need to go, even though they got three years right. left. Yeah, I don't, I don't, right. I'll tell you that. Absolutely, you know Gina. I'm just president. trying to break it down for you to understand. He don't okay. need to go because he's doing a good job. Now, yes. he could be voted out and that's fine, but he's leaving whenever he do leave, be it now or never, still keep doing a good job, then oh, be it. And that's what yeah. he said in his interview. He yeah. said, he said, he said, I, when the people, when the I people don't vote me I'm in, I'll leave. They keep but voting him in. I don't, think he's rigging, I don't think he's rigging the election. No, right. I don't believe I don't that either. Think, I think he's winning because people no, like he's winning. He's winning. He's winning. He's winning. Yes. But so well, then, that, that should tell you. He's going to be context in every, 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 every election that come. He's so let me ask you something, Lamin. That is saying that the people want him because he's exactly. doing a good job. You don't see nobody in the streets with with okay. anything. You know, they're not screaming, "Oh, foul!" He's we didn't elect him. Everybody's happy every time he wins. Exactly. You don't and have a Bobby you know, Win issue. You, know you don't have is? that. You know what the problem Bo is? Bobby Wine, sorry. It shows us this. It shows that you can have a leader that's in office for a lifetime. But if he's a true leader doing his job, then yeah. he then we don't care. But if you are just sitting there getting fat and, tr and and buying expensive everything while your people are hungry, dying, there's no infrastructure, education. Um, that's the kind of leaders that need to go. Yeah, and Europe, yeah, Europe also has those kind of leaders as well. Yes. Yeah, okay, yep. you know, uh, so uh, Sarkozy, like, did he was just indicted yeah. in France? He was just indicted. Uh, Francois Mitterrand, they all had their scandals, but look uh -huh. what they were doing with they were, you know, they were pill, pill, pillaging off of the people, and the people were hurting. I mean, the people who they're supposed to be representing are hurting. That's not the case with uh, His Excellency. So, I'm saying the people are. are you know, they're still coming after 28 years. They're coming back still. Is everyone happy? No. Will everyone yeah. be happy? No. But it's better than what you could have. And he's still making inroads. He's bringing technology. He's bringing green energy. He's he's going across. He's taking them to the modern era of yes. where really yep. no other he's, African he's had, nation is going. You have to see that. You're talking about um, the generation. He's already taken them three generations ahead. I don't know what we're talking about here. Do we yeah. understand what we're talking about here? I have. I I'm think there's some misunderstanding. One more time, because y'all need to see how beautiful this country is. No, it's, I've seen it. The, the point of the matter. Is
I just had to show that because er, yeah. I, I, I can't. I mean, you just gotta show it. I know. I want to. I want to go there to die. I want to go there to die. <laughs> if you have a president that's doing this, would you want him to leave? I'll oh, vote no. him every year. Yeah, I mean, I think we shouldn't actually have had this conversation past what Tinai just said, which is basically as long as the elections are fair and there are elections every whatever four or five years, whatever they decide. Yeah. And they can remove a leader for any reason, whether they just want change or whatever. As long as the people can decide that, it doesn't matter if he runs until he, he, he's a skeleton. It, what difference <laughs> does that make? The skeleton can rule and keep things <laughs> progressing the way he has, then he'll be, a yeah. he'll be the first dead president ruling a country. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It, it, it makes no sense. Like companies do this all the time. As long as the CEO is doing a good job across time and they like his vision and where he's taking them, they usually keep uh, the CEO, it's, you know, but if they want to change, whatever reason, they'll decide and they'll tell him, okay, goodbye. And there's nothing wrong with that. Somebody said not as nice as Kenya. I don't know about that. I haven't done Kenya yet. I'll come back to you on that. <laughs> but um, Kenya is, uh, I mean, Rwanda is beautiful. And this man, I mean, everything that you saw orchestrated by him. <laughs> I wish we had a president like him in America. Who, <laughs> I mean, who actually some of these streets up in these uh who, US of A. Who actually who actually is unashamedly um willing <laughs> willing to defend and stand up for his people. Mm. Um you can't say the same thing with Obama and definitely and not so Obama 2.0. I think you you're going to offend uh, I don't Rwanda care. I don't statement. care. Africa is Rwandan. She said, he says, or she says, even if they put election, we will vote for him 98%. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> this is a Rwandan. I, so, yeah. So, I, I wish, I wish we had someone with integrity, humility, um, who, who have a, a purpose driven uh, goal for the country, for the people, and um, who who doesn't look who who doesn't look at the at the role of being commander in chief of a country as a strategy to mm. get in to do uh, to this party affiliation, siding with the party. What about the people? So this yeah. see this was shows that America is not a true democracy because if you're just siding for the party for the party's sake. What about the people? The people will lead you in. So what yeah. happens to the people? Yep. I mean, think about it. Like, how is it that it was Trump and what's the other woman? Uh, Hillary Clinton? Right. Why, why would those two... Do, do most people even want or like those two people? No, that's no. not democracy. <laughs> and the people who think it is are, you know, confused. There's conglomerates. Uh, there's a lot of companies paying for them. And they're choosing... They're basically choosing a representative they like to push their agenda. And then they trick you and they make you feel like you voted for them. They don't care who wins. They're both exactly. the same character. So, yeah. There are cities in the United States that don't look as good as uh, Rwanda or it's moving... Um, as progressively as Rwanda. Rwanda is the, the most progressively moving country, not just on the continent. You could Google this in the world right now. I agree. Yeah, I mean, they have even, even though it's politics. young, even though it's a young country in terms yes. of its development, its alleged development, they're very developed. They're to me, I would not personally, I wouldn't consider them third world. I wouldn't. They look more first world than America looks. You can get a business license the same day in Rwanda. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Everything is just like in motion. It's like, you know. Yo, no bureaucracy. The Chinese of the world in in Africa. <laughs> if you would consider Africa, you know, uh, they they move very systematically. He's very good organizer. We got to give him what he he deserves. I know Lamin was like, "Look, we don't need anybody in office that long." I I truly I always feel the way you do, Lamin. Um, hey, Lamin, you know, I'm I'm not I'm not against what he did. I mean, I, I, we're gonna we can we can go back to this conversation. He's done what ain't nobody in history, apart from Manza Musa, no one in African history done this kind of development. In African history, the only the only the only P person you can talk when you say African history development wise, you talk about South Africa. It's not even actual Africa, is it? Because they I don't mean, call themselves Africa. So Lamin, if you have a, a a leader like this that come into the Gambia and can make these kind of shifts, you wanna replace him? Mm, yeah, after that come, yes. I will give him 15 years, every five years, good three terms. 
And I, after that, he need to leave. How could you accomplish all of this in a little bit? This is another thing we need to keep in mind too. Actually, wait, of... let me. Go Do you ahead. Have a job. Go on. Do you have a job? Me, yes. Okay. How long are you working your job for? Uh, this job I'm doing now, sixteen years. Okay, so why didn't you leave uh, every five years? Uh, it's not that time, is it? It's, it's a job. I'm working for someone. It's not right. Exactly. You, you like the place? It was okay. You didn't need to leave. You you should be practicing your kind of thing of moving on. Same <laughs> principle. Yeah, Josh, it's the same principle. You're good at what you're doing. You're this good is at a job. what you're doing. Exactly. Don't, this is don't being a president. Job. is a job. Don't He's doing a job, job as well. Don't yeah. Compare my job as a president and a presidency. It's a job. It's a job. That's all it is. You like the place. They like you. I'm looking at it like it's a kingdom. It's not. It's yeah. a job. And if it's he's a doing a good job, let's keep him. If he's not doing a good job, shoot. After six months, if he's not made any, if there's not nothing exactly. on the table, we yeah. should push him off the table. We should, right. shouldn't even get three years. Uh, if, I, if I had anything to do with it, you, if you became I, president I, I, and after I, I, a year, I, I, you I, haven't I, accomplished anything, you're out the door. I think what happened here, as a black people, this shows that we are we are we are crying and dying for a good leadership. This just shows yes. you that this is our that is true, though. It's true, and it's yes. important that we get good leadership. You yes. can't, you can't, we don't have the room for bad leadership anymore. Yes. You get it? Yes. If we keep getting good leadership, well, we we are we are in big trouble already. Exactly. No yes, we are thirsty. I can understand, I can understand the fear of everybody. Why why do we have to risk this good thing? And then end up with something that end up gonna end up genocide or something. Yes, I understand all that, but we need to trust our people now. We uh, need to give them chances. Uh, uh, <laughs> <That's what you're laughs> Look, let me, let me, let me. What, what, you, what you're saying is correct. What you're saying is correct. If there was a problem, but there is no problem. What, exactly. Why would you just go around no, changing? Why do we want to do it until we have problem. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, my brother. No. Come on, let me, what? Come on. Oh, I love you, Lamb. Lamb said, "Why do we have to wait? Let's kick him off while he's doing good." No, I'm not saying. And undo all the good that was done. Nah, I'm not willing I'm to take saying, that kind I'm of chance. I'm completely. I'm telling you to put him to your, to your, like a security advisor. Or okay, so you said the people should choose, right, Lamb? Yes. The people this are choosing him over and over again. Exactly. Well, well, the same people are going to turn back their back on him very soon. Watch. And, that, and, that, and that's okay. Uh, no. if that happens. It is, it, but it's you know not going to happen. You know what, it's man? not like America. We will have it's not like America. I know, it's not I, like I, America. I know. We are all happy that we have a, a, a black man who can stand for all. And, it's and this is great. And we are all it's wrapping static. our emotions. I understand all this. But we got to understand that this is presidency we, we're talking about. We are in Africa. We don't want one leader to rule country for 30 years or more. We don't want in the whole. Yes, you, you don't want a president and do nothing. Yeah, that's the right country in the whole. Now. No, even he's doing better. That's why he needs to train people better. Like, better than oh, I'm sure. I'm no, sure he's training brother. people. Uh, oh, okay. I'm sure. Uh, okay, okay. I'm. I, I am the only one who is in the negative side here. So I'm. I'm it's not negative. It's just not opinion. negative, Ramen. It's your opinion, but we're trying to. You see, you, you. You. Okay. Let me explain. The thing is this: you can't train certain things. Humility is not something you really train people on. Yep. Um, to be strong in heart, it's not something you train people on. You see, yeah. he's not just a, a good president. He's a good person. And, and sometimes, you know, like in, in a job, like if you hire people, you don't just, you don't keep the person because they're good at their jobs. You keep them because they're good people. Exactly. And, and what we're saying is that because he's a good person and he's good at his job, he could stay forever. Yeah, yeah, I'm with that. You don't mind. Uh, I'm that with mean, that. The rest of see, see, that doesn't settle well with me. So I'm we know. So. Yeah, I, because I, I like we that. know. And I think he did really well. But I don't want tomorrow. We can, you know, I we used to, you know, in Gambia, we used to, we we, we used to say we want Gadda we want president like Gaddafi. We want we want him to be every African country to have a leader like him because his vision for Africa was number one. You know what? These people are the first one who turn their back on him. And the, this man who changed the desert to a to a desert what with nothing, he changed it to a city. Today, I see your bar you know was happened? too low. They find him in a hole. They they drag him from through through a hole. And this is one of the uh, best. Sort of your happen. your bar is too low, Lamin. 
Qaddafi was not doing anything remotely to what His Excellency has done for Rwanda. Not even oh, a bit of it. No, no, he has it. Yes, no, 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 they they no, did no. get stipends. Listen, listen, yes, no, no. they. What's your name again? Listen, go back to history and check. I know, I know, we are all wrapped up with this 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 Rwanda president, but Gaddafi have done far much much well better than he have done. Yet. He was ruling longer than Kagame, my brother. Yeah. I mean, hello, he's been ruling for. I love Kagame, so don't make me look like I'm. I'm no, no, no. I'm, I'm trying to long. make you look like Damn anything, my brother. Don't, was, please don't be offended. How long was he ruling? Twenty. No, not not Kagame, not Kagame. Oh no, Gaddafi. you're talking about Gaddafi. Yeah, thirty. Well, how many years? Yeah. Also, Lamin, his people did not uh, turn against him. What happened is there were twelve ruling tribes that were wanted to take power anyways because all African uh, countries have millions of tribes, and they're always fighting to get power. So he was controlling those tribes by having a really strong leadership. If he left a lot earlier that nothing would have been done uh, because those tribes were just waiting. So of course, America comes in and gives weapons, you know, and we, we, this was on all the media channels to certain tribes and also terrorist groups. Those are the ones who dragged them. It was not the people. It was some specific people and terrorists who dragged them. So even, cause I have a lot of uh, Libyan friends. In fact, the criticism they have for Gaddafi is he didn't do enough. They, they don't say that, you know, he was a bad leader. They say that they wish that he would have turned the country more like Singapore. That's hmm. the main thing that they actually complain about. 50 years, Gina. Yeah. Gaddafi ruled for 50 years. Damn it. Um, 50 years. Yeah, that's a long time. And yeah. one, one other thing that he, he Bro, didn't that's, do, that's what that's that's, 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 that's one other thing that he want this person to be that's hard call. You want him to be as much as long as Gaddafi has been. In it doesn't matter. I mean, I think one thing Gaddafi is where Gaddafi differs from uh, Kagame is that one Gaddafi was not accountable to his people, not uh, in terms of organizationally. Yeah, uh, yeah. Secondly, he actually did enrich himself and acquired family uh, power for his own family. So there was an element of corruption there. And I think yeah. I get the yeah. fear that uh, Lamin is highlighting is that when you are in office, there is that tendency to want to distort the system that is supposed to make you accountable when yeah. you remain in office for too long. That is where, that's what you should be arguing for, to preserve that, account, that system that keeps them accountable. Because once you can preserve that, no matter what happens, the leader should carry on. If the leader is good, is the best person to do the job, why would you choose anyone else just because you want to change? I agree. I actually agree with that, with, with you, with, in that. I actually agree okay. with that. But what, I, right. what I'm saying we agree that, to disagree. That's all right. What I'm what I what I'm implementing is just you to understand is if you stay in too power too long, the people that are cherished of him, they will turn their back on him, and he will not be this value that we are. I want his legacy to stay. I want him to leave office. So what but you're he, saying is that people may become jealous. Okay, let's say he stays in power. He's doing a magnificent job. I've, I've watched the documentary. Like, well, let me just hear, hear me out. Let me land. Please, please let me land. Okay, so he's doing a magnificent job. And then he just has some people that are not happy because they're jealous. So he should leave because he got haters. No, it's, that's not that's not what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, watched, I've watched a documentary that maybe is, is not very famous documentary. There, there's a lot of people in this country are making like the same documentary, the, the same thing we were making, the same kind of videos we were making about Yaya Jambe. When everybody was talking nice thing about him, you have group, group, group of people activate. They're saying something different and they're calling him dictator. They're calling, they're saying that he silenced people and stuff. And this is going to build up. For how long this is going to go on? With every good thing he's going to do, those small, small things gonna come become biggest problem after, and that this problem he's gonna face. Development he did, African people will turn their back on his development, and they will start pointing his finger on him, and he will be dragged like that. What happened to Mohammed Gaddafi? I know it's a horrible thing to say right now, and it's a long, long way. But I'm telling you, if this man wants to, his legacy to stay, he must in next five before next five years he need to find a plan for the Rwanda and the Rwandan people. He, he's not the only man who wear a plan in that country, and he cannot carry on. Losing his fear 
just say was of development you people saying because of the intervention the people in rwanda how are they feeling did they actually want him to be president forever no they, no one wants any wait, president to stay there forever different place are you saying the people in rwanda do not want him to be president they're voting for him they vote in rwanda yeah. they, don't, they don't have like this no, thing no, where one you of them want him to be power. president not all of them i'm telling you yeah, yeah but said, it that, can't be all yeah. I mean, but he's won. The numbers don't lie. He's and winning. Please, he's and please like, don't use America as a okay, okay. because all America. I'm saying, all I'm saying, all I'm saying, he cannot be president forever. He need okay. to find. He need to find somebody. <laughs> next five years to take over from here. <laughs> okay, but when the people say we've had enough, then yeah, I'm. Sh he he says, look, as when long as the people vote me in, I'll more. stop down. I don't, I, mean, I don't understand that. If people are still voting for him, then that means they still want him. So there's no problem. And if they don't, they vote him out. That's usually yeah. how the process works. And you all believe that's the fair fair election going on in the Yes, that's what the exactly. whole point I'm of I truly believe that. I truly right. believe that that is the one place that's having fair election. Yes, because America only... is it. Because <laughs> America and, and it, is not. <laughs> and if it's not fair, I mean, uh, let, let's let's say it's not fair. The next guy also will not be fair. So you exactly. know, it's like, At least it's he's like, doing something. Yeah, we. I he's guess we're at a point where we just want things to get done for Africa. Yeah, and, and, and he's doing that. And I think I think we all want the same. We all want the yeah. same. Me, you, yeah. and everybody. I just don't want a good Africa. All African good leaders end up in the same story. This is my so problem. Your president now mm -hmm. in Gambia. If he if he was doing something, people wouldn't be complaining over the fact that he don't want to step down like he said he was going to. If he was doing something. You see, you see, you see, when you lost the election, if you, if you come, if he, if he, if he, if he stepped down, he would have, he wouldn't be in asylum, he wouldn't be where he is today. Because Yaya Jambe was well loved in Gambia. Everyone liked him. Doesn't matter whether he liked your tribe, you don't like your tribe. We all was cherish him because he stand up for what we, we all, he stand up for us as a people. He stand up for our country. But for so long, because of people get tired of his ruling and his ruthless behavior, we want him out. And he, he said he's not going. And he, he wanted to be a king. After 20 something years, what happened? He's in he's in Equatorial Guinea. Now he's king. They, he was one of the richest presidents in Africa. Now he's one of the poorest men in Africa. You see the difference with our leaders? And after they serve their time, they have no respect because we, we treat them like nothing. But if they actually give power with the time they're supposed to give power, they will be respected forever. Like in Zambia, in in Tanzania, they have, before before this president that died, the president that was there, he can go, he goes around and go into the local bosses, go you know go traveling, and nobody will bother him. How many African presidents can do that today? Because they overstay power, and then eventually the people turn up to them. They can't even, after they leave, they can't even live in the country they serve. They have to go live in asylum. Mm. For how long we gonna entertain we African? We gonna entertain saying he's good, he's good. See, see, see what we are saying. See, like what you are saying, you are you are reacting from the negative experiences you've had of leaders that have been in office for a very long time. If they exactly. were being positive things, you wouldn't be saying this. I, I, you have to focus on where the real issue is because you then you you will understand that okay, what Kagame is doing right now is not necessarily a bad thing. As a matter of fact, me, I'm looking at the continent wide because if you have one good leader somewhere why risk losing that leader when there are so many of them queuing up to do a terrible job you can't mm -hmm. you, you just can't keep knocking one off one just pass you want us to lose another one because you want democracy to reign and you want leaders not to stay in place i i, I get your argument but that kind of argument is preferred when you have a higher threshold of good leadership in africa we don't have that now this is one of the good ones that we have we can't risk losing the him I mean, right he's now. like one of the examples that we could look at because there are too many i mean like he said this is really one of the only examples left i mean the Ghanaian president is doing a good job but i don't think it's at the scale of what kagami has done it's not and I'm just being honest. I truly believe I, I, I'm very grateful to the fact that he's opened up, you know, the doors for the diaspora in the way that he's done. I know that he stands up for his country somewhat, but he backs down a, a quite quite often as well. 
he didn't That's lay true. the foundation. Found, Rollins laid the foundation for the Ghana you see today. The, the, the Rollins was the one that paved the roads, did all those things. I was present there in Ghana during that time. Mm -hmm. he, he, he laid the foundation for the Ghana that you and see today. And let's not forget about Nkrumah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. So why can't why can, can, can you do the same? And put that like he did well. He's laid some. He's done. He's done more than laid foundations. He's put yeah. up buildings. He, put no, no, he did. He did all he, of he's, it. He's done all of it. He did. He did all of it. Now he has to trust his people to go to the next step. Let me he ask you something, Lamin. Do you feel like he's too old to be in power? Because no, no. I don't know what the. Okay, I'm gonna ask you some questions. He's not too old. He's no. still doing a great job. Yep. He still c communicates very well and defends. Um, Rwanda and Africa in every way. He's, um, I don't know, why would he need to step down if he's doing a great job? Because he's been, he's done, he's done what he need to do. He completes his mission now. You know somebody he's, that's, that's no, better? No, I don't know anyone, but I think. Let's talk come. about that. Okay, who, who, if you don't know, who do you think in Rwanda would be ready to do what he's doing? No, that's not fair. That's not a fair question to me. <laughs> you gotta be why? ready. Okay, okay, I uh, okay, okay, okay. I, I just don't want us to have this kind of program here in the next five years. We talk about oh, if he knows that we should have stepped down. Okay. No, he stepped down when the people say we no longer want you to be our president. You, yeah, it's, yeah. you in. can't put the cart before the horse. You know, when people yeah. say that, when people say that, that comes with a bullet. That's the problem in Africa. What? They're not just going to say we don't want him down. They want him dead when they want him down. So I don't, they get that, down. I don't think that's for everywhere in Africa. Like I was saying, <laughs> people just dance like this Africa. Lamin, I think you keep forgetting something. They have elections. <laughs> they, yes. they have elections. And then uh, they vote him or other people in or not. I, I, can tell, I can I can tell you that the election <laughs> and everything is all fair, but I'm telling you for the man's sake, he's the one who have to have a who have to have a dignity and respect for his people and give power easily. So easy <laughs> transaction to someone who is civil. We don't want this this military mindset forever in our African country. He's not just military. So that's not mindset. how he's ruling. That's not who he is. He's yeah, more than that. Sister, what you want is interview. I'm telling you, the reality on the ground is not the okay. same. That what he's talk, the way he's gonna talk to you in the interview. We all contact ourselves very well when we talk in the interview and start mm -hmm. saying not what we true. want people to hear. But the people not in the true. ground, are, they're all not gonna say the same. I'm not saying he's a bad president. I am telling you, yeah. if he stays too long, he's gonna ruin what he work for. Let me see if I have something here to share with you guys. I'm trying to see because, to be honest with you, I understand what you're saying, Lamin, that you don't want. I coming from. Um, a dictatorship type of leadership. Uh, I, I think I can understand what your fears are. And the conceptual West convinced us that our salvation could only come from something they call democracy. And I'm using the word very deliberately, something they call democracy, which they defined. And they defined it in English, if you are colonized by the English, and they defined it in French, if you are colonized by the French, and they defined it in Portuguese, if you are colonized by the Portuguese, and they defined it in Spanish, if you are colonized by the Spaniard. We never defined it in Kinyarwanda, no. It was never defined in Igbo or Yoruba. And we were told after the collapse of the Soviet Union that democracy was equals to one, multi-party politics, two, periodic elections, three, limitation of terms of the presidency. That is how the conceptual West defined it for us. And we who have had the advantage, if it is an advantage at all, of being educated in the West, there is a sense in which our thought processes are also confined by those definitions. However much we want to free ourselves, we find our default mode being how we were trained. So when we define democracy, we are also caught up in this box. Sometimes we tell ourselves to think outside of the box, but the true north of our thought processes still remains the box. We never think without the box. <laughs> so when we talk about 
peace in Africa and we talk about adversarial politics, we are not talking about anything that is African. The political party is not African. It is something that we inherited. You know, in the United Kingdom, they talk about the loyal opposition, loyal to the monarchy. Because there is a process. And it is important that there is a fair trial. Paul Kagame has been president of Rwanda since the year 2000. The country's constitution has already been amended to allow him to serve more terms. Human Rights Watch claims that opposition figures are persistently targeted. If Kagame wins the next election in 2024, he could hold on to longer. There's no Western leader that has been in office as long as you have. Do I care about that? Because a Western leader is a Western leader. Because electorates normally <laughs> throw <not> electorates <laughs> normally throw people out. The nature of elections and oh, democracies yeah, yeah. is that people get tired of it and they move that, to another person. That is if you are telling me, you know, that everyone has to conform to what the West tells us to do. I'm not one of those people. The Western world is a world on its own. Okay. It has many good things that they do. It has many bad things they do. There's no democratically elected leader in a generally accepted democracy that has been in office as long the, as you. Democracy is not uh, defined by the West. No. If it does, then what happens of the contradictions that happen in the West? Where we find the countries in the West, they elect their leaders, and then they turn around and start complaining about the same leaders they have elected. So you are telling me democracy, therefore, has imperfections, whether it is in the West or anywhere else. So, but I cannot live by or live the imperfections of the West. This is why I like the man. <laughs> Yeah, I think you I love him. Oh my God! <laughs> oh, I <laughs> All right, guys, it's done. <laughs> this is I mean, it's I, I'll tell you the difference between His Excellency and. Um, Barack Obama. Yeah. The difference between His Excellency and former President Barack Obama, I'll give him the respect because nobody else will, even though he's our former president. The okay. difference between the two is former President Barack Obama is a politician. Yeah. His Excellency is not. His actions that he has demonstrated thus far on behalf of um, trying to uh, join the Rwandans together, irregardless of Hutu, Tutsi, or whatever other ethnic uh, group, is that at the end of the day, they are all Rwandans. They're all Rwandans. Yeah. And if Africa, if the continent, Mama Africa, could join an alliance and see themselves as one Africa, oh my gosh, what would... Oh man, if we could live to see the day where you're not any particular tribe or ethnic group, you're one Africa. Yes, sir. One Africa. That will be the mobilizing. That's the thing. dream. Right there. Yeah, that's that's if it. That's it. In my lifetime, I'm good. I'm, I'm, yes, exactly. I've, I've seen that, it all. I've done it all. I'm ready to go. Yeah, ready, ready to yeah bite the barn. And yep. that's the difference between our former president, Barack Obama. He said a lot. He did very little. Very little. He went back on a lot that he said he stood for. He, he'll say anything to get what he wants. Yeah. And he'll kowtow and he'll, he'll change shirts just to get what he wants. So he doesn't mean what he say. And he doesn't say what he mean. That's a hypocrite in my book. Yeah. I I don't know. 
if everybody else understands that we need somebody that could push back on these Europeans when they come with this, with these, with these beguiling. And he does push back well, actually. The way he pushes back, he, he uses his own argument against them. Yeah. And um, the, the thing about Obama is that uh, I, I, I think that sometimes um, the Americans are a little bit uh, not generous with him. Because even, even Trump couldn't build the wall. Uh, the, the America is an ungovernable state, right? Now. It's, it's, it's almost like Nigeria, really. <laughs> Anything you try to do as a leader, they just shut it down. They're like, you're not going anywhere. You're going to stand still and wait for us. So I think that that is what happens with uh, the U.S. Uh, U.S. politics is so, in such a way that, yes, you require such a lot of nuances because there are so many people listening and so many people you want to please or you don't don't want to displease because these days the ones you displease are the ones that are the vocal ones and they tend to get their way. Uh, mm-hmm. actually. So this is a problem with the system that the U.S. is facing. And that is why what uh, it just makes it more relevant because he talks about how the imperfections of the West, why should we inherit that too? And stuff like that. So um, we, we have to look at that from that point of view. And the, for me, this week has been about our leadership, how we treat our leadership. Really, I actually felt that we need to start thinking of our leadership as part of us and not always, we hold them accountable. Our accountability level has to be extremely high, but we also have to learn how to pull them back in. In, in our culture, they say you you discipline a child with one hand and use the other hand to drive, drag the child back uh, closer to you because you have to always remember they are your own. You don't want others to take control of your leaders. If you do, if they do that, um, it's not going to be good for you in the end. So we always have to remember that our leaders are our own. Obama's failings is just as much as uh, part of our failings. And right. uh, Ma- Malcolm X's failings is our failings too. And uh, Martin Luther King, all of them, yeah, they are our own. We have to own it. I agree. And I understand where Lamont's coming from, to be honest with you. But in this case, he's good. Let's yeah. let's let's let the people keep voting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as long as they're voting him in, then that's fine. Um, um, because I truly think he's doing a great job. Now, there are a lot of them that we're gonna talk about, and I don't know who we're gonna pick next, guys. We've we've covered Congo and now we've really uh covered Rwanda, which happens a, to a be a um, Guinea. A Guinea is the one you saw. Is that I was trying to do all of East Africa first or in that area. Yeah, um, they're part of it. It's, it's so, Guinea. That is quite interesting. Yeah, that guy has got a colorful history. Yeah. <laughs> Please put it mildly. Do you do a little bit of research about Equatorial Guinea? Because I've been in that country and I've got a lot of friends that live there. And, you know, those people, I because nobody talk about their country, nobody talk about the dictatorship that's going on in that country. No African country will sit and say Equatorial Guinea because. Because they are Portuguese, you see the difference. They're not English. I like, not the, I, like, I like the idea of I'm gonna. Okay, so it's it's Uganda or Equatorial Guinea. We'll figure it out before this is over. But one thing I want to say is what this commenter said. Africa said, and let me tell you that Rwandans don't travel a lot. That's true. I don't. I don't meet a lot of Rwandans in these um um American streets. <laughs> I don't see them uh, traveling out of the country as much as, let's say, if I bump into an African, they're either Ghanaian, Nigerian, um, from, some of from, from from the Francophone uh, places, but I, I, I rarely meet Rwandans. They're in Philly. They're in Canada. Okay. Um, and uh, you're right. They're not around a lot, but where they are is strategic. Okay. Um, so they can up. They can up. They can't. Yeah. They can't. Yeah, they, okay. they, they're, they're, they're like, you know what? I take a low profile. I come out when I need to. And if I don't, I'm just going to sit back and watch. They seem to be a very um, strategic people. And they sit back and they watch and they observe. They seem to be very keen so on that. Really just their personality, then. If you, if you think about it, that's. Uh, Libya was like that. You don't see Libya before. You never see a Libyan anywhere in the world. They only see them in Libya. Now you see Libyans everywhere. You know, well, I mean? a lot of them are in France. Yeah, remember before Libyans would not leave their country because they have the, they have one of the best benefit system all over the world. Better than UK, better than America. Their benefit not, system. Not, 
not Saudi Arabia, but but the point of but the point of the matter is that yeah, he gave them everything that they need to survive education, free education. But he allowed. But one thing Gaddafi said is that I don't mind my people going abroad to learn. Yeah, get what you learn and bring it back home. Leave the white women alone. That's what he yeah. said. That yeah. was one of the most po- one of the most memorable things that he said to all yeah. Africans. I know we remember that. <laughs> and it's yeah. Right now, everybody, everybody love Kagagi because we black people we dying and crying for leadership. But I think we should give ourselves a chance to create more good, more good leadership. That's what I'm saying, man. We dying and crying for leadership, and we finally got one, and you want him to go. Hey, we, no we one is stopping them. <laughs> We don't let him go. We gonna we, we want him to help us. Not only Rwanda, he can he can do far better just being a president. He should, he cannot just be a president. He can go and do you see the good job he do he do he did to Rwanda. He can go around to the world to Africa. I think we already had this conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Case yeah. case uh, already said it now. If it was so easy to create good leaders, why are they not popping yeah. up all everywhere? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We yeah. should, no, we should I, talk I, about I Ethiopia know. actually, the, because their their country is interesting. So yeah, the, the leader Ethiopia, that's East Africa. Yes. Yeah. Because something um Ethiopia, Ethiopia, Ethiopia. Do we really want to talk? It's, that's a long one too. That's that's a powder keg as well. That's, that's a that's a weird one for me because I really feel like. I guess I'm gonna have to talk about it eventually. Ethiopia is questionable for me. <laughs> How come? <laughs> just because, just because of their, their um, like I was watching this documentary, and right. I'm gonna share it. I'm gonna share it if we talk about because and it was this young man maybe in the 1950s and he was saying how he don't feel like he's black and. Hmm. They yeah, they don't feel like they're black. Not, they're African. African. They don't feel like they're black and they don't feel like they're white. They feel like you know, and and, and I was like, what? <laughs> they're African? They don't feel like the Arab African. influence. Arab they're influence. African. Yeah. They're yeah. not. They're not black and they're not white. They're African. I, I when did we start? When did we? When when did, when did continental Africans start to cloak themselves in black. Well, they, don't feel, they don't feel like they're West, like they don't feel like they're the same people as West Africans. That's what he said. Oh, well, that's a but, different thing. But but they yeah. no I just wanted to make it simple. That's Africa. what he said. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. So they I mean, most of them are, are Cushitic mixed with some Nilotic people. So, yeah. and uh, I think the reason, if you watch any of those old videos from 1950s, there's mm-hmm. a re- specific reason why a lot of them rejected it. Then the main reason is because uh, mm-hmm. Africa was being colonized uh, or just being colonized mm-hmm. and they were not going through that colonization. So they wanted mm-hmm. to distance themselves. That's what from, it was. I, feel, I felt like they yeah. were distancing themselves in that, in yes. that video that I have. I'm, I'm going to share it if I could find it. But um, yeah. But later on, Italy yeah. got a piece of them and so did Germany. So no, they weren't colonized like Central and West Africa, but ultimately, with yes, during the Abyssinian War, American American blacks were ruling from Harlem. There was a big demonstration. A big yeah, demonstration. They were enlisting to go fight in the Abyssinian War, right? In the United States go- government, from Harlem, but from Nigeria as well. It True. Was- um, from Nigeria and from uh, certain parts of other parts of West Africa that went and actually fought for them, with them. But but Italy did not colonize them at that time. But at, later on in the in the decades, they did start, you know, controlling yeah. them on some level. As did Germany. Same thing happened with Rwanda, France, and Germany. Also, still have a hold you know, on, on Rwanda also still to this day yeah. in Ethiopia, you have the issue with the Nile, the Nile river, right. Ethiopia is trying to, be, or, you know, they're building a dam to generate more electricity for them as a people and create more industry for them. Um, Egypt is saying that's going to have an issue with, for us because all, all that we do comes from the Nile. And the Nile starts from Sudan and comes down, or up, yeah. as they say, um, goes up and goes, you know, how, you know, the way that the Nile River goes down. So it's going to impact, it's going to adversely impact Egypt. Yeah. 
So this this uh, scuffling right now with um, the Tigray people and Eritrea and Ethiopia, I, I, I think I think Egypt got some instigating uh, factors in there too. And then when we allow our own people to, they play each other, and we allow our we allow ourselves to be played by by others is 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 just very disconcerting. Yep. Yep. That is our example of uh, division that is easily used against us, and yeah. that is it is a very even the Ethiopian mm. government said that the Egyptians sent people into their country, mercenaries into their country. There, somebody was even assassinated, and they tried to make it look like the government that did it, and all mm. the rest of it. They try to foment trouble in your country, mm. and t- t- because that dam will mean a strategic shift for. Uh, this in Ethiopia, and uh, it's not. This is, it's not even going to affect Egypt adversely. Egypt is, a, is an African uh, country. I don't know why they are acting like that. Is because America has uh, the, during the colonial uh, colonial period, they gave them too much power. They said, mm. "You, you, you control these. You have these weapons. You are the gatekeepers in Africa and all the rest mm-hmm. of it." So mm-hmm. they feel like if Ethiopia now is taking their own birthright back, mm. that they are going to be. They, it's going to undermine them. And you don't think from the point of view that these are your fellow African country. They've even given you assurances that whatever this in um, uh, this in the issue that you have is going to be resolved. And Egy- uh, Ethiopians were willing to give them everything they wanted, and yet they still complain. So it's not necessarily about how the water comes down uh, the, the, the the Nile. It's mostly about pride and wanting uh-huh. to have strategic control over everything. Mm-hmm. Right. You know. So uh, it's a terrible, terrible event. But I think we are living to experience this since ourselves now, whereby even we, see, we started having some of these conversations last year, and we actually s- saw the transition from arguing with Egypt to civil war, a kind of civil war in Ethiopia, because yep. it's agreed. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's, uh, that's right. exactly. So I think, uh, yeah, definitely, if they get that damn finished, they could be selling that electricity to Kenya, Uganda, even more. Mm-hmm. And they could uplift most of their rural people into like the technological age and invest more in like internet and engineer software engineering because this is gonna be a big changer for for them if they can get it done. But yeah, hundred uh, percent. Egypt and uh, America and their partners like Saudi Arabia are definitely doing uh, instigating people, paying people, and causing trouble. Because right now the issue is just resurfaced again, uh, even after the little war. And I mean the, the leader. The interesting thing with the leader is he was given a Nobel Peace Prize. So, you know, he did do some. Yeah, and I think he did deserve it, actually. Uh, it's because he he actually made uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea sign a, a peace deal with each other. And they were the, the Eritrean government refused to talk to Ethiopian government <laughs> forever, basically. So that was a pretty good achievement. Um, but I think right now, obviously, a lot of people are thinking he wasn't ruthless enough and that this is actually interesting because it goes back to what the conversation with Kagami now yeah. this guy oh, is actually more yeah this is interesting guy because he, he got the Nobel Peace Prize because he did things the way the West liked it mm. things to be done and again I'm not going to disagree with what he did but here's the issue when the war was starting to happen you could see that the people are instigating people and he didn't want to use the same force that he his predecessors used basically the previous Ethiopian kings and prime ministers or presidents would go and just kind of use the government uh, army to suppress people who are causing trouble. He didn't want to do that. He wanted to communicate, negotiate, and do all these kind of nice things. And guess what? People actually hate him for it now, a lot Mm -hmm. of people, because it caused the war to happen. It allowed the escalation to happen to a point where even worse things happened because he wasn't able to kind of take a strong fist and just neutralize the the problems so uh, lamin i mean all these things depend there's a timing for everything so yeah, yeah. It, you have to be your people also have to be ready for the change also mm-hmm. you can you know right and i agree with you Kezo, especially coming from the genocide it, it there's a lot of healing that's mm-hmm. a thing. and and um it's a del- delicate thing and yeah. they're not finished healing either. I, I saw an interview. 
mm -hmm. um, that uh, uh, she's she's a member of the parliament, and she, um, um, someone uh, Mickey from uh, Unap Unapologetic Nomads had interviewed her, and you know she discussed a little bit about the genocide, and you could tell the pain was still present. Um, and it, her, I think part of her concern is that people who were moving um, into Rwanda, um, although things look rosier for you, but not in your home country, there's still a unresolved um, uh, healing yes. uh, in terms of the genocide. And, and just because it's 28 years ago, uh, yes. more or less, doesn't mean that all is well. Um, these people were neighbors, they were friends. So that, you know, look what that that really can it has resounding effects and, and we can't act like, okay, well that's just twenty eight years ago. No, the pain is still there and you can't ignore it. That's it. And um, Africa, you know, I know that you're from uh, you're I don't even know if you're currently living in Rwanda, but you're definitely from Rwanda. And we definitely um, we sympathize because, you know, when you when you talk about what uh, Rwanda has gone through and you think about how many people are still living and they're just walking around every day after seeing that and having to walk around every day. That's some bullshit. That's some that's some deep stuff right there. No wonder they walk around, you know, like you know, people. This man did the best that he could do under those circumstances. Goddamn. That's true. That's true. And um, people they should be careful when they they keep. It's easy to just start criticizing somebody, and sometimes there could be some element of propaganda there. The video that you played earlier on, uh, talking about when the Americans were saying that they use Rwanda for that, yeah. we have to be careful because some of all these people they they have very funny ways of stating things because they are going to make make it sound as if he's just a puppet for them. Exactly. Uh, you, you see, so we have to be careful. Well, because not not them them. per se. They know how to manipulate situations to make situations happen and have you have to respond to them. It's not even something where they go into a room with this man and say, hey, do this for us. It's a more of a thing where they create situations. They create situations where you have to respond. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Make, make, make you appear as if you are not a man of your own people. But the guy was saying, oh, um, you, you are like a dictator. And if, if it is true that he's like going against um, uh, unjustifiably going against um, uh, this in opposition, that's something that we have to worry about because that's accountability we are we, we are talking about. If well, he doesn't want to be accountable, that is something we have to be careful about. And those that didn't get to see it, I'm going to play it one more time. It's a really short clip. Uganda and why are Uganda important to the U.S. military? precisely because we can have them do things in Africa that we don't wish to do for ourselves. We can have their soldiers die if need be, we can have them deploy places if need be, and so having proxies, having allies, having clients who are willing to do your bidding becomes very important. Okay. Just having makes me want to throw up. Having proxies, having allies, having people willing to do your bidding. And that's not always voluntarily. Right. Comes with and some threats. Sometimes it's under duress or under the fact that, look, you know, they'll, I'm going to put a scenario. You know, they attacked your people over here. What are you going to do about it? And knowing that they, they, they set that whole attack up, and, you know, because they go to Peter and tell Peter that Paul is robbing you. And they go tell Paul that Peter's robbing you. And so now we all got our guns up. And they gang up on you. How about that? Yeah. And they use the term when we don't want to go and do it ourselves. Yeah. Um, they know some, some environments are not conducive for them to show up there. They don't want to lose their people. Practice. They got smart. They don't have to 
go to physical war anymore. They make you fight yeah. each other. Well, they do it. They are not shy about they it. Take your hand and they make you hit yourself. <laughs> you know, it's like taking your hand. You remember you have when you were a kid? Did that ever happen yes. to you? With yes. Take your hand, make you smack yourself. <laughs> yes. Yes. Mm. Yeah. They, they, we know they, if they want to go in, they can go in. They did it with Afghanistan and Iraq. And uh, if they really want to go uh, physically to take over a country, they they can't do that. If they they want can't to do it, but it's but easier when they don't have to. Exactly. I, I feel because like sometimes they don't have they a choice. Keep their hands clean. They could still look like the good people that they are. They could still look like good people. But if they do it, then they look like the monsters that they are. That's why they fund. That's why they donate. You know how much Israel... Um, donates to these militia groups in Africa and Belgium and Germany and France and Britain. Shall is I go Israel on? It's involved. Sorry? Is Israel involved? I never heard of Oh, Israel. yeah. Uh, the excuse me. The Beers. The De Beers. Okay. Yeah. Who, yeah. Who, who's it's selling it's what? Who's, sell it's in mines. Who, who's selling what? Okay. Diamonds. Mm. Who's selling it? The is, in yeah, Belgium. It, it, who's, it who's pushing it? Right, exactly. Okay, so you call them small hats? Okay, all right, we'll go oh, there. No, I, I, I didn't know that. I didn't know. I, I don't call them small hats. I just didn't know that. I, no, I'm, I'm saying Gina actually. Gina calls them small hats. Actually, call them call them hat. small hats. On a but, channel. <laughs> yeah, but, but look at the market. Look who's driving the market and who's doing what. In New York City, the largest market in New York City is Diamonds Row. Yeah. yeah. Who's who's right? The Queen. And where are they getting those diamonds from? The Congo. Right. <laughs> Let's talk know. about that. That's right. And and Belgium. Who, who are right. So if you look at the natural resources and who's selling what and who claim the beers and all and and, and all of the huge diamond marketers of the world. They have a, um, it, it's important for them to be able to get what they want at any cost. And if they, and when, no not if, no when they, when they fund these, these uh, squirmishes, violent squirmishes, how do you think that these groups are getting arms? How do you think they're getting them? One of our oldest parables in Africa is what? When two brothers fight. And that's happened. The other man the board. takes the land. Right, exactly. And that's happened even when the Arabs were involved in kidnapping and the marketization of human beings before the Europeans. So it starts there. But one day I pray that we all wake up and realize that we are not each other's enemy. One that's day. Right. And I'm not throwing thing, hate though. Sorry, this thing is is, is, is I'm beginning to wonder this is getting a little bit uh, almost uh, irritating with Africa really because what is it with Africa with all these resources that we have? Why do we have so much of it and the other parts of the world don't have it? You're blessed and you don't realize it. I, I, it's a little bit weird you because are royalty. We are gold, gold, we everything. Are it's like somebody is trying to set us up because we were born. <laughs> <laughs> we are the royalty of the earth, but we don't know it. it, it it's, it's weird because the U.S. doesn't have diamond. They don't have why? Why the, the land is? What, what about South America? What, why is everything has to be yeah, in one place? You want to? He says, "Why do we? We don't want it. That's why <laughs> they don't. That, you don't know what to do with it. That's a problem. You're, you're right on there. everything you need is right there on Mother Africa, and Mother Africa has always been the breadbasket of the world. Still to the day, if it wasn't for Mother Africa, Mama Africa, Europe would be a hovel back to the ghetto it originally was after they were fighting each other, killing each other. So Africa has made Europe thrive. That's why that that uh, video, Gina, that you showed about when that professor had stated that it is, increment, it is instrumental that Africa continues to do what it does so that Europe can thrive. And, 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 and people 
think think this is a light thing, but it's not. It's very um, deep. Yeah, it, 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 for me, it gets a little bit. Um, because the other day when I saw the the mountain where people are just digging gold out of, I was like, "What is this? We we are not going to rest with all these things. They keep, why don't they find it in um, uh, this in China or United Kingdom or so? Why is it always in Africa? What is this? I really need to understand what event that led to this because the Earth is round. It seems to be stuck only in Africa. Well, it's the beginning of civilization is in beginning in Africa. And when Africans wake up from that stupor that has been forced upon them and that self-hatred um, that they've been indoctrinated to believe, everything you need is right there, right where you are, underneath your feet. I, I, I have a theory. I'll share it. I truly believe that it's us. It's the people. I think that there's something about us. Wherever we go becomes prosperous. We were taken to the diasporans. We made it prosperous for them. I believe it's the energy. I think it's our energy. I can't explain it, but I tell you that if all Africans were to be taken and put into, let's say, all of America's, I believe gold was in, in, in all those resources would start coming off from that earth. I think now, if you know anything about science, you know, that all things, th things are connected. Mm -hmm. yep. And I believe the energy, our energy is connected to something more powerful than we know. I, agree. I can't explain it, but. I was watching. Um, I be able to, huh? I'm sorry. I was watching France 24 today. And um, in Thailand, um, which is a beautiful country, and I've been there, I love it. Um, I didn't know they had gold. So right now, because of the COVID, mm -hmm. because of you know C nineteen, um, the people who used to sell do, to the tourists at one point, you know, no tourists right now. So what they're some of the you know people are forced to do. Um, is to search for gold. So they've right. been searching for gold and they've been selling the gold and making like 90 baht, which is like 24 euros just to feed their family. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't know that Thailand had gold. America has uh, gold too, right? It Yes, it, it did until they over my, um, you know, mined it, California, Arizona. But nothing yeah. like not, nothing like uh, to the degree of what is happening in Africa. No, it's pale by comparison. Look at that huge boulder that the Asians Chinese put in that tank in that uh, in that uh, metal um, um, bin, and they were trying to take it out of the Congo. Say, oh, they wanted to analyze the big, big, huge boulder that they put in a, in a uh, metal like uh, trailer. Like, what are you doing? Of and course, okay. they didn't take, end up taking it out, but because the country, you know, Congo stopped them. But if they would allow them to, they would have taken it out. Yeah. And they're doing it blindly, like in your face. Like, I dare you to say something. I don't know. We, we need to get our act together. I think uh, the, the, all this is pointing to the fact that we as a people, we, we, once we get our act together, there is so much for us to inherit and contribute uh, to the world. And our time is coming. And I, it's, it's just around the corner in my mind um, because I see all the signs on the ground. And, you know, five, ten years from now, we'll be having these friendly discussions, I believe so. And uh, or even the Ethiopian problem that they're having, they, it all is going to be ironed out. If I'm not mistaken, it's already been ironed out now. Egypt will fall in line. After all, they are African uh, this is Union members. And most of all these things will be contained within the continent. And we just have to get past this. And uh, as relates to the conversation we're having, leadership is very, very important for us right now. Yeah. And uh, this is my only reason why I'm not taking the side of uh, Lamin because we have yeah. to appreciate the ones we've got now, hold on to them until the others arrive. 
and uh, so that when we get yeah, to that critical moment, now he's a great example to our leaders. So right now, I think he is teaching Lamb, and I, I not to cut you off tonight. I'm sorry, but what you just said was amazing, and I got something from it. You um you mentioned something that made me realize that. You know, what Lamin kept saying, teach other teacher, teach his, teach his replacement. Right now, he's teaching not just Rwandian leaders, but he's, uh, well, you know, um, soon oh, to Africa. be leaders. Yeah, but he's also teaching um, other um, young men and women throughout, you know, Africa and the diaspora, wherever we may be, on mm -hmm. what true leadership should look like in Africa. Yeah, I agree. So I don't think he's done teaching. <laughs> Lamb, <laughs> we need some yeah. more classes. Yeah, and he's not as he's not he's not even that bloody, really. He's compared to some crazy leaders that do things with everybody. He's not very, very benign. Some of them, yeah. Some of these leaders, they just look like they're leaning on something to stand up. They don't even look like they can stand up anymore. I've seen it. Yeah, but when they don't do anything for the country, when the country fails to provide for its citizens. Then, let their high knees out. Yeah. That yes, in that respect, yes, I agree with Lamon. When yeah. they are not producing for the country yeah. Yeah. and yeah. for the youth and for the and for the present and for the futures to come. Yeah. You yeah. have to get rid of them. You yeah, can't allow them to stay. Unequivocally, I agree. I agree. Yeah, you yeah. can't agree with that result. Now we just saw the video of Rwanda. And have a good employee that works really well. Right. That always is on time that you know is helping your business to grow and then you walk in and say hey you've been here for two years you gotta go nope yeah. you know how long it takes to get things moving it, it's yeah. it took yeah. time for it to get where it, it where it arrived and it's going to take time for it to you know if, if it's working why you know if it's not broken don't fix it I There's like the fact that he was humble. I think somebody mentioned that, and I think it was you, Amina, how, and I did read that. Um, thank you for bringing it up. Um, that when he, or Require, one of you, when he first, you know, when they first offered him the position, he humbly stood back and said, I'm not ready. Yeah. And that, that says a lot. It's you a know what I mean? Sign. It's a very that good sign. A lot. Yeah. yeah, I heard that today. I was like, wow, I, I didn't even know that. He was meeting yeah. with um, yeah. Mo Ibrahim. I'm like, wow, what humility. When have I ever seen that? I've never, never. seen it in my lifetime. Right, exactly. Not even stateside, you know. Um, and and what that was, I think, was so disappointing. But I think maybe we put too much um, hope into former President Obama. Um, and I think when we, you know, we, we look at him, okay, he looks like one of us. But by golly, he sure enough didn't think about like us and you would think like all his in his majority of his career he was in chicago on the south side of chicago at that to be more specific so he knew the ills and pains of the black community he knew it and so yeah. for him to act as if oh i don't know what you're talking about i'm i'm the president of all the united states yeah you are but <laughs> yeah, that's fine. That's fine. But you also know the people mm. who have been disenfranchised and marginalized. Yeah. And to act as if, oh, only the native indigenous people deserve. Look, okay, yes, they got their reparations. You yeah. want to talk about the former slave masters that got reparations? You want to talk about them? But you won't address the fact that if it wasn't for descendants of Africa, Haiti, you know, if you don't acknowledge that, you are nothing but a black looking man who thinks like a white supremacist. That's I, just my, my thing. Where, where, where I, why I, I excuse Obama a bit was that Obama is the first. And when you are the first, first impressions matter. We know how important that is in everything we do in life. And I think he has he had a lot of expectations on him. And right. he felt that if he went all out and started advocating some of the things we are talking about, that's all people are going to see of any African-American or uh, African-American woman that wants to run for presidency after him. Then that could not may not be very, very good for uh, the, the, our image. So 
And if okay, if you look at some of the things Obama did, like when uh, Trevor, Ma Trevor Martin got shot, he came out on TV and talked about it. He talked about how that could be his son, and he doesn't shy away from the fact that no. So you have to hear me out. You have to. He doesn't shy away from letting people know he's African. He's African American, and he, he's got a, a black wife. He doesn't have a white wife like Kamala Harris that is married to uh, this thing, uh, a Jewish guy. So he he's embracing the culture. But also remember, one other thing that Obama does that, and the kind of things that he does that people don't see is behind the scenes stuff. Like the, the type of Supreme Court judges, the, the judges he appoints into office, like um, federal courts. Uh, Trump, when he came to office, he appointed lifetime judges and uh, federal appeals court judges. These are very, very influential judges that mm -hmm. remain there for life. Mm -hmm. 53 of them, not one black person. Right. The reason why he did that, he did that. This is why the people that support him support him. This is why the KKK supports him, mm -hmm. because they know that is the instrument of power in exactly. the country, decision making in the country. You do you know what the percentage Obama put in that position? Twenty-seven percent ahead of any, he put black people. Twenty-seven percent of them in those positions when he was in office. More black people than the population should allow. He did that. <laughs> True. However, he had major roadblocks that Trump did not have. And he had the Republican Party, who were the majority in the House and Senate. And he also, also had some Democrats, the liberals, who thwarted how much more he could have done as well, to some degree. Now, yeah. during his first administration, oh, okay, I understand he had to gain the, um, uh, you know, had to fill people out and had to you know, do what he had to do. But you also were blessed to get a second term. That's the time that you could have went all yeah, out. Because you, 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 you can only get two terms, so get it in. Yeah. It was simple. It. It it. By that time, the damage had been done. He didn't have control of the Senate anymore. If there had been, if the, the, the first time, he had control of everything. But that was the first term. Right. If he had, because if he did, if he wanted to do anything the first time, he could have done it. Right. And, but he would have been too radical. He would be like an angry black man and all the no, rest. Of it. I think no. those are the kind of things he's worried about. I, I, and, and I, I, I got a feeling that's what he's worried about. That and and that's what I'm talking about. If you want to even make a stark comparison between former President Obama and His Excellency Kagame, the unashamedness that His Excellency moves, whereas Ob uh, former President Obama is uh, scared. But he wasn't afraid to tell Kenya, oh, um, you need to um, not just, you know, you should uh, encourage homosexuality. He wasn't too ashamed and timid to talk about that. that. Yeah, what about that? I, 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 he said, Lip, I think that thing, I really don't get why they obsess too much about those things, really. And the fact that he says those things, I'm not sure he actually punished them for it. But yeah, I agree. Yeah, Obama he did. Is the, the, he's applause for what you just said, Amina. He was not ashamed no. to, yeah. uh, to stand up for that. Yeah, well, they, and they I think silly things, to be fair. I agree with that one. I, I think I think we would have given him more of a pass if he would have said, okay, what are the cr most crucial things that the most disenfranchised group in America are facing? Yeah. I don't care if he did one or two things, but he did not. Everything that he said he stood against, he was against homosexual marriage. He, he, he was against certain other things. Don't ask no to. He was against those things and how quickly he turned the tide. So I'm saying, you know, I listened to Dr. Uh, Reverend Jeremiah Wright, who's also Philadelphian, uh, Gina. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, yes, um, okay. Brilliant man. And, yeah. and he, when he said that, you know, I can't believe they turned my son against me. He is now, he is nothing more than a politician. He, he has. He He's done the, the Washington shuffle. Yes. And I hope he can live with his decisions. It's like either go hard or go home. You're not there to play it say, safe. That's why I say um, when it comes to um, somebody that was raised, I mean, he was raised by his mother. His grandfather was um, a European. His mother was European. Um, mm -hmm. 
this I don't know what what we think. You know, why do we think that he would fall because he married a black woman? No. Yes. That's yes. not the reason for him to be loyal to us. I know. Just like there was no reason for um, Biden to do anything either. But you you made no demands of him. Yeah. He gave you no, you know, he says, if you don't vote for me, you're not black. The, the, uh, well, that, the was that was it. <laughs> the nonsense that this guy has said. Like, don't you people hear people when they say things? If you look at his track record, you look at his voting record alone. Vote, look at his voting record. He's done nothing. He is a liberal racist. I mean, but what, was, what was the other option? Listen, I understand that. <laughs> However, I'm not saying vote for Trump, but don't vote for for two of the same devil on the same body. Two yeah. heads, same body, and the, and they are one in the same. But you know, those were the options. I, I, right. And because of those options, I, don't want I it chose, all. I chose, I chose not to participate Yeah, because there was nobody, even in my local or state, all of them are part of the same game, all of them. And I said, in my good conscience, and I did my research, I did my due diligence and not I a did. one. I mean, did he do this? I know she said he went to uh, the Flint Yes, um, Michigan. To drink the toxic water, telling black folks a little lead won't hurt you. Yeah, he did that. A little that. lead won't hurt them. He said that. He, he uh, said. I, I doubt Obama said something like that. I okay, go back and ring it. Go <laughs> wind back, wind it back. Uh, they act yeah, like he was drinking water. He was, that, water I, that water that he was drinking was not from from the Michigan uh, from. Flint. That water was clear. If he would have had real Flint, Michigan water, he would it would have been brown. You're gonna tell me, oh, he drank filtered water from out of the pipes in Flint, Michigan? That's a lie. It's all optics. See, and we have I, we have to realize yeah, we've been this bamboozled. Is, this, is, this is what I said earlier on that we have to be careful when we start lambasting our own. Remember, when you want to judge him, judging by the standard of other politicians too. Trump came into office and promised heaven and mm. earth. He couldn't accomplish more than two, two thirds of them. The only ones he could accomplish were the ones that nature procured and did for him, whereby a judge would die, he would replace the judge. And he did it ruthlessly. And the ones that he can appoint, he appointed them and he did them ruthlessly. But the one you have to get through the law, the Senate and all the rest of it, you can see that they were all crippled. He couldn't build the wall. He couldn't um, deport as many people as he wanted. So many things that he wanted to do, he couldn't do them. Mm -hmm. So that, that tells you that the American system itself prevents you from doing a lot. What, but the thing you have to remember is that does the, the agenda that Obama put in place, did it work? And Obama did one thing for African Americans that people don't, don't perceive. One, we know that healthcare, uh, this thing, uh, uh, insurance affects African Americans more than it affects any other group in the country. There, hence why when he went after that in America, they don't target groups. They, whenever they put laws, they don't say this group is this. Way, this law is for white people. This law is for Hispanics. They don't do that, but they know who he's targeting. So when Obama goes for healthcare, he knows that this stuff is going to help people. Why do you think the white people are against it? These those right wingers. They're against it because they know that it's going to help the poorer, the poorer people and the black people in the in the community. They don't like it because of that reason. So when he did that, in the end, the stuff still remained there till today because of him. And he removed that uh, pre-existing condition, this thing. And you can have your children on your health care. That allowed a lot of black people to be able to put their children onto this thing, health insurance. I don't know how the health insurance in America works, but I know it has caused a lot of problems and caused people to go bankrupt in the in the this in, uh, in the country there, and it has affected African Americans by and large. And if I when I looked into this George's thing too that he did, I was like, this guy doesn't crow what he does. He doesn't say it loud for people to see, because when you appoint twenty eight seven percent of black people into such positions. You are basically saying that, hey, I know I'm here. While I'm here, let me start the listing on our side a little bit here. So when he gets the chance to wield his power, he uses it in that direction. But American politics is so hard to change anything. 
Hence why he couldn't. He tried everything that he, he could to change stuff. Trump, as fossil as he is, couldn't do anything about so, the American system. So, to Nigel, so you think we're being too hard on former President Obama? I think there's an element of that. You can hold him accountable, but remember, don't call him a sellout. Don't call him, um, you know, he's not one of ours or he doesn't, he doesn't belong in the community. I don't think he, that kind of statement helps because... This it is may not I help, help, but it isn't problem. true, though, to Niger. It may not help. But even though we want to be positive about our leaders, um, especially the ones that are currently um, presiding, he had two terms. He did nothing for his people. I don't understand he put judges in place or anything, but that he could have done something for his people. So after, are we his people? The first two years, after the first two years, he, there was nothing he could do anymore. The, the American system is crippled now. Nobody uh, is supposed to allow anything true anymore. Executive order. How many executive orders did um, Trump Great. use? Gregory X, I want to thank you for the um, super chat. He says, and I want to just read his comment for and be thought for his thoughtfulness. The, the Obama name should never again be uttered within black society. The guy has zero love or considerations for Africans globally. You know what? For Africans, I, there's some there are some policies that Obama carried out in Africa that I really man, I hold my head down in shame. I in shame because I can't believe this guy allowed this to happen while he was in office. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you see, when you are you are in the position of power, you, we don't know the things that has to happen. But if you look at him, you see, I always look at human beings. If you look at him when he's with our people, when he talks to them, the pastor, his own pastor is a rabid anti-American pastor. So he tells you that this man is not the way he appears. Mm -hmm. He is just negotiating the the card that was dealt that he was there. We we are just talking about how African leaders. Uh, you know, are basically hostages. The same thing happens in the, in the U.S. If yeah. any leader could have done anything, Trump could have. You know, mm -hmm. he, he, eighty percent of the country is, is practically white, and he couldn't mm -hmm. do anything. That tells you that country is hard to govern. Mm. That's that's true too, to Naja. Um, I I think our our why we go so hard on former President Obama is that. We expected him like, okay, you, 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 uh, a good part of your career, you worked in the area of disenfranchised people. You know a little bit of our history in this country. Your wife, God forbid, is a couple of centuries out of as a descendant uh, of former slave enslaved Africans. So we expected him to have a heart. So for him to have taken like, no, I can't. You guys got to wait. Oh, I don't know. I got to hedge this. Oh, I don't want to offend. It is disconcerting and it hurts. So, you know, you're harder on your own family than you are with anybody else because you know they're not going to do nothing for you. We expect it. But when you get through, we expect that at least you won't come through for us. And when you don't, it hurts. It hurts when a family hurts you. But do are we really family? So when he says certain things out of his mouth, it's not about him being black enough. But that's not even an issue. It's that you don't get it either. That's that's what it really is about. Um, for the most part, the Affordable Care Act um, that benefits the larger society. Usually, you know the you know the Caucasians, and we get the crumbs right. Now yeah. you have the illegal immigrants coming in and they get it just because they put their foot on ground. Whereas the Haitians are kicked out of the country and saying, no, you don't get it. Even if you do put your foot on the ground, we still put you back in the raft. Right. But we fought, we fight for everybody, but nobody fights for us. So we get somebody who we think is our own. And when they, they they do it to placate you, they do certain things to placate you. But at the end of the day, you're finding they're, they're, he's no more for you than anybody else. It's, you feel like you've been he, duped. He has, to, he has to act like he's less for you because he's one of you. you know, they make, they force, exactly. They, they force them to act 
more, you know, like they're less for you. I, you know what I think? I've seen this happen in Nigeria before. I think as leaders, um, I prefer when leaders see through time and they are able to make a decision based on not what the, the results are immediately. And I think what Obama did was more like that than because mm -hmm. I've seen leaders that decided made decisions based on their feelings and anger and all the rest of it, and it resulted in a civil war that he knew he was never going to win. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So even with the little Obama did, do you see how polarized? Don't, didn't you see how polarized uh, polarized the country became? There was a time mm -hmm. people were killing police officers mm -hmm. in America during his time. That even with that little, that he didn't even do that much. So he, the way he approached it was that he always um, tried to get the Americans to see the positive sides of the way he's doing things. And I think because of it now, we take it for granted that a black man may be, and I believe a black man is going to be president again in the U.S. We take it for granted because of I what know, he is To be honest with you, with everything that's going on, um, I just want black men to be. I just want black men to be uh, focused on Africa right now. I don't know if becoming president in the U.S. is ever going to help us as a people. I don't think so. I don't Not know at if this juncture. No. And I know you think that if a black man become president in the U.S. that it could be beneficial for Africa. Yes. I don't think so. I don't think so. At no. this juncture, no. They appoint a lot of people into positions of power. Did you see the people that swore um, uh, um, Biden into office? Mm -hmm. Most of they removed so many of the white officers in the security details that I was surprised. So many black women. Mm -hmm. Every, I was like, I didn't even know they had so many black women in, in the military and and secret, secret service. Somebody yeah, had appointed all those people into those positions. Yes. So they, we are we are filling the ranks right now, and that is that has influence. When you want to say something, you want to make a decision that you see a black person standing right next to you with a gun protecting you, you will think twice. It looks that way in the optics, but the actual practice of it is sometimes different than what you presume. We found that out to be the case with the Surgeon General who, who was during the uh, Trump administration and how he spoke to the black community. Oh, stop eating the food you're eating. Yeah. No, we're not. We're not dying because of the. the our food is poisoned. <laughs> for one, let's exactly. start there. Exactly. Two, we're living in a hostile, toxic, stressful environment. It's not always about the food you eat. It's also your environment the plays environment a role. And the work that you have to. I mean, we don't. I don't think people understand that there's levels to slavery, <laughs> and. The, the and we're not out of it yet either. Exactly. <laughs> There's levels to this thing. And, and you know, I don't know about everybody, but even in my position, and I'm just then counting, the fact that I have to work so many days, so many hours, and put so much of my energy towards it is really not good for me or in, or anybody really in, in, the, in the positions that I'm in. And I know that it's not just the kind of work that I do, but the kind of work that we all do. We're not mm -hmm. supposed to, we don't, we're not born to work this fucking hard to make rich people rich. I see. see. That is an interesting conversation to have because this is the conversation that encompasses the whole globe. I feel like, you know, we, we always say, okay, slavery was a specific mm -hmm. uh, aspect of life. But if you look at it, almost all humanity, we are all enslaved to an extent because so mm -hmm. when you have a mortgage, you're not exactly going to say, I want to stop working today. No, you have to work and work on you finish You have to work until day. you die. It's like you'd work and then yeah. you get a couple of years left to die because it's by the time you get to retire and can afford, because sometimes you retire from one job and have to go do another one because you can't live off your retirement. Here it's in the UK, when, when, when you retire, you have a house. They will sell your house and use it to take care of you when you are old. Yeah. And so it, it's like you are just walking to die. Yeah, and exactly, it, it, exactly. You, you, you we were, we were, especially you us, us. I can't speak for all races, but we were not created to work this hard. It, it's not meant to be like. And this is why in my in the way I approach life is that you have to work to become totally independent. Because mm -hmm. when people say they are working to, to work and work and work and become pension, that, that, that is, you're not you are not seeing the world. You are just still controlled yeah, because exactly. you have freedom exactly. to go wherever you want. 
you 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 every time you are you are thinking about your mortgage, you are thinking about this bill. You have to when you and when by the time you make a little bit of money, people are bearing you and 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 enjoying it. So it's like it, it's really backwards. Mm -hmm. You have to become financially independent, and to become financially independent, people that are truly independent, you are talking about at least in your account, you should have five hundred k, a million or and above before you really can say are broken free from this um, uh, rat race machine where I have to be working nine to five every every single and, day. And, and that's not how you're gonna. And that's not how you're gonna make your bank load, as you know. No one gets wealthy from their nine to five. Let's be honest. Not at all. Never. They will never. <laughs> Good luck with that one. If you like do 24 hours a day, you're not. You're not right. going to get that kind of Get money. all the overtime you want and you still won't be. You'll be too. As a matter of fact, exactly. you won't even make it through. You'll die in 30s, 40s. <laughs> right. So <laughs> my thing is, my thing is, um, isn't it a good, you know, that's, that's a good discussion to have that's about money. Mm. Is that where we went wrong when we started, um, when we stopped bartering and started, you know, wanting to 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 trade with other people for money integration into by integrating with other folks we started uh wanting those little what was it first those little shells and then it became you know gold and then it became money Curry, from curry yeah. to this so yeah we we have to start thinking about what we want out of this life because if yeah. you don't and what you want to get from your in, in life if you want independence you really know, you need to know what you need to be doing because you're not going to do that cleaning job and expect to get independence or yeah. you do one and this thing work in a warehouse. It's not going to happen. You, sooner or later, you have to find a way to reclaim your own uh, control of your life. And that is when you can really be free to think by yourself because you don't have to be rushing. And earlier, I think somebody asked for me to play that video and I'll go ahead and play it because I think it falls in line with what we were, I think I saved it somewhere, what we were talking about. And it also falls in line with what we, what the basis of this conversation is tonight. Um, when we talk about a look at our leaders, um, when we talk about the type of leader that Kagami, Paul Kagami is in Rwanda is, you know, you could definitely see where the money went. You could see infrastructurally mm -hmm. where the money is going mm -hmm. infrastructure wise um community wise even in the rural areas uh the clean and very nice homes and people are clean you don't see children walking around looking you know like they're disheveled exactly yeah. so you could definitely see where the money is going to and somebody asked me to play the video where the man said um uh, what the plan is for Africa, what their plan is for Africa. Let's play that. And then we're going to do the close out because I'm back here tomorrow and it's going to be a thick conversation about the Fulani. Okay. So what I'm going to try and do is uh, just give you some <laughs> charts and a couple of tables just to paint a little bit of a picture that you already know. Okay. So what this presentation is fundamentally designed to say is this. Africa historically, Sub-Saharan Africa, has been fundamental to the global prosperity of the advanced countries. Okay? And Africa had a role to play. It has a role as a raw material producer. We will not allow Sub-Saharan Africa to escape that. Okay? We do everything to keep Sub-Saharan Africa where it is, also impoverished. It's absolutely vital for the prosperity of everyone else. So let's get clear about that. Okay, and this means all the economic structures, all the global institutions, and the economics we teach everyone is all designed to keep Africa exactly where it is. There we go. Unequivocally. Designed to keep Africa exactly where it is. So, do we need to have any more conversations about what their plan is? Oh, we, we, no, we, we, I think we, it's we, the handwriting's on the wall, don't you think? <laughs> so, uh, this is it, guys. This is definitely why Kagami is a remarkable president, why I feel like um, we need more like him. I hope, I wish he could be like, uh, you know, a virus and just spread throughout all leaders. Because um, we need that. Africa needs that on a global. So um, I, I'm, I'm very happy to say that 
I know that Lamb and I, I see that Lamb is gone. I love you, Lamb, and thank you for coming through. I know that Lamb disagrees on one aspect. He thinks that Kagami is great, but he truly believes that um, there should be an end to his term. Um, he should reign forever. Well, I, 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 I don't think anybody should reign forever, but I feel like he's doing a good job, and I'm hoping that they vote him back in whenever they do need to vote. If he's still able to do a good job, keep the man working. Um, he's doing a great job as far as I'm concerned. This is the closeout, guys. I'm going to close out early because I have some uh, final um, clips I need to pull up for the tomorrow's conversation, which is going to be about the Fulanis. Everybody has issues with the Fulanis. <laughs> but let's talk about who they really are. Let's do some research. Let's figure out where they came from, why they move the way they do, why are they easily, um, some people say, used by um, you know outside forces to uh, for conflict. Um, if that is the case, we can talk about that. Um, I know there are quite a few people that are Fulani and would like to uh, have an opportunity. If you are Fulani and you see this and you would like to have an opportunity to uh, come on board tomorrow and um, address some of the concerns and maybe clarify some things, it would be great because, um, you know, uh, not too long ago, and this is something I'm going to throw out there, not too long ago, I, I found out that on my other side through African ancestry, that, um, you know, I, I basically, the first thing that came up was Fulani with Guinea-Bissau, which was um, heartbreaking for me because and 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 I have to say this. I have to. I have to. You know. Shout out to my Fulani, Fulani family. I apologize, but it was really hurtful because of all the terrible things I've heard um, that they were doing in Nigeria. And and I don't know if it was one sided. I'm still researching. Um, or don't want to talk about it right now. Rather, but um, I really. Um, it, it it wasn't something that I was proud of. And so I'm very excited uh, to to have a conversation and um, really address some of the people that do have concerns or just for us to gain knowledge. It would be good for us to gain knowledge about these different um, tribes and things like that. So, you know, but right now we're focusing on the series of look at our leaders, the look at our leaders. And today, this week's series was, um, we, we highlighted Paul Kagami, which I have to say, you know, is uh, ruthless, but brilliant. And, um, and I think that's necessary in leadership. Uh, so that's my opinion. This is the closeout to Niger. Tell me what you think about tonight's conversation. I know it's short. I know we didn't have a lot of folks come through, but I still think it was a lot of meat and a lot of good converse, good uh, um, discussion that went yes, through. I actually think it was a good discussion and uh, because um, it's quite important we understand um, how leaders uh, govern and why they should remain in office and um, what, 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 how, how important it is for us to um, hold on to these leaders that we have now. Because I'm not even sure when I came on today, I was thinking that, that way. But from what Laming was saying, it made that clear to me that it's quite important that when we have good leaders, we hold on to them for now, for the next 20 years if we have to. Because we need good leadership to grow in number. Uh, in numbers and um, we know pretty well that if we keep taking risks and shuffling them you get more bad leaders than good ones so when you get one good one hold on to that one until another good one arrives you know and uh, we if you build up good leadership in africa sooner or later we'll have a critical number that is going to turn the tide that will be irreversible and um in that we also even went into the Obama uh, discussion and talked about um, life, uh, the way we work. I think that work one will be interesting for us to discuss because which one uh, you said the the why we work what why do we work so hard? Yeah, yeah. Whether we, it's a kind of slavery. I think um, it's a good discussion also here. Yeah. yeah, because one thing that they say here in the UK is it's from a poem. Someone, one guy wrote. He says, um, "What is this life? If full of care, you have no time to stand and stare." Mm -hmm. People need to have be able to get to a point where they can actually reflect on life and their, their own life. Yeah. And our people don't never have that time because of the things that they are struggling with. And I, I that's why I think that discussion is going to really be good for us to get to that point where we can actually start asking ourselves what we want from this life. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, and I agree with you one, 100%. Now, what was, what, you know, how were we before? Why are we working so hard and what, what is the game? I mean, are we even able to accrue 
general right generational wealth within you know these jobs like uh, Amina said working these nine to fives and if not then why are we doing it um you know so that's really great I'm happy that um you joined us today again to Niger you're like um you're like this today you weren't as contrasting I think Lamin took your position today <laughs> 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 it's like your job <laughs> I, I don't come to contrast I just speak <laughs> And I'm happy you do that. So thank you and continue to do so. Um, oh, Amina, tell me what you think, sis. I know you agree with me like tonight you did. You know, I think Paul Kagami's doing an awesome job, man. I'm sorry. I, I guess I'm biased. <laughs> it's okay. Be biased. I'm, I'm, I like uh, clean streets. The man's a clean man. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Like, how often do you see it? Like, yeah. how often do you live to even witness such a feat, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm an advocate and staunch um, ardent supporter mm -hmm. of His Excellency. Um, I pray we live to see an even better, yes. an even better president who can mobilize and, and fight for his people and push back those that, mm -hmm. Um, who inferiorly look at um, Africans as such? I I I champion his his Africanness. I, yeah. I champion his stalwartness, his unashamed defiance. I love it. I, I, love I, I do it. too. I it's, don't see it. Yeah. So to Lamin, I I understand. I understand his perspective. Yeah, but. For those of us on this side who never see someone who unashamedly defends and stands up for their people, yeah. we wish we had that. And maybe that's yeah. why we go so hard. Uh, we're like, look, we ain't got to lose. We, 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 we claiming him now. We just, just man him. We, we keeping him. <laughs> Rekoya said, you know, in a private chat, not to idolize yeah. people. And, and, I, and I told her, I said, um, I said, uh, overstood, you know, um, um, and I said, no, no demagogues, you know. I said, but K Kagami is doing Rwanda good right now, and the people should be respected enough to decide. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and we should be, respect the people's votes. They're voting. And yeah. they're doing a good job voting in a good leader. Um, and he said that. He said, look, as long as the people still vote for me, I'll stay. But when they say it's time for you to go, I'll leave. Now, isn't and that true de democracy? That is true democracy. It is what real democracy looks like. And right. so, you know, I think um, sometimes we, the young lady who posed a question to uh, His Excellency during the uh, interview with Mo Ibrahim, um, she was South African and, and you know, the, the, the Neanderthals that surrounded her had the smirk on their face like, yeah, like, you, tell, you tell them, you tell them. Well, yeah. you know why they want don't want him? Because they don't want somebody pushing back in their face saying they, they want to be you. Doing. Exactly. And Who now to tell me? and now that he's made uh, Rwanda such a beautiful place and uh, they want that too. They want everything good. Right? Well, just think of the of the historical uh background of Europeans. They yeah. want it all. Yeah. They're not trying to share. They want it they, all. They've been doing this way before they met us. They've been fighting That's right. each other it all. So um, exactly. we're like they practice on each other before they got to us. So this is nothing new. We're the right. ones that don't want to fight for even what belongs to us. No, we're the ones who's willing to share. Yeah. But what we don't understand about the people who we share the planet Earth with is that they don't share, and they will do anything and everything. Have no to intent. get what they want no. under no uncertain terms, even muddying the waters against family members, they'll do it. And that's what we need to understand. We need to understand the, the nature of the beast. There's yes. no way to uh, better explain it. You have to understand the nature of the beast. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta deal with it accordingly. And, and I this is not hate. That. And that's the thing with Paul Kagami. I feel like he understands that completely. 
I do too. And better than people. I think if he could say more, he would, but he also has to be careful in his words that he chooses, the the moves he makes. So, but he says just enough to let them know, no, I'm on to you. I'm on to you. Yeah. So I, I have uh, so much respect and I'm so blessed to be able to see such a man to exist, to push back you know, um, in a way that no other African leader has, with the exception of His Excellency uh, Magufuli. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I'm, I feel blessed today. I do. Thank you, Gina, for everything. Thank you so much, Amina. You've always Gina. been, uh, you always come through and bless us. And um, it's really encouraging to see um, how many people really, truly, you know, we're really waking up and we're really paying attention to this work that's uh, in front of us. And you're putting in the work, man. You put in hours sitting here talking to us, enlightening, you know, enlightening us and um, having, you know, be, being open to learn. And all of this is being translated to other people. And you know what? I feel like the energy that we put into this is definitely important. And I think that, um, you know, this conversation, I'm happy I started this series because I truly feel like a lot of us don't know enough about our leaders or they don't get the spotlight that they deserve, mm -hmm. um, be it negative or positive. And mm -hmm. I think that, um, um, and you know, I value these conversations, this, this, this leader series, because it gives us an opportunity to really talk about something really important, which is, um, our people, it's leadership is a great representation of those people that are in our society that we need to pay attention to. For I, good want to and bad. I want to just tell you just briefly, thank you for everything. Thank you for having a heart for mother Africa and um, open up this dialogue and willing to hear um, people's real heartfelt feelings and thoughts and opinions Um and, and allow us all to learn from one another. I enjoy it so much. I look so far. I was looking. I'm like, where are they at? Where are they at? I was cooking. And then I'm like, where are they at? Where are they at? And I look forward to this so much because I, I, I think we're being robbed of true intelligent dialogue. Yeah. Um, and I, I look so forward to this. You have no idea. And, and I'm very, so, very thank, thank you. you so much. Sis. Please keep coming. I love you. Thank you. Always. Good night. <laughs> Good night, sis. Okay, guys, it's the closeout. So I want to thank everybody that came through. This is really, um, to be honest with you, I enjoyed this um, this conversation because um, I'm, I, I am biased. I'm not going to lie. I, I think I am very much a Paul Kagami fan, a Rwandan fan. Um, I, I always say in the back of my mind, I feel like I'm being called to the Gambia. But um, if I had to choose anywhere else on the continent, um, it would definitely be Rwanda, not just because of um, the fact that it's like one of the cleanest places on the continent, um, but because it is um, definitely, I feel like being led um, by someone that I truly feel like um, is humble, is calm, and is definitely fierce. Uh, and all of those things mean a lot to me. I truly believe that, um, you know, like we spoke about earlier, I believe you have to be brilliant and I do believe you have to be ruthless, ruthless in this time, in this time, because we're dealing with, um, um, you know, you know, we're dealing with superpowers that do not have our best interests at heart. So um, it's really good to see, you know, leaders like, you know, Paul Kagami and um, not many others really now that Magafuli is gone. Uh, but, you know, we still have Ghana, the Ghanaian president. It's really good to see um, pre um, leaders that stand up to the establishment and uh, support their people and do it in a very uh, positive and, for and, and um, you know, productive way. And um, when you can't deny, you cannot deny the works because you could see it for yourself. And even if you have not gone to Africa, there's no reason not to know or have a good understanding of what's happening on ground. And um, I'm really looking forward to the next conversation. I believe it's going to be in, um, we're going to talk about uh, Kenya, I believe. Um, and then it's going to be Guinea-Conakry, uh, the next series. So 
this conversation, we're going to be uh, discussing uh, Burundi or G Kenya. I'll surprise you guys. I'm still considering it. I'm trying to take care of East Africa because I know West Africa is going to be a lot to, uh, to uh, chew to chew on in reference to leadership in, in those areas. So that being said, I want to thank everybody for coming through. Um, you know how I do. It's all about the blackness. Peace, y'all. <laughs> Let's leave you with some beautiful uh, uh, sceneries from Rwanda.